HarperCollins and Harper Audio present Lovecraft Country, a novel by Matt Ruff, performed by Kevin Kennerly. Lovecraft Country Jim Crow Mile, a unit of measurement peculiar to colored motorists, comprising both physical distance and random helpings of fear, paranoia, frustration, and outrage. Its amorphous nature makes exact travel times impossible to calculate, and its violence puts the traveler's good health and sanity constantly at hazard. The Safe Negro Travel Guide, Summer 1954 Edition Atticus was almost home when the state trooper pulled him over. He'd left Jacksonville two days before in a second-hand 48 Cadillac coupe that he'd bought with the last of his army pay. The first day, he drove 450 miles, eating and drinking from a basket he packed in advance, stopping the car only to get gas. At one of the gas stops, the colored restroom was out of order, and when the attendant refused him the key to the white's room, Atticus was forced to urinate in the bushes behind the station. He spent the night in Chattanooga. The safe Negro travel guide had listings for four hotels and a motel, all in the same part of the city. Atticus chose the motel, which had an attached 24-hour diner, the price of the room, as promised by the guide, was three dollars. In the diner the next morning, he consulted a road atlas. He had another six hundred miles to go to Chicago. Midway along his intended route was the city of Louisville, Kentucky, which, according to the guide, had a restaurant that would serve him lunch. Atticus considered it, but any inclination to further delay his homecoming was overwhelmed by a desire to put the South behind him. So after he finished breakfast, he got the basket from his car and had the diner cook fill it with sandwiches and Cokes and cold-fried chicken. Around 1 p.m., he reached the Ohio River, which marked the border between Kentucky and Indiana. As he crossed the water on a bridge named for a dead slave owner, Atticus cocked his arm out the window and bade Jim Crow farewell with a raised middle finger. A white driver coming the other way saw the gesture and shouted something vile. But Atticus just laughed and stepped on the gas and so passed into the north. An hour later, Along a stretch of farmland, the Cadillac blew a tire. Atticus wrestled the car to a safe stop at the roadside and got out to put on the spare. But the spare was flat, too. He was frustrated by this. He checked the spare before setting out, and it had seemed fine then. But however much he frowned at it, the spare remained resolute in its flatness. A southern tire, Atticus thought. Jim Crow's revenge. Behind him, for at least ten miles, there was nothing but fields and woods but looking ahead on the road he could see, perhaps two miles distant, a cluster of buildings. Taking the safe Negro travel guide with him, he started walking. There was traffic on the road, and at first as he walked, he tried waving down vehicles that were headed his way, but the drivers all either ignored him or sped up to get past him, and eventually he gave up and just concentrated on putting one foot in front of the other. He came to the first of the buildings. The sign out front said Jansen's Auto Repair, and Atticus thought he might be in luck until he saw the Confederate flag hanging above the garage entrance. That was almost enough to make him keep walking, but he decided he had to try. Inside the garage were two white men, a little fellow with a peach fuzz mustache who sat on a high stool reading a magazine, and a much bigger man who was bent under the open hood of a pickup truck. As Atticus entered, the little man looked up from his magazine and made a rude sucking sound between his teeth. Excuse me, Atticus said. This got the attention of the big man. As he straightened up and turned around, Atticus saw he had a tattoo of what looked like a wolf's head on his forearm. Sorry to disturb you, Atticus said, but I've had some trouble. I need to buy a tire. The big man glared at him for a moment, then said flatly, No. I can see you're busy, said Atticus, as if that might be the problem. I'm not asking you to change it for me. Just sell me the tire and I'll... No. I don't understand. You don't want my money? You don't have to do anything, just... No. The big man crossed his arms. You need me to say it another fifty times? Because I will. And Atticus, fuming now, said, That's a wolfhound tattoo, right? 27th Infantry Regiment. He fingered the service pen on his own lapel. I was with the 24th Infantry. We fought alongside the 27th across most of Korea. I wasn't in Korea, the big man said. I was at Guadalcanal in Luzon, and there weren't any niggers there. With that, he bent under the truck hood again, his back both a dismissal and an invitation. 
leaving Atticus to decide which way he wanted to take it. The collective indignities of the past months in Florida made it a closer call than Atticus liked. The little man on the stool was still looking at him, and if he'd said anything or even cracked a smile, Atticus would have gone in swinging. But the little man, perhaps sensing how quickly he could lose his teeth, even with the big man to protect him, did not smile or speak, and Atticus stalked off with his fists at his sides. Across the road was a general store, with a payphone on its front porch. Atticus looked in the guide and found a listing for a Negro-owned garage in Indianapolis, some fifty miles away. He placed the call and explained his predicament to the mechanic who answered. The mechanic was sympathetic and agreed to come help him, but warned that it would be a while. That's okay, Atticus said. I'll be here. He hung up and noticed the old woman inside the general store watching him nervously through the screen door. Once again, he chose to turn and walk away. He went back to the car. In the trunk beside the useless spare was a cardboard box filled with battered paperbacks. Atticus selected a copy of Ray Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles. He sat in the Cadillac and read about the rocket summer of 1999, when winter snows were melted by the exhaust from a Mars-bound spacecraft. He imagined himself aboard, rising into the sky on a jet of fire, leaving north and south behind forever. Four hours passed. He read all of the Martian Chronicles. He drank warm Coke and ate a sandwich, but mindful of the gaze of passing motorists, he did not touch the fried chicken. He perspired in the breezeless June heat. When his bladder could no longer be ignored, he waited for a lull in the traffic and went behind a sycamore that grew by the roadside. It was after seven o'clock when the tow truck arrived. The driver, a gray-haired, light-skinned Negro, introduced himself as Earl Mabry. Earl? Just Earl, he insisted, when Atticus tried to call him Mr. Mabry. He lifted the replacement tire from the rear of the tow truck. Let's get you back on your way. With the two of them working together, it took less than ten minutes. The simplicity of it, and the thought of the afternoon just wasted for no good reason, started Atticus fuming again. He stepped away from the car to compose himself, pretending to study the sun, now hanging low on the horizon. How far do you have to go? Earl asked him. Chicago. Or raised an eyebrow. Tonight? Well, that was the plan. Tell you what, Earl said. I'm done for the day. Why don't you come home with me? Let my wife fix you a real dinner. Maybe rest a while. No, sir, I couldn't. Sure you could. It's on your way. And I wouldn't want you to leave Indiana thinking it's all bad people. Earl lived in the colored district, around Indiana Avenue, northwest of the state capitol building. His house was a narrow, wooden two-story, with a tiny patch of grass out front. When they arrived, the sun had set, and clouds were blowing in from the north, hastening the darkness. In the street, a stickball game was in progress, but now the mothers of the players were calling them inside. Earl and Atticus went inside, too. Earl's wife, Mavis, greeted Atticus warmly and showed him where he could wash up. Despite the welcome, Atticus was apprehensive sitting down at the kitchen table. For many of the obvious topics of dinner conversation, his service in Korea, his stay in Jacksonville, today's events, and most of all his father in Chicago, were things he didn't really care to talk about. But after they'd said grace, Earl surprised him by asking what he thought of the Martian Chronicles. I saw you had it in the car. So they talked about Ray Bradbury and Robert Heinlein and Isaac Asimov, all of whom Earl liked, and L. Ron Hubbard, whom he didn't and the Tom Swift series, which Earl had loved when he was young, but which embarrassed him now, both for the book's depiction of Negroes and for the fact that as a boy he hadn't noticed it, despite his father's repeated attempts to point it out to him. Yeah, my pop had some problems with my reading choices, too, Atticus said. Mavis said little during the meal, seeming content to listen and to refill Atticus's plate whenever it was in danger of being emptied. By the time they finished dessert, it was full dark, and rain was drumming on the kitchen window. Well, Mavis spoke up at last, you can't drive any farther tonight in this. Atticus, past the point of even token resistance, allowed himself to be led upstairs to the spare bedroom. There on the dresser was a photograph of a young man in uniform. A black ribbon had been tied around the corner of the frame. Our Dennis, Mavis said, or so Atticus thought. But as she began to put fresh sheets on the bed, she added, he died in the forest. And Atticus realized she was talking about the Ardennes. 
Atticus lay in bed with a book Earl had offered him. More Bradbury. A short story collection called Dark Carnival. It was a nice gesture, but not really the best bedtime fare. After reading one story about a vampire family reunion and another, very strange tale about a man who had his skeleton removed, Atticus shut the book, gazed for a moment at the Arkham House imprint on its spine, and set it aside. He reached for his trousers and got out the letter from his father. Reading it over again, he touched a finger to a word written near the bottom of the page. Arkham, he whispered. The rain stopped at three in the morning. Atticus opened his eyes in the silence, unsure at first what country he was in. He dressed in the dark and crept downstairs, thinking to leave a note. But Earl was awake, sitting at the kitchen table with a cigarette. Sneaking out, Earl said to Atticus. Yes, sir. I appreciate the hospitality, but I need to get home. Earl nodded and made a little shooing gesture with his cigarette hand. Tell Mrs. Mabry thank you for me. Tell her I say goodbye. Earl made the shooing gesture again. Atticus got in his car and drove off through the dark and still damp streets, feeling like the ghost in whose bed he had slept. By first light, he was well to the north. He passed a sign reading Chicago, 52. The state trooper was parked on the shoulder on the opposite side of the road. The trooper had been napping, and had Atticus come even five minutes earlier, he might have passed by unnoticed. But in the pink dawn light, the trooper sat up blinking and yawning. He saw Atticus driving by and came fully alert. Atticus watched in the rear view as the patrol car made a U-turn onto the road. He got the Cadillac's registration and bill of sale from the glove box and put them on the passenger's seat along with his driver's license. Everything in plain sight so there'd be no confusion about what he was reaching for. Lights flashed in the rear view and the police siren came on. Atticus pulled over rolled it down his window, and as he'd been taught to do in his very first driving lesson, gripped the top of the steering wheel with both hands. The trooper took his time getting out of the patrol car, stopping to stretch before ambling up alongside the Cadillac. Is this your car? He began. Yes, sir, Atticus said. Without taking his hands off the wheel, he inclined his head towards the papers in the passenger seat. Show me. Atticus handed him the documents. Atticus Turner, the state trooper said, reading the name off his license. You know why I stopped you? No, sir, Atticus lied. You weren't speeding, the trooper assured him. But when I saw your license plate, I got worried you might be lost. Florida's the other way. Atticus gripped the wheel a little tighter. I'm going to Chicago. Sir. What for? Family. My dad needs me. But you live in Florida. I've been working down in Jacksonville since I got out of the service. The trooper yawned without bothering to cover his mouth. Been working or still working? Sir? Are you going back to Florida? No, sir. I don't plan to. You don't plan to. So you stand in Chicago? For a while. How long? I don't know. As long as my father needs me. And then what? I don't know. I haven't decided. You haven't decided. The trooper frowned. But you're just passing through here, right? Yes, sir, Atticus said, resisting the temptation to add, if you will let me. Still frowning, the trooper shoved the documents back through the window. Atticus replaced them on the passenger seat. What's in there? The trooper asked next, pointing at the basket on the floor. What's left of my lunch from yesterday? What about in back? Anything in the trunk? Just my clothes, Atticus said. My army uniform, some books. What kind of books? Science fiction, mostly. Science fiction? And this is your car? Officer, step out. The trooper moved back from the door and placed a hand on the butt of his revolver. Atticus got out of the car, slowly. Standing, he was an inch taller than the trooper. His reward for his impertinence was to be spun around, shoved up against the Cadillac, and roughly frisked. All right, said the trooper. Open the trunk. The trooper pawed through Atticus's clothes first, patting down the sides of his duffel bag as if it too were a black man braced against a car. Then he turned to the books, dumping the box out into the trunk. Atticus tried not to care, 
telling himself paperbacks were meant to be abused. But it was hard, like watching friends get knocked around. What's this? The trooper picked up a gift-wrapped object that had been at the bottom of the box. Another book? Atticus said. It's a present for my uncle. The trooper tore off the wrapping paper, revealing a hard-bound volume. A princess of Mars. He looked sideways at Atticus. Your uncle likes princesses, does he? He tossed the book into the box, Atticus dying a little as it landed splayed open, bending pages. The trooper circled the Cadillac. When he opened the passenger door, Atticus thought he was going after the Martian Chronicles, which was still up front somewhere. But the trooper came up holding the safe Negro travel guide. He thumbed through it, at first puzzled, and then astonished. These addresses, he said, these are all places that serve colored people? Atticus nodded. Well, said the trooper, if that doesn't beat everything. He squinted at the guide, edge on. Not very thick, is it? Atticus didn't respond to that. All right, the trooper said finally. I'm going to let you go, but I'm keeping this guidebook. Don't worry, he added, forestalling the objection that Atticus knew better than to make. You won't need it anymore. You see, you're going to Chicago? Well, between here and there, there's no place that you want to stop. Understood? Atticus understood. The main office of the Safe Negro Travel Company, George Berry, proprietor, was in Washington Park on Chicago's south side. Atticus parked in front of the Freemasons Temple next door and sat watching the early morning pedestrians and the drivers going by, not a white face among them. There were streets in Jacksonville where you'd rarely see a white person either, but this street, this neighborhood, was home. Had, once upon a time, been Atticus's whole world, and it soothed him like nothing save his mother's voice could. As he relaxed, the ball inside him unwinding by slow degrees, he reflected that the state trooper had been right. Here, he needed no guide. The travel office was still closed at this hour, but Atticus could see a light on in the apartment above it. Rather than ring the buzzer, he went around to the alley and climbed the fire escape to knock at the kitchen door. From within, he heard the scrape of a chair and the rasp of the door bolt. The door opened halfway, and Uncle George peered out warily. But when he saw who it was, he cried out, Hey! and threw the door wide, drawing Atticus into a tight embrace. Hey yourself, Atticus said laughing, returning the hug. Man, it's good to see you. Stepping back, George gripped Atticus by the shoulders and looked him up and down. When did you get back? Just rolled in now. Oh, come on inside. Entering the kitchen, Atticus was struck by the funhouse sensation that had dogged him on his only other visit home since joining the military. Though he'd reached his full growth just before enlisting, in his strongest memories of this place, he'd been a much smaller person, so that the room seemed to have shrunk. When his uncle had shut the door and turned to embrace him a second time, Atticus realized George had shrunk too, though in George's case, that just meant they were now the same height. Is Aunt Hippolyta home? Atticus asked, curious to take her measure as well. No, said George. She's in Wyoming. There's this new spa opened up near Yellowstone, run by Quakers, if you can believe it, supposedly open to everyone. She's checking it out. Early in their marriage, Hippolyta had volunteered herself as a scout for the Safe Negro Travel Guide, specializing in vacation resorts. Initially, she and George had traveled together, but these days she most often went alone, leaving George home to care for their son. She'll be gone at least a week, but I know Horace will be glad to see you once he wakes up. Horace is still sleeping? Atticus was surprised. School year's not over already, is it? Not quite, George said but today's Saturday. Laughing at Atticus's reaction to this news, guess I don't have to ask how your trip was. No, you don't. He held up the book he'd carried like a broken bird from the car. Here. What's this? Ah, Mr. Burroughs. Souvenir from Japan, Atticus said. I found this bookstore outside the base in Gifu. Guy had one shelf of books in English, almost all science fiction. I thought that might be a first edition, but now I think it's just old. Well-traveled, George said.
the book fell open to the bent pages. Atticus had done his best to flatten them, but the creasing was permanent. Yeah, it was in better shape when I bought it. Hey, that's okay, George said. Should still read just fine. He smiled. Come on, let's put this in the place of honor. He headed for the bedroom he and Hippolyta shared with their best books. Atticus followed him partway, stopping outside the apartment's other bedroom to look in on his cousin. Horace, twelve years old, lay on his back with his mouth open, his breath wheezy and labored. There was an issue of Tom Corbett, space cadet, beside his pillow, and more were scattered on the floor. A short-legged easel desk faced the wall opposite the bed. A sheet of construction paper on the desk had been divided into panels containing scenes from an intergalactic adventure. Negroes in capes, wandering through a Buck Rogers landscape. Atticus studied it from the doorway, head tilted as he tried to pick up the thread of the story. George came back down the hall. He's getting really good, Atticus said, keeping his voice low. Yeah, he's been trying to talk me into starting a comics line. I told him if he saves up enough of his own money, I might go in with him on a small print run. So, you hungry? Why don't I get him up, call your father, and we all go out to breakfast together? You seen Montrose yet? Not yet, said Atticus. And before I do, there's something I need to talk to you about. All right. Go make yourself comfortable. I'll put coffee on. While George busied himself in the kitchen, Atticus went out to the front parlor, which in childhood had served him as both library and reading room. The bookshelves were divided into his and hers, Aunt Hippolyta's interests running primarily to science and natural history with a smattering of Jane Austen. George gave a nod to respectable literature, but reserved his deepest passion and most of his shelf space for the genres of pulp, science fiction, fantasy, mysteries and detective stories, horror and weird tales. Atticus's shared devotion to these mostly white author genres had been a source of ongoing struggle with his father. George, as Montrose's older brother, was largely immune to his scorn and could always tell him to keep his opinions to himself. Atticus didn't have that privilege. If his father was in a mood to debate his tastes in reading, he had no choice but to oblige him. There was usually plenty to argue about. Edgar Rice Burroughs, for example, offered a wealth of critical fodder with his Tarzan stories. Was it even necessary to list all the problems Montrose had with Tarzan, starting with the very idea of him, or his Barsoom series? whose protagonist, John Carter, had been a captain in the Army of Northern Virginia before becoming a Martian warlord. A Confederate officer? Atticus's father had said, appalled. That's the hero? When Atticus tried to suggest it wasn't that bad, since technically John Carter was an ex-Confederate, his father scoffed. Ex-Confederate? What's that, like an ex-Nazi? The man fought for slavery. You don't get to put an ex in front of that. Montrose could have simply forbidden him to read such things. Atticus knew other sons whose fathers had done that, who'd thrown their comic books and amazing stories collections into the trash. But Montrose, with limited exceptions, didn't believe in book banning. He always insisted he just wanted Atticus to think about what he read, rather than imbibing it mindlessly. And Atticus, if he were being honest, had to admit that was a reasonable goal. But if it was fair to acknowledge his father's good intentions, it also seemed fair to point out that his father was a belligerent man who enjoyed having cause to pick on him. Uncle George wasn't much help. It's not as if your father's wrong, he said one time when Atticus was complaining. But you love these stories, Atticus said. You love them as much as I do. I do love them, George agreed. But stories are like people, Atticus. Loving them doesn't make them perfect. You try to cherish their virtues and overlook their flaws. The flaws are still there, though. But you don't get mad. Not like Pop does. No, that's true. I don't get mad. Not in stories. They do disappoint me sometimes. He looked at the shelves. Sometimes they stab me in the heart. Standing in front of these same shelves now, Atticus reached for a book bearing the Arkham House imprint, The Outsider and Others, by H.P. Lovecraft. Lovecraft was not an author Atticus would have expected to like. He wrote horror stories, 
which were more George's thing, Atticus preferring adventures with happy or at least hopeful endings. But one day, on a whim, he decided to give Lovecraft a try, choosing at random a lengthy tale called At the Mountains of Madness. The story concerned a scientific fossil hunting expedition to Antarctica. While scouting for new dig sites, the scientists discovered a mountain range with peaks higher than Everest. In a plateau in the mountains lay a city, built millions of years ago by a race of aliens called the Elder Things, or Old Ones, who came to Earth from space during the Precambrian era. Although the Old Ones had abandoned the city long ago, their former slaves, protoplasmic monsters called Shoggoths, still roamed the tunnels beneath the ruins. Shigoths, Atticus' father said, when Atticus made the mistake of telling him about this. Shoggoths, Atticus corrected him. Uh-huh. And the master race, the elder clansmen? Elder things, old ones. They're fair-skinned, I bet. And the Shigoths, they're dark. The elder things are barrel-shaped. They have wings. But they're white, right? They're gray. Pale gray? After some additional teasing in this vein, and a more serious sidebar on Mr. Lovecraft's willful misconceptions about evolution, Montrose let it go. Or seemed to. But a few nights later, he brought home a surprise. Atticus's mother was out with a friend that evening, and Atticus was alone in the apartment, reading The Call of Cthulhu and trying to ignore a strange gurgling in the kitchen sink. He was actually relieved when his father came home. Montrose started in right away. I stopped by the public library after work, he said, as he was hanging up his coat. I did a little research on your friend, Mr. Lovecraft. Yeah, Atticus said, without enthusiasm. He recognized the perverse mix of anger and glee in his father's voice and knew that something he enjoyed was about to be irrevocably spoiled. Turns out he was a poet, too. No Langston Hughes, but still, it's interesting. Here. The typescript his father handed him was like a cheap parody of one of the arcane texts from Lovecraft's stories, an amateur literary journal, produced on an ancient mimeograph and bound between stained sheets of cardboard. There was no title page, but a tag on the cover gave its origin as Providence, 1912. How it had ended up in the Chicago Public Library system, Atticus never knew, but given its existence, he wasn't surprised his father had managed to find it. Montrose had a nose for such things. An index card from the library catalog had been used as a bookmark in the journal. Atticus turned to the indicated page, and there it was, eight lines of comic verse by Howard Phillips Lovecraft. The title of the poem was On the Creation of Niggers. Sometimes they stab me in the heart. Getting reacquainted with old friends, George said, appearing with the coffee. Yeah. Atticus slid the book back into its place and took the cup George offered him. Thanks. They sat, Atticus feeling a wave of exhaustion wash over him. So, George said, how was Florida? Segregated, Atticus replied, thinking as he said it that it wasn't the right word, since you could apply just as well to Chicago. But George nodded. Yeah, I didn't think you'd like the South. Didn't expect to see you back so soon, though. I figured you'd stick it out there at least through the end of the summer. I figured that, too, Atticus said, and I was thinking I might try California next. But then I got this. He showed George the letter from his father. George recognized the handwriting on the envelope immediately. He nodded again. Montrose asked me for your mailing address. He tell you what he was planning to write me about? George laughed. You kidding? He wouldn't even admit he was going to write you. Just told me he thought he should have the address, in case. It's been like that since you left. He worries about you. Wants to know everything I know, but Lord forbid he should say so. So he'll slip it in, casual, when we're talking about something else. Oh, by the way, you hear anything about that boy? That boy? Atticus made a face. Hey, if he used your name, it might sound like he cared. And even that much is an improvement. That first year you were in Korea, he wouldn't even ask. He'd come over for dinner and wait for me to volunteer the information. And if I didn't volunteer, he wouldn't say anything. But he wouldn't go home. 
He'd stay here till ten, eleven, midnight, if that's what it took, waiting for me to bring up the subject of you. Drove me crazy. George shook his head. So what did he write to you about? Mom, Atticus said. He says he found out where her family came from. He's still obsessing on that? Huh. Atticus's mother, Dora, had been the only child of an unmarried woman. Her father's identity was a mystery and a taboo subject. Her mother, disowned by her family, had in turn seldom spoken of them, as a result of which Dora knew little of her maternal grandparents other than that they had lived in Brooklyn and came originally from somewhere in New England. Montrose, who could trace his own roots back five generations, had sworn to find out more about Dora's ancestry. At first, when he and Dora were courting, he had intended this as a sort of love offering. But by the time Atticus was born, it had become a purely selfish pursuit and one of a long list of things about which he and Dora fought. Atticus could remember lying in his childhood bed, listening to the two of them argue. How can you not want to know? His father would say. Who you come from is a part of who you are. How do you just let that be stolen from you? I know where the past leads, his mother would reply. It's a sad place. Why would I want to know it better? Does no one make you happy? It ain't about happy. It's about being whole. You have a right to that. You have a duty to that. But I don't want it. Please, just let it go. Atticus was seventeen when his mother died. The day of the funeral, he'd found his father pawing through a box of his mother's keepsakes. Montrose had pulled out a photograph of Dora's grandparents, the only image of them she'd possessed, and removed it from its frame so he could read something written on the back. Some clue. Atticus had snatched the photo from his startled father's hands. Let it go, he'd shouted. She said let it go. Montrose, rearing back, had recovered quickly, his fury more than a match for his son's. He'd struck Atticus hard enough to knock him to the floor, then stood over him, raging. Don't you ever tell me what to do, ever. Of course he's still obsessing on it, Atticus said now, in answer to George's question. But the thing I need to ask you, you say Pop drove you crazy. What I'm wondering is whether you think he might have finally done the same to himself. He read aloud from the letter, struggling a bit with his father's handwriting. I know that, like your mother, you think you can forgive, forget the past. You can't. You cannot. The past is alive, a living thing. You own, owe it. Now I have found something about your mother's forebears. You have a sacred a secret legacy, a birthright which has been kept from you. Legacy, George said. Is he talking about an inheritance? He doesn't say exactly. But whatever it is, it has something to do with the place that Mom's people supposedly came from. He says he needs me to come home so we can go there together and claim what's mine. Well, that doesn't sound crazy. Wishful thinking, maybe, but... The crazy part isn't the legacy. It's the location. This place he wants me to go with him, it's in Lovecraft country. George shook his head, not understanding. Arkham, Atticus said. The letter says Mom's ancestors come from Arkham, Massachusetts. Arkham, home of the corpse reanimator, Herbert West, and of Miskatonic University, which had sponsored the fossil hunting expedition to the Mountains of Madness. It is made up, right? I mean, oh yeah, George said. Lovecraft based it on Salem, I think, but it's not a real place. Let me see that letter. Atticus handed it to him, and George studied it, squinting and tilting his head side to side. It's a D, he said finally. What? It's not Arkham with a K. It's Ardham with a D. Atticus got up and stared at the letter over George's shoulder. That's a D? Yeah. No. A B, maybe. No, it's a D. Artem, for sure. Man. Atticus sighed in frustration. You know, for someone who talks so much about the importance of being educated, you think he learned to write clearly. It's not his fault, George said. 
Montrose is dyslexic. This was news to Atticus. Since when? Since ever. That's why he had so much trouble in school. Well, one reason. Your Grandpa Turner had the same problem. Why didn't I know this? You mean why didn't Montrose ever tell you? George laughed. Figure it out. He grabbed a road atlas from one of the bookshelves. After consulting the index in the back, he turned to the map of Massachusetts. Yeah, here it is. Artem, marked by a hollow dot, signifying a settlement of no more than 250 people, was in the north-central part of the state, just below the New Hampshire border. An unnamed tributary of the Connecticut River looped south around it. The map showed no direct road access, though a state highway intersected the tributary nearby. Sorry, George said, as Atticus frowned at the map. Your dad hasn't lost his mind. Maybe you should have called before you drove all this way. No, it was about time for me to come home, Atticus said. I guess I better go see him, find out what this birthright is all about. Hold on a second. One, Devon County, George said, tapping a finger on the map. Devon County, Massachusetts, that rings a bell. Huh, I wonder. Maybe this Artem is in Lovecraft country after all. What are you talking about? Let's go downstairs to the office. I need to check my files. George had begun publishing the Safe Negro Travel Guide as a means of advertising his travel agency services, and though the guide had ultimately become profitable in its own right, the agency, now expanded to three locations, remained his primary business and source of income. The agency would book trips and tickets for anyone, but specialized in helping middle-class Negroes negotiate with a travel industry that was at best reluctant to accept their patronage. Through his network of contacts and scouts, George kept up-to-date files, not only on which hotels allowed Negro guests, but which air and cruise lines were most likely to honor their reservations. For those wishing to vacation abroad, the agency could recommend destinations that were relatively free of local race prejudice and, just as important, not overrun by white American tourists. For nothing was more frustrating than traveling thousands of miles only to encounter the same bigots you dealt with every day at home. The files were stored in a back room. George flipped on the lights as they entered and reached for something atop a cabinet beside the door. Check this out, he said to Atticus. It was a road atlas, the same edition as the one upstairs, only this copy had been extensively illustrated with brightly colored drawings. Atticus recognized Horace's handiwork. Some of the boys' first art experiments had involved sketching cartoons onto gas station maps. Horace really had gotten good at it, though. And as Atticus paged through the atlas, it dawned on him that what he was holding was a visual translation of the Safe Negro Travel Guide. Major Negro population centers, like Chicago's South Side, were represented as shining fortresses. Smaller neighborhoods and enclaves were marked with towers or oases. Isolated hotels and motels were inns with smiling keepers. Tourist homes, private residences that lent rooms to Negro travelers, were peasant huts or tree houses or hobbit holes. Less friendly parts of the country were populated by ogres and trolls, vampires and werewolves, wild beasts, ghosts, evil sorcerers, and hooded white knights. In Oklahoma, a great white dragon coiled around Tulsa. Breathing fire onto the neighborhood where Atticus's father and Uncle George had been born. Atticus turned to Massachusetts. Devon County was marked with an icon he'd seen in numerous other places in the Atlas. A sundial. Standing beside it, casting his own shadow over the gnomon, was a grim Templar holding a noose. Victor Franklin, said George, who'd been rummaging in file drawers while Atticus looked at the Atlas. He waved a typewritten sheet he'd extracted from a folder. Who? Atticus said. Old schoolmate from Howard. I don't think you ever met him, but the past couple of years, he's been running the Grand Boulevard office for me. Last September, he went back east to visit his folks, and I asked him if he'd take a side trip through New England to check out some new listings for the guide. One of the places I sent him was in New Hampshire. Another school friend, Lester Deering, moved up there to open a hotel. Place was supposed to be up and running already, but Lester had some problems with the local contractors and had to delay. The day Victor came by, he was over in the next town, 
trying to hire a new electrician to finish the wiring. So Victor shows up, and the hotel's not open. Nobody's around, and when he tries to rent a room in a motel down the road, no vacancies. Right. Not for him. So he said to hell with it, and decided to head back down to Massachusetts and spend the night at a tourist home. So he started driving south, and by the time he crossed the state line, he needed to pee. He could have gone to a gas station, asked to use their restroom, but the way his day had been going, he could guess how that would turn out. So instead, he decided to pull over and go in the woods. As soon as he got out of the car, he got nervous. The sun was going down. He hadn't passed another car in miles, and he hadn't seen another colored man since Boston. But he had to go. So he stepped into the woods, just far enough to be out of sight if anybody did drive by and he was in the middle of his business when he heard something thrashing around farther out in the trees. Shargoth, Atticus said. George smiled. I don't think Victor would know what that is, but his thoughts were definitely leaning in that direction. It was big, whatever it was, he told me, and I wasn't interested in finding out how big. So he zipped up in a hurry and ran back out to the road, which is where the real monster was waiting for him. County Sheriff. George said. Victor had been so focused on whatever it was busting branches out in the woods, he never even heard a patrol car drive up. It was just there, parked behind Victor's Lincoln, and the sheriff was leaning against the Lincoln's front hood holding a rifle. Victor said when he saw the expression on the sheriff's face, he had more than half a mind to turn and run. He said the only thing that stopped him was the certainty he'd be shot in the back if he did that. Instead, he put his hands up and said, Hello, officer. How can I help you? The sheriff started right in with the usual 20 questions. Who are you? Where are you coming from? Why'd you stop here? Victor answered as respectfully as he could until the sheriff cut him off and said, So what you're telling me is you came all the way from Chicago to piss in my woods like some animal? And Victor was trying to come up with an answer to that that wouldn't get him shot in the face when the sheriff asked another question. Do you know what a sundown town is? Victor told the sheriff, yes. He was familiar with the concept. Well, the sheriff said, you're in Devon, which is a sundown county. If I'd caught you here after dark, it'd be my sworn duty to hang you from one of these trees. And Victor, he said he was so scared he was calm. You know that feeling. Victor looked up in the sky, and he couldn't see the sun above the trees, but there was still light. So he said, it's not sunset yet. And then he said, he very nearly fainted, hearing how those words sounded coming out of his mouth, like he was giving sass. But the sheriff just chuckled. No, not yet, he said. Sunset today is at 7.09. You got seven minutes. Well then, said Victor, if you let me go on my way, I'll be out of the county in six minutes. Not going south, you won't, the sheriff told him. Not unless you speed. And if you speed, I have to pull you over. I'll go back north then, Victor said. That might work, the sheriff said. Why don't you try that and see what happens? So Victor went to get in the Lincoln, terrified that the sheriff was just toying with him before putting a bullet in him. And then when he opened the car door, he had another thought. And he looked at the road and looked at the sheriff and said, Is it legal for me to make a U-turn here? And the sheriff smiled and told him, It's a good thing you asked that. Ordinarily, I consider a U-turn to be a violation. But if you say please, I might let it go just this once. So Victor said please, and the sheriff ran out the clock some more, thinking it over, but finally said okay. So Victor got in the Lincoln, and the sheriff got in his patrol car, and they both turned around, and Victor went back up the road at just under the speed limit, with the sheriff riding his bumper the whole way. He made it into New Hampshire with about 30 seconds to spare. Listening to this story, Atticus felt a number of different emotions, but one of the strongest was embarrassment. He'd been so upset by his own encounter with the Indiana State Trooper when the trooper hadn't even drawn his pistol. So the sheriff let him go then? The sheriff stopped at the state border, but the road ran straight for another half mile, and when Victor looked in the rear view, he saw the sheriff get out of the patrol car and train the rifle on him. He got his head down just in time. The sheriff shot out his back window, and one round came straight through and starred the glass above the steering wheel, right at eye level. Victor kept it on the road, though, and kept his foot on the gas. 
He went a whole other county without slowing down before he was sure the sheriff wasn't chasing him. Then the shakes hit him so bad he nearly ran the Lincoln into a ditch. How to get home? Through Canada. Quebec border guards asked some questions about the bullet holes, but they let him in, and he was able to get the glass replaced in Montreal. And when he finally got back here, he typed up this report. George waved the sheet of paper again, saying he couldn't recommend Devon County for inclusion in the Safe Negro Travel Guide. Well, thanks for the warning, George, Attica said. But you know I can't tell Pop that story. It'd just make him even more determined to go. Yeah, I know. I wouldn't tell him about the Shargoff either. Atticus's father didn't answer the buzzer at his apartment building. Atticus rang a second time, and the landlady, Mrs. Fraser, who at 82 could still hear a pin drop anywhere on her property, came out to see who it was. She reacted as George had done, embracing Atticus and welcoming him back. But when she'd finished fussing over him, she told him his father wasn't home and hadn't been for nearly a week. He went off with a white man last Sunday evening just before dark. A white man, Atticus said. You mean a policeman? Oh, I don't think so, Mrs. Fraser said. He wasn't wearing a uniform, and he looked a little young to be a detective, and he drove a very fancy car, silver with dark windows. Never saw one quite like it before. Did this man give his name? No, and your father didn't introduce him. But your father did tell me you'd be coming home soon, and he said you'd know where to find him. Mrs. Fraser, did my father seem okay? Well, you know your father. I wouldn't say he was in a good mood, but it was the least angry I've ever seen him in the presence of a white person. Atticus borrowed a spare key from Mrs. Fraser and let himself into the third floor apartment. He stood just inside the door, adjusting again to the change in scale. The flat, never large, now felt cramped and claustrophobic. The front room was home to the magic couch, which folded out into the bed where Atticus had used to sleep, and the Frankenstein Victrola, which Montrose had built himself, installing a modern turntable, radio receiver, and speakers into an antique phonograph cabinet, salvaged from the flames of Tulsa. Atticus looked with new knowledge at his father's record collection, which crowded the shelves on the walls. The collection contained not just music, but spoken word albums, speeches, lectures, audio plays. Atticus was surprised to see a television set. His father had long resisted that, saying he'd save his money for the day Negroes had their own broadcast stations. Maybe Popular Mechanics was offering build-it-yourself TV kits now. He turned and went into the narrow hallway that ran past the tiny kitchen and bathroom to his parents' bedroom and back. A pair of doorless, shallow hall closets had been fitted out with more shelving. A number of these shelves were still stenciled with Atticus's name, but all of his old possessions were gone, thrown out, in fulfillment of a threat made by Montrose when Atticus announced his intention to join the U.S. Army. Atticus, who'd already removed his few prized belongings to George's for safekeeping, had taken the threat in stride. When his father turned from words to fists, Atticus had taken that too, promising himself this was the last time Montrose would lay a hand on him. But their big fight had come later, in the summer of 1951, when Atticus returned home on leave following his first combat tour. Enough time had passed for both Atticus and his father to regret at least some of what had been said and done. There was no formal reconciliation, and certainly no exchange of apologies. But when Atticus appeared unexpectedly at his father's door one morning, Montrose had let him in. That single act, speaking volumes, their unofficial ceasefire lasted less than a day. That evening, Atticus got a call from a reporter at the Chicago Defender who wanted to interview him for a series of profiles of Negro soldiers. Atticus was flattered, but Montrose became livid when he heard. What's wrong with you? he said. Bad enough you'd nearly throw your own life away for a country that hates you. Now you want to inspire other young men to make the same stupid mistake? The progression from words to blows was quicker this time, with Atticus determined for once to give as good as he got. Looking around the back bedroom, Atticus could still see cracks in the plaster where he and his father, grappling, had slammed into the walls. Incredibly, it was Montrose who'd broken off the fight, right at the point where they were about to start doing serious damage to one another. Atticus had walked out, 
vowing never to return, but in his own gesture of restraint, he'd left the reporter's phone number behind and had not, then or afterwards, allowed himself to be interviewed about his service. Ah, oh, Pop, Atticus said now, sighing. He ran a hand over his head and looked at the bed, tempted. Instead of lying down, he went to the kitchen to get himself a drink of water. That was when he saw the note on the refrigerator door. It was just one word, scrawled on a piece of scrap paper. Atticus recognized the D for what it was now. But in his head, he still heard the name of that other town, the one that existed only in Lovecraft country. He phoned George. You go on after him? George asked. Yeah, I guess I'd better. All right, I'll go with you. You sure? Yeah, of course. We can take Woody. Woody was George's station wagon, a Series 22 Packard with inlaid birch trim and side paneling. Just give me a few hours to find someone to watch Horace and take care of some other things. Okay, Atticus said. But listen, George, in the meantime, you know anyone I could ask who might know about this white guy Pop went off with? You could try over at the brothers. If he's really been gone since Sunday, he must have asked for time off, or they'd have called me to find out where he was. The Garvey Brothers Print Shop, actually owned by a Jewish couple, the Garfields, handled all the printing for George's travel agency, including runs of the Safe Negro Travel Guide. Montrose worked for the brothers as a machinist, maintaining and operating the presses and doing occasional tune-up work on the shop's two delivery trunks. Atticus drove over to the shop and spoke to the weekend supervisor, who confirmed that Montrose had taken his two weeks vacation early, claiming it was a family emergency. The supervisor knew nothing about any white man, though. Atticus had better luck at Denmark Vesey's, the bar where his father sometimes went after work. The bartender on duty, Charlie Boyd, had been working the evening shift a week and a half earlier when a white man had come in, a rare occurrence. Vesey's being the sort of establishment most Caucasians would only enter in search of trouble or a bribe. Guy was in his early twenties, Charlie said. Brown hair, blue eyes, sharp dresser, I don't think he was a cop, but he had that attitude. Like, of course, he could just walk in here, and he wasn't afraid of Tree. Tree was the bouncer, six foot six, and so dark-skinned that even other Negroes sometime did the white man's double-take when they saw him. This guy talked to my dad. Charlie nodded. Came right up to him. Man, you know your dad. He's like, who the hell are you? But this guy says, Mr. Turner, we spoke on the phone and hands him a business card. Charlie shrugged. Maybe he was a lawyer. Maybe that's how he could afford that car. You saw what he was driving? Tree did. Silver four-door sedan with tinted windows. Tree didn't recognize the make, but he figured it must be foreign and real expensive. What did this guy and Pop talk about? That I don't know. After he gave your dad his card, the two of them went over to a booth. They talked for maybe 15 minutes. Then the white guy got up and left. Your dad sat there a while longer finished his drink, and then he left too. That's the last time I saw him in here. And when was this? Wednesday night before last. Montrose's letter to Atticus had been postmarked the following day, but sometime between Thursday and Sunday night, Atticus's father had decided not to wait for a reply. Continuing to puzzle over that, Atticus returned to the apartment. Exhaustion hit him again, and this time he surrendered to it, flopping on the bed in his father's room and napping into the afternoon. The phone woke him. It was George, calling to say he still had some errands to run, but would be ready to leave by six. After he hung up, Atticus checked the fridge, finding nothing among the weak old leftovers he wanted or dared to eat, then wandered, yawning, into the living room. He stepped idly to the window and parted the curtains. This was a mostly middle-class block. Its residence drivers eager to take part in the American dream of consumerism. Often frustrated in that pursuit, they spent their hard-earned dollars where and how they could, on furniture and appliances for their two small apartments, on fine clothes for church, and for those theaters and nightclubs that would grant them admittance, and on luxury cars that, if they couldn't be driven safely through the countryside, at least made a statement parked by the curb. But even on this street of Cadillacs, the car parked at the corner stood out, was speaking a whole other order of wealth and privilege. Sleek, low-slung, and vaguely sinister, it was a car that would surely be named after a predator. 
its silver skin and trim reflected the afternoon sun coldly, suggesting winter rather than summer. Its windows looked not just tinted, but smoked, a seemingly solid black that offered no hint of who or what might be inside. Atticus wasn't the only one to take note of it. A group of boys passing on the sidewalk stopped short beside the car, jaws dropping. One of them reached out to stroke it. As his fingers brushed the metal bodywork, he let out a squawk and yanked his hand back. The other boys laughed. After some double daring, another boy stepped up to place his palm flat on the car hood and jumped back shrieking. The boys broke and ran, laughing in panic. By then, Atticus was moving too. He threw on a shirt, trousers, and shoes and ran downstairs. It couldn't have been more than two minutes, but by the time he reached the sidewalk, the silver car had vanished. He looked up and down the street in vain, then stared at the empty space where the car had been, wondering if he'd dreamed it. Atticus arrived at George's to find a short, slender woman in a sundress standing guard over the Packard. Letitia? he said. Letitia Dandridge. Atticus Turner, Letitia said, feigning disappointment at his uncertainty, for she'd seen him coming a block away and recognized him instantly. But then she laughed and opened her arms. Growing up, the Dandridges had lived west of State Street in a poorer section of the neighborhood. Letitia's older sister, Ruby, had used to babysit Atticus, and her brother, Marvin, had worked part-time at the travel agency. Letitia, a year younger than Atticus, had for a while been the only girl member of the Southside Futurists Science Fiction Club, which met after school in George's parlor. Eventually, Mrs. Dandridge had put an end to that, insisting that Letitia stop wasting time on foolishness and start earning her keep like her siblings, after which Atticus rarely saw her. Tisha Dandridge, he marveled. So what have you been doing with yourself? Oh, you know, same as you. Out in the world, having adventures? Yeah, he smiled. Less fighting, I hope. She shrugged her shoulder. I could tell some stories. And you're back here now? Letitia nodded. You heard Mama died last year. I think Uncle George might have mentioned it in a letter. I'm sorry. Yeah, I missed the funeral, she said, in a tone Atticus might have used to describe missing a bus. I think Mama was pretty mad at me for that. I started having a real bad run of luck. Atticus kept his expression neutral. Mrs. Dandridge had worked in a beauty parlor, but her real business was telling fortunes and putting people in contact with their dead relatives. Talents granted her through some vaguely Pentecostal arrangement with Jesus. Atticus wasn't sure what he thought about all that, but he knew Letitia took it seriously. So you came back home to make peace with her? More like I ran out of choices, Letitia said. I've been staying with Ruby while I come up with a new plan. She thinks I should get a job as a maid up on the north side, but that's never going to happen, so... So what are you doing here? Did George ask you to watch Horace? No, Ruby's going to look after Horace. I'm going with you. You are? Partway, George said. He came out of the building, lugging a grocery bag and a clutch of canteens, and walked around to the open back of the Packard. We're going to give Letitia a ride to her brother's place in Springfield, Massachusetts, that gets us within fifty miles of Ardham. We'll catch our breath there, then go find Montrose. Do we know how to get to Ardham? Atticus asked. That's the other reason we're stopping at Marvin's. He's working for the Springfield Afro-American now. So I asked him to do some research for us. He's going to get us a map of Devon County and see what else he can dig up. Having stowed the food and water, George consulted a checklist, ticking off items. Mattress, pillows and blankets, Spare tire and jack, spare gas, road flares, first aid kit, flashlights, reading material. Looks like we're all set, he concluded. I'll drive the first leg. Who else wants to sit up front? Atticus and Letitia exchanged looks, grinning. Kids again for a moment. Letitia can ride shotgun, Atticus said. I'll stretch out and back until you're ready to change drivers. Now, now, said Letitia. It's a big front seat. Room for all three of us if you want. Play acting again? She slipped her arm in his, arched an eyebrow. I don't mind. The North Korean guerrillas were night fighters. By day, they buried their weapons, 
and hid themselves in plain sight among the civilian population. More than once, while riding past a rice paddy, Atticus had studied the farmers in their cotton pajamas and tried to guess which of them would, come dark, trade his hoe for a rifle and bayonet. But if there was a trick to spotting communist infiltrators, Atticus never learned it. White people, in his experience, were far more transparent. The most hateful rarely bothered to conceal their hostility, and when for some reason they did try to hide their feelings, they generally exhibited all the guile of five-year-olds, who cannot imagine that the world sees them other than as they wish to be seen, all of which is to say, he knew right away there was going to be trouble in Simmonsville. It was a pleasant enough journey up to that point. They crossed Indiana, Ohio, and northwest Pennsylvania without incident. George knew the location of every Esso station along their route, so there was never a problem finding a restroom when they needed one. At their second stop, around midnight, George gave Atticus the driver's seat and crawled into the back to get some shut-eye. Letitia propped a pillow against the front passenger door and slept curled up against it, now and then kicking Atticus in the thigh, as if to keep him from nodding off at the wheel. By sunup, they were in Erie, Pennsylvania. They had a hot breakfast at Egg Benedict's, a cafe recommended by the guide, a recommendation George reaffirmed, jotting an entry into a pocket notebook. Afterwards, Letitia insisted on taking a turn at the wheel. The packet was almost too big for her. She had to scoot forward to reach the pedals, but she handled it just fine, though her heavy foot on the gas made George nervous. Atticus, dozing in back, heard his uncle urging her to slow down, slow down, no need to give the highway patrol any excuses. But Letitia told him not to worry. It was Sunday, and Jesus surely wouldn't let anything happen to her until she had had a chance to make up for missing church. George was still trying to answer that logic when Atticus fell asleep. When he woke, they were at a truck stop in Auburn, New York. George went to refill the canteens, and Letitia took an apple from the grocery bag and got out to stretch her legs. Atticus, without thinking about it, grabbed a banana. He was standing beside the Packard, rubbing sleep from his eyes, when he heard laughter coming from over by the diesel pumps. A truck driver and one of the pump jockeys were grinning at him, elbowing each other in the ribs. Atticus looked at the half-eaten banana in his hand and felt his face get hot. For roughly the millionth time in his life, he asked himself, is there any way I can just ignore this and get on with my day? And he reflected that it was the minor slights that were the hardest to let pass. Then the jockey began thumping his chest and hooting like an ape, and Atticus tossed the banana aside and put up his fists. But before he could step two, a pyramid of oil cans stacked by the pumps collapsed with a crash. The jockey dropped his gorilla act and ran to stop the cans rolling every which way. One got under his foot and he slipped, taking a hard pratfall. The truck driver burst out in fresh laughter and several other customers joined in. Atticus didn't laugh, but he decided to consider the insult paid. He lowered his hands and turned away and saw Letitia strolling back towards the car, no longer holding her apple. They got underway again. Atticus drove and Letitia lay in back with her chin propped in her hands, looking pleased with herself. George, reviewing his travel notes, said that he wanted to stop in Simmonsville for lunch. There's a restaurant there called Lydia's that I got a good report on. As long as we're passing by, I thought we'd check it out. Where is this? Atticus asked. George showed him on the map. Simmonsville was a fly speck in the dairy land south of Utica, a region that, in Horse's Atlas, would probably have been populated by cattle-devouring trolls who picked their teeth with the bones of unwary motorists. You really want to stop in the middle of farm country? Why don't we just keep going till we hit Albany? No, I hear you, George said. But the guy I got the tip from said the woman who owned the place couldn't have been friendlier. Told him to come back any time. It took them another hour and a half to get there. Driving east on the state highway that was sometimes four lanes, but more often, too. Along one of the two-lane stretches, they saw a billboard announcing the upcoming grand opening of the New York State Thruway. The announcement was illustrated with a cartoon of a white family literally flying to their destination in a bubble-top hover car. Look, George, Atticus said. It's the future. At the Simmonsville Junction, a volunteer firehouse had been erected between the two road branches. A shirtless blonde muscle man and tan canvas pans with gray suspenders, sat on a bleached wood chair out front, soaking up the sun and puffing on a cigarette. 
He watched the approaching Packard with interest, eyes narrowing when it chose the road into Simmonsville. It's a red brick building, George said, focused on his notes. Should be on the left-hand side on the far end of town. Atticus, who caught the fireman's look and read the message there, said nothing, only watched in the side mirror until the firehouse was out of sight behind them. The road ran south, past scattered houses, before curving east onto an abbreviated main street with half a dozen shops. The shops were all closed, and the street was deserted, except for a kid on a bicycle doing lazy figure eights in front of a feed store. Next to the feed store was a vacant lot, with a fence thrown up around it to form a small paddock. A big brown mare stood forlornly inside, flicking its tail at the cloud of flies that rose from the dust. Beyond the paddock was an uninviting pile of whitewashed brick with Simmonsville dinette hand-painted on the plate glass window. That must be it, George said. Atticus eased the car to a stop, but kept it idling. I thought you said it was called Lydia's. It's the only brick building, George observed, and it's in the right place. He gestured at the road ahead, which ran on between open fields. And of town. I don't know, George. I don't like the looks of this. Oh, come on. You know better than to judge a book by its cover. A book can't refuse you service, Atticus noted, or spit in your water glass. But George was insistent. So, against his better judgment, Atticus pulled into the gravel lot on the east side of the building. He parked the Packard, facing outward, and left the key in the ignition, just in case. The dinette was small, just a few tables and a counter with a grill top and back. There was only one customer, a man in a pork pie hat who sat at the counter, mopping gravy off a plate with a crust of bread. He looked around as they came in, his eyes turning to slits in a fair imitation of the fireman. The teenage boy behind the counter had the opposite reaction, his eyes going wide as if George, Atticus, and Letitia were green Martians who teleported in from Barsoom. This look of startlement lasted for all of a second before being replaced by a mask of poorly feigned indifference. The white man's double take. Hello there, George said with an exaggerated friendliness meant to stress that they came in peace. We're just driving by today and we thought... The customer slammed his hand down on the counter, making his plate and the counter boy jump. He stood up, adjusted his hat, and made for the door, looking as though he meant to steamroll Letitia, who was in his way. But she stood her ground, and at the last moment, he sidestepped, only brushing her shoulder as he went past and out. So, George said to the counter boy, as if nothing had happened, do we just seat ourselves? The counter boy blinked and his Adam's apple bobbed up and down, which George chose to interpret as a yes. He took a chair at the table nearest the door. George, Atticus began, then sighed and sat down too. Letitia remained standing, flicking something invisible off her shoulder. I'm going to use the ladies, she announced. She headed into the back of the dinette, even as the boy came out from behind the counter carrying menus. He did a little dance to keep from colliding with her knocking over a napkin dispenser with one flailing arm. So, what's good? George asked, picking up the menu that the counterboy dropped in front of him. What do you recommend? The boy just blinked and swallowed. Atticus was beginning to wonder if there was something wrong with him beyond the usual. Tell you what, George said. Why don't we start with some coffee? Looking both relieved and freshly startled, the boy retreated behind the counter. He set up cups and saucers and was reaching for the coffee pot when a phone rang. The boy turned it towards the sound, paused, and turned back towards the pot. The phone rang again, and he repeated his two-step of indecision, this time managing to somehow sweep the cups onto the floor. He stepped back from the shattering of crockery, threw up his hands, and on the third ring went running into the back. Atticus watched him go. He heard the phone being picked up and heard the boy say softly, Hello? so at least he wasn't a mute. Atticus looked at George. You got a good report on this place, huh? It was from a few months ago, George said, shrugging. Obviously the place is under new management or something. You think so? Yeah, okay, but we're here now. Doesn't mean we have to stay. We get back in the car, 
We could be in Albany in ninety minutes. Nah, we're here. Let's just order. George, we're here, George said. And we have every right to be. I'm a citizen. You're a citizen and a veteran, for God's sake. Our money spends as good as anyone else's. I hear you. But this citizen likes to get value for his money. And if the food here is anything like the service, hey, that other guy cleaned his plate. Anyway, I'm hungry. Let's give the nervous kid a chance. But the nervous kid was taking his time coming back. For that matter, so was Letitia. Growing restless, Atticus leaned back in his chair and stretched. His knuckles brushed the wall, and he noticed that the dinette's interior brick was coated with the same whitewash as the exterior. He looked up. The ceiling was bright new wood, unpainted, except for two rough support beams, thick as phone poles, that were slathered in white. He checked the floor next, new linoleum, and expertly laid down. Hey, George? Atticus said. Yeah? You remember that time when I was little, and you and me and Pop took that trip to Washington, D.C.? Sure, of course I do. That's where I first met Hippolyta, remember? But what makes you think of that now? Looking at the wall again, Atticus repeated a trivia question from that long-ago road trip. Why is the White House white? War of 1812, George said. British soldiers put the executive branch into the torch. Then later, when the slaves rebuilt it, they had to paint the walls white to cover up the... The burn marks, Atticus finished for him, as the fire truck pulled up in front of the dinette. The man with the gray suspenders was driving. Another fireman and the customer in the pork pie hat were in the cab with him, and two more men were riding on the sides of the rig. George slid his chair away from the table. Back door, he suggested. Might be better to make a stand here. Take them one at a time as they come in, Atticus said. The firemen formed a skirmish line beside their vehicle. Gray Suspenders was armed with a fire axe, and one of the other men had a baseball bat. But before they could rush the dinette, something caused them to all turn and look back the way they'd come. They stood motionless for a moment, and then the man with the bat walked west out of view. Another man followed him, and another, and finally the guy in the pork pie hat, leaving only gray suspenders beside the truck with his axe lowered and his arms spread in a gesture of dismay. Atticus and George were leaning towards the window, trying to see what was going on, when Letitia returned at long last from the ladies' room, moving calmly but swiftly. Her forehead was beaded with sweat, and there was dust in her hair. Time to go, she said. She didn't need to say it twice. They slipped out the front door and ran for the car, George and Atticus both glancing over their shoulders at the mare, now loose in the street, rearing up, kicking at the men who surrounded it. The man with the bat stepped too close and took a hoof in the ribs. George yanked open the passenger door and slid across the front seat to the driver's side, Letitia and Atticus piling in after him. Atticus was pulling the door shut again when gray suspenders belatedly noted their departure and let out a shout. George gunned the motor and drove out of the lot in a spray of gravel. They sped east through the fields. While George kept an eye on the rear view, Atticus threw a questioning glance at Letitia. The counterboy ran out the back, she explained. But before he did, I overheard him on the phone talking about these scary Negroes who'd taken over the restaurant. I thought we might need a diversion. We may need another one, George said. The fire truck was chasing them. George gripped the wheel and gave the Packard more gas. Letitia, honey, he said, would you do me a favor and reach real careful under my seat? The gun was a forty-four Colt revolver, reassuringly large. Atticus nodded. I was hoping that was on the checklist, he said. He held out a hand. But before turning the revolver over to him, Letitia swung out the cylinder, verified that all six chambers were loaded, and snapped it closed again. Try not to kill anyone, George said. But see if you can get these fools to back off. I'll do my best, Atticus said. He gave Letitia another look, then took the gun and turned to roll down his window. A shiny blur caught his eye. Across the narrowing field to their right was another road, and a silver car with smoked windows was racing along it, running neck and neck with the Packard. George, Atticus said. I see it, George said. 
The two roads converged at a crossing up ahead, but with the fire truck coming up behind them, he couldn't slow down. Instead, he pressed the accelerator all the way to the floor and laid on the horn. The silver car sped up too. Atticus thumbed back the hammer on the colt and fired a warning shot across the field. This brought no reaction from the silver car, but as the gun's report faded away, there was a second, thinner pistol crack from behind them. Pork Pie Hat was leaning out of the fire truck, holding his lid on with one hand and aiming a snub-nosed revolver with the other. Hail, George said. Letitia shut her eyes and whispered urgently to the Lord. Atticus leveled the colt at the silver car. At the last second, the silver car gave way. The Packard roared through the crossing, and the silver car cut in behind it with a squeal of brakes, skidding to a halt directly in the path of the fire truck. The truck bore down on it, horn and siren merging into one long bray. The truck swerved. To Atticus, looking back, it seemed that it swerved too late, but in the instant before impact, the whole vehicle jolted sideways, as though some external force had given it a shove. It missed the silver car by a hand's breadth, then cut back across the road, out of control, and crashed through a fence into another field. He glimpsed a fireman catapulting through the air, even as the truck was swallowed by a great billowing cloud of dust. The silver car remained in the crossroads. In a moment, it too had disappeared behind the dust blowing across the road. But before it did, Atticus saw it flash its headlights, just once, as though it were winking at him. A childhood bout with polio had left Letitia's brother Marvin with a withered left arm, but he insisted on carrying her bag inside for her. The little house smelled pleasantly of a stew that had been simmering since noon and hot bread, fresh out of the oven. Within minutes of their arrival, they were seated around the kitchen table, saying grace, and the first taste of the food lifted their spirits so much that when Marvin asked how their trip had gone, they all burst out laughing. They told him the story of their adventure in Simmonsville, George and Atticus both praising Letitia for her cleverness in releasing the mare. Like having our own Indian scout, George said. And a lucky thing, too. Now, now, said Letitia, blushing. But, by unspoken agreement, they did not mention the silver car or the wreck of the fire truck. And Atticus, knowing his and George's journey wasn't over, never fully relaxed. When Marvin brought out dessert, homemade blueberry pie and vanilla ice cream, every mouthful of which sapped the will for further travel, Atticus began casting glances at the clock on the wall. It was already after four. Marvin took the hint. Leaving his own pie and ice cream unfinished, he went into another room and came back with a notepad. So I did that research you asked, he said. I'd heard stories about Devon County before, but I never realized just how strange a place it is. Consulting his notes, the county seat, Biddeford, is named for a town in England where they held one of the country's last witch trials. That was in 1682. A woman named Temperance Lloyd was convicted of having intercourse with the devil, who appeared to her in the form of a black man. They hanged her, along with two other women. George raised an eyebrow. You're not saying Biddeford, Massachusetts, was founded by witches, are you? More like the witch hunters. A number of the families who settled Biddeford in 1731 were related to the prosecutors in the Temperance Lloyd case, and proud of it. The town developed a reputation for being unusually backward-looking, even by 18th century standards. During the War of Independence, the citizens of Biddeford sided with King George, and in 1795, the mayor of Biddeford was arrested by the state militia for continuing to hold slaves more than a decade after the Massachusetts Supreme Court declared slavery unconstitutional. Then a few years after that, the state tried to consolidate Devon County into Worcester County. Most of Devon went along, but Biddeford and three other neighboring towns refused to be assimilated, and eventually the legislature threw up its hands and decided to let them be. Ever since, it's been like the land time forgot, inbred, insular, clinging to the past tooth and nail, and they don't like Negroes, Atticus said. They don't like outsiders, period, said Marvin. But yeah. I found a lot of stories in our news morgue about travelers getting attacked in Devon. A lot of missing person reports, too. He looked at George. That stretch of highway your friend Victor was on? Not a healthy place for a colored man to be driving, day or night. What about Autumn? George said. Autumn's more of a mystery. It was settled around the same time as Biddeford, but none of the local histories say by who 
or who lives there now. I couldn't find any news clippings on it at all. I was going to call the Registry of Deeds and see about property records, but they aren't open on weekends, and I have a feeling the Biddeford office might not be all that helpful anyway. Never mind the property records, said Atticus. Can you tell us how to get there? I think so. Here, reach me that map tube from up on the refrigerator. They cleared the dishes and unrolled the map of Devon County on the table. The centers of Devon's four towns formed a rough box around a forest called the Sabbath Kingdom Wood, with Biddeford at the southwest corner. The unincorporated community of Ardham was a fifth point near the top of the map. It was nestled in a small, open area, bounded on the north by nameless hills, and on the south by the Connecticut River Tributary, identified here as the Shadow Brook. A bridge crossed from Ardham southeast over the water, and a road led into the wood on the far side. But within a mile, the road faded out, as though the mapmaker's pen had run dry. Seven or eight miles to the southwest, it reappeared, crossing Torridge Creek into Biddeford. This is the most detailed map I could find, Marvin said. Most don't even hand out a road through the forest, but it exists. It's unpaved, and it loops and branches and dead ends, but it's drivable, and it will get you to Artem eventually. More so, I'm told. Told by who? Atticus said. A friend at the state census bureau? Devon County's reputation being what it is, I thought he might have some stories, so I called him at home this afternoon. Turns out he'd spoken with the census taker who visited Artem in 1950. It was kind of a to-do. On his first try, the census taker turned back halfway through the woods because he thought he was being stalked by a grizzly bear. He came back a week later with a park ranger from Mount Holyoke. Did he say what Artem was like? The census taker compared it to a medieval farm village. Big manor house up on the hillside, cottages and fields down by the water. Pretty as a postcard, but the residents weren't any friendlier than the people in Biddeford. At the manor, no one would come to the door, and the folks in the cottages threw rocks at the car. Well, said George, I'm sure Montrose will have them won over by the time we get there. What about the sheriff? Atticus asked. Oh, yeah. Marvin flipped open his pad again. Eustace Hunt. He's only been sheriff a few years, but the NAACP's got a thick complaint file on him. Forty-five years old, unmarried, former Marine drill sergeant from North Carolina. He moved to Biddeford after he was discharged. I thought they didn't like outsiders. He's a special case, sort of a prodigal son. The Hunts were one of Biddeford's founding families. But in 1861, a bunch of them got secession fever and went south to sign up with General Lee. Sheriff Hunt is descended from one of the survivors of Pickett's Charge. And proud of it, Atticus guessed. You sure there isn't some other way in Artem? Like maybe a nice quiet back road over those hills from New Hampshire? Not that I know of, Marvin said. Sorry. So what do you want to do? George said. Well, I don't know about you, said Atticus, but I've had my fill of rednecks for one day. And for what Marvin says, it sounds like it doesn't matter whether we go before sunset or after. Either way, the sheriff's not going to be happy to see us. So maybe the smart move is not to let him see us. You mean go after Doc? I'm thinking early morning. Say we leave here around 2 a.m., roll through Biddeford around 3, while the witch hunters are all sleeping. Once we get in the woods, we'll see what that road is really like, and either keep going or find a spot to hide from the grizzlies until sunup. Knock on the manor door for breakfast. Sure, George said and laughed. That'll work. Then Letitia said, I'm going with you. She'd been quiet so long, they'd almost forgotten she was there. What? said Atticus. No. Definitely not, said George. But now, Marvin was laughing. Uh-oh, he said. Somebody just got a message from Jesus. Letitia scowled at him. Now why would you want to go and say a blasphemous thing like that? Why, and you? She turned to Atticus and George. Didn't you just get done talking about how lucky you were to have me with you today? We did, and we were. And we're grateful, honey, George said. But, and didn't I tell you? The Lord would keep me safe? You really think it's just luck you're the beneficiary of that? Oh, here we go, said Marvin. You really think it's an accident I just happened to need a ride to Springfield? Accident or no, Atticus said. You don't need a ride to Autumn, and you're not getting one. Atticus? No, Letitia. It's bad enough George and I have to go. This isn't just some racist backwater. It's weird. 
all the more reason not to refuse a gift of providence. Gift of providence, Marvin said. And I'm the blasphemer. He started laughing again, slotting his chair back when Letitia tried to kick him under the table. But Atticus and George weren't so easily moved. Letitia slept in Marvin's room that night, while Marvin took the living room Davenport, and George and Atticus grabbed a few hours' rest on a pair of spare mattresses in the basement. George went straight to sleep, but Atticus stayed up reading till almost midnight. When the alarm woke them at quarter to two, Marvin was already making coffee. Atticus sat in the kitchen, while George went to run his checklist on the car again. Letitia's awake, Marvin said, unprompted. I heard her moving around but I don't think she's coming out to say goodbye. Sorry if we got your visit off on the wrong note. No, that's my own fault for teasing her. She's here to borrow money from me, Marmon explained. She hasn't said for what yet, but I know it's going to be for something the Lord wants her to do, which means he wants me to make the loan, right? Trouble is, I'm a cynic who mocks divine providence, so I think now she's got it figured that helping you is the price God wants from her in exchange for softening my heart. He shook his head. It was Mama who taught her to think that way. Letitia's more sincere about it than Mama was, but still, it annoys me. Atticus, not knowing what to say to this, drank his coffee. Anyway, Marvin concluded, she'll get over it as soon as she figures another angle. God's will is flexible. George came back in. Ready as we'll ever be, he said. You want a cup before you go? Marvin asked. No, that's okay. I don't think I have any trouble keeping my eyes open, and I'd rather not have to pee in the woods. All right, then, Marvin said. Stay safe. Stop by on your way home and let us know you're okay. He looked at Atticus. The Tisha and I will be praying for you. George drove. Their route north took them through White Springfield, and as they were stopped for a light near the city limits, a police cruiser drove up alongside them. George kept his eyes on the road ahead, and Atticus did likewise. When the light changed, the cruiser waited for them to go first and followed them to the city line. Once it was clear they were leaving town, the cruiser turned back without stopping them. But given their rationale for being abroad at this hour, they couldn't help taking it as a bad omen. Biddeford's a lot smaller than Springfield, George suggested. Police night shift is probably just a deputy with his feet up at the station house. Yeah, that sounds good, said Atticus, feeling foolish. Keep saying that. The highway was deserted, and they made good time. Around quarter to three, they passed the turnoff for New Salem. George abruptly killed the headlights and pulled onto the shoulder. What? said Atticus. Could just be the willies, George said. But I feel like there's still someone behind us. They sat in the dark, looking back at the road junction, which was illuminated by a lamp strung on a utility pole. No other vehicles appeared. The willies, George affirmed, not sounding terribly convinced. A few more miles, and they came to a sign announcing Devon County. At a crossroads a few miles after that, they turned onto King Street, Biddeford's main thoroughfare. From Marvin's map, they knew it was possible to reach the Torridge Creek Bridge without passing through the town center, but they decided it was better to take the most direct route rather than risk getting lost on some side road. Once again, they found a cause to question their reasoning. Whatever other aspects of progress the citizens of Biddeford had rejected, they clearly had no problem with electricity. Floodlights on the front of the town hall, county courthouse, and several other buildings turned a two-block stretch of King Street bright as day. The intersection at the center of this bright zone featured Biddeford's only traffic signal, which turned red as they approached it. They sat waiting at the light, feeling horribly exposed, even though, as on the highway, they seemed to have the road to themselves. George drummed his fingers on the wheel and nervously scanned the empty sidewalks. Atticus peered up at the darkened windows above a corner barber shop. Lowering his gaze to the shop itself, he spied, taped to the inside of the glass, a faded campaign poster for the state's rights Democratic Party, with the stern white faces of Strom Thurmond and Fielding Wright giving him the evil eye. The traffic signal turned green. George goosed the accelerator. The squeal of the Packard's tires, too loud in the 3 a.m. stillness. They rolled past a squat brick fort on which the words Devon County Sheriff's Department were illuminated by yet another floodlight. 
George and Atticus, both shrinking down in their seats until the building was behind them. King Street ended at the creek. They turned right onto Bank Street, a narrow lane that ran behind a pair of small factory buildings. A white man loitered by the back door of one of the factories, having a smoke. When he saw the Packard coming around the corner, he tossed his cigarette and stepped out into the middle of the lane, raising an arm to shield his eyes. Wakely? he called. That you? George and Atticus sat frozen, as if they were the ones caught in the headlights. Wakely! the man called again. He came towards them, slipping a hand into his trouser pocket. Who is that? He started to walk around the driver's side, and George goosed the accelerator again, the man crying out, Hey! and stumbling back against the guardrail that ran along the creek bank. They almost missed the turn onto the bridge, which was unmarked and unlit, but Atticus saw the gap in the guardrail and said, Here! A tap of the brakes, another squeal of tires, and they were passing over the creek in a wooden tunnel. The road on the far side was blacktopped for the first dozen yards, but then, like the ink trail on Marvin's map, the blacktop faded out, leaving a rutted bed of dirt and stones. While rocks pelted the Packard's undercarriage, tree limbs swung out of the dark to swat the roof and windshield. Jesus, Atticus said, but he was more relieved than not to have Biddeford behind them. The road curved sharply left, and for a moment, they could see the lights of King Street again, shining faintly through the tree branches. Then they turned right and went up, George hissing as the track got even rougher. But at the top of the rise, as though they'd passed a test, the road smoothed out significantly, and the trees stopped pounding on the roof. Tell you what, George said, after all this, Montrose had damn well better be there. Yeah, said Atticus. Be funny if it turned out he was in Arden, Minnesota, wouldn't it? They rounded another sharp bend and saw a barrier up ahead. A barred metal gate between stone posts with a sign reading, Private. George eased to a stop in front of it. By the headlights, they could see that the gate wasn't chained or padlocked. A simple lift latch secured it. They sat in the car, listening for grizzlies and Shawgoths. I'll flip you for it, George said finally. No, that's okay, I'll get it, said Atticus. He added, laughing as he reached for the door handle, you were right about the coffee. A fury of light and sound engulfed them. The patrol car had been hiding in the trees back at the bend, and it crept up from behind, even as they sat listening. The sudden stab of its high beams served as a signal to the men in the bushes beside the gate. They ran upon the Packard in a pincer movement, using the butts of their guns to smash in the side windows. Atticus recoiled from the spray of glass. George bent forward and was about to reach under the seat when a stronger instinct of self-preservation forced him back. He thrust his hands in the air, even as a shotgun muzzle floated into view outside his shattered window. The next few moments unfolded with a grim familiarity. They were ordered from the car, struck, screamed at, searched, struck again, and finally marched to the back of the Packard and made to sit on the rear bumper with their hands behind their heads and their feet crossed in front of them. Sheriff Eustace Hunt stepped in front of the patrol car's headlights, like a malevolent body eclipsing a sun. His two deputies, lesser satellites, orbited into view beside him. All three lawmen had shotguns, the sheriffs double-barreled, and Atticus noted they were careful to stand back, out of reach of any desperate lunges. What did I tell you, East Church? The sheriff said, addressing the deputy on his left. Sometimes you can just feel it. Someone who doesn't belong, trying to sneak in the back door when they think you aren't paying attention. Yeah, but you'd said they'd be gypsies, Sheriff. The deputy replied. Well, that was a little poetic license, the sheriff said. Nothing wrong with that, as long as you're correct on the main point. Nodding at the license plate. They are travelers, that's for sure. Unless the car's stolen, offered the second deputy. Well, now, that's a fair point, Talbot. What about it, boys? The sheriff asked George and Atticus. You really from Illinois? Or are you just a couple of thieves from Worcester? Sheriff, George said, and then fell silent, eyeing the guns. Go on, the sheriff said. We're all dying to hear it, really. George shook his head slowly. I don't know who you're lying in wait for here, sheriff. 
but you're making... This is a misunderstanding. The sheriff chuckled. You hear that East Church, he said. The way he called himself there. He was going to say I was making a mistake, but if he says that, he's a Negro, telling a good white Christian man that he's wrong, and you know that never ends well. Point not a misunderstanding, though. That's just being polite. Like letting me know I dropped something. I think I like this one, East Church. He's smart. Not that smart, opined the deputy. We do what we can within the limits God has set for us, the sheriff said. I'm smart, too, he told George. I'll prove it by predicting what you're going to say next. You're going to tell me you don't know anything about a burglary in Biddeford last night or two other burglaries in Buck Mills last week. And when I ask you about the campfire John Wickley saw burning in these woods on Friday, you're going to say, what campfire, Sheriff? Do we look like Boy Scouts? His good humor dissipating, he continued, you got greedy. Your real mistake was coming to Devon County at all. But if you'd stopped with Buck's Mill, you might have got away with it. My other deputy, Coleman, he had me halfway convinced it was local kids who were doing the robberies. In fact, he's over in Instow tonight on his own stakeout. He's going to be sorry when he hears he missed out on the fun. Sheriff Hunt, Atticus said. All three shotguns were suddenly pointed at his head, but he took a breath and continued speaking in a calm voice. My Uncle George is right, Sheriff Hunt. This is a misunderstanding. We aren't burglars. You can go ahead and check the car for stolen goods if... East Church? The sheriff said. Yes, yeah, Sheriff. Tell me I didn't just hear that. Did this nigger just give me permission to search his car? I believe he might have, Sheriff. The sheriff shook his head in disbelief. This one, he said, I don't like. But Atticus went on, unwavering. We aren't burglar sheriff, or car thieves either. We're guests. Guests? The sheriff barked laughter. In my woods? I don't think so. Guests of Artem, Atticus said. I'm sorry if we're trespassing on your territory here, but we were invited, and we don't know any other way to go. Artem? More laughter. Boy, you are a lousy liar. I've heard some odd things about that commune out there, but if you think they'd extend a welcome to the likes of you, well, let's just say you should take that alibi back for a refund. It's the truth, Sheriff. We were invited to the manor house in Artem, the big house up on the hill. We're expected. Sure you are. And who is it that's expecting you exactly? Montrose Turner. The sheriff clucked his tongue. Now see that right there is a basic failure of research. You take the trouble to learn my name, which is telling. But if you'd really done your homework, you know the only Turners around here are Andrew and Grace Turner over in Insto. Montrose Turner is my father, Atticus said. He's staying at the manor house in Artem. He asked us to meet him there. But he didn't tell you who you'd be guests of, the sheriff said. That's funny. Where I come from, if you stay at a man's house, you know that man's name, even if someone else does the inviting. Maybe you do things differently in Illinois, Sheriff. Or maybe, company you keep, you're used to even stupid lies being believed. You don't have to believe us, Sheriff, Atticus said. Just take us to Artem. Just take you there. Three in the morning, just go knocking on doors. The hour won't matter. We're expected. You're sure of that, are you? Positive, said Atticus, actually managing to sound as if he was. All right, then, the sheriff said, nodding. We'll go to Artem. Atticus and George both sat very still, waiting for the catch. Yeah, we'll go to Artem, the sheriff continued. The thing is, though, it can be a tricky drive. You've seen how the road twists and turns, and it gets worse past this gate. The good news is, I know a shortcut. Through there. The sheriff nodded at the darkness beside the road. Talbot, get us a flashlight, would you? We're going for a stroll in the woods, and I wouldn't want anybody walking into a tree by accident. Sure, sheriff. The deputy ducked back to the patrol car. The sheriff gestured with his shotgun. 
You boys, stand up slowly now, he said. Keep your hands behind your heads. Sheriff, said Atticus. Hold on a second, said George. Stand up, the sheriff repeated, or I'll take you to Autumn right here. Keep that light steady, Talbot, the sheriff said. The young one's thinking about running, and I don't want to have to strain my eyes when I blow a hole through his back. From the moment they'd left the road, Atticus had been watching for some sort of cover that he and George could dive behind and so survive the first volley that would accompany any attempt to escape. But either the sheriff really did know these woods, or the wood itself was conspiring against them. The ground they walked on was level, with only light undergrowth, and the trees, which earlier had crowded so close beside the road, were sparse enough here to offer only minimal protection. Even so, on his own, he would already have made a break for it. Now, reckoning they had only a few more steps before being ordered to their knees and shot, he tried to catch George's eye without turning his head. If they broke and ran at the same time, one of them might make it. Don't try it, boy, the sheriff said. I know what you're thinking, but I used to shoot skeet down at Camp Lejeune. The two of you could run opposite ways, and I'd still hit you both without reloading. I... The sound came from up ahead. Just beyond the range of the light, a sudden sharp crack, like a rifle shot or a thick branch breaking, followed by a heavy thump in the undergrowth. Atticus... George and the three lawmen all stopped, and the flashlight beam wavered. Keep that light steady, Talbot, the sheriff commanded. Out in the darkness, a big something slid or was dragged along the ground. They heard the snap of another branch, and another, and then the prolonged groan of an entire tree being shoved over. A crash. Boom! The shotgun blast was louder than all the sounds that had preceded it. George staggered and dropped to his knees. Atticus let out a strangled cry and dropped down beside him, throwing arms around him and feeling for the wound. But George shook his head. He wasn't shot, just rubber-legged with fear. Atticus looked around. The sheriff had pivoted slightly to the left and was aiming his shotgun out into the woods, smoke curling from one of the barrels. Deputy Talbot pointed the flashlight in the same direction, but East Church still held his gun steady on Atticus and George. The sheriff called into the darkness. These are my woods, understand? Man or beast, you better get your ass away from here. He fired off his second barrel, and George jolted in Atticus's arms. A stillness fell. The sheriff broke his shotgun and reloaded, then stood listening. From the woods came only silence now. The tree feller, man or beast, either dead or playing dead. All right, the sheriff said. Where were we? Atticus spoke softly to his uncle. Come on, George. Get up. No, that's okay. You boys stay down, said the sheriff. I think we've walked far enough. Time to finish this up. Unless, he added, you'd like to talk about those burglaries now. The new sound came from the road behind them. A soft whomp of ignition accompanied by a blossom of flame. By the time the sheriff and his deputies turned to look, the blossom had become a blazing pyre with a car-shaped silhouette. The hell? Deputy Talbot said. Sheriff Hunt locked eyes with Atticus. Boy, he said, did you neglect to mention something? A car horn sounded. The Packard's horn, Atticus thought, which would make the sheriff's car the burnt offering. East Church, the sheriff said, you come with me. Talbot, you stay here. If they do anything, you put them down. The sheriff hesitated, as if debating whether to preemptively carry out the last part of that order himself. Then the Packard's horn sounded again, and he spun on his heel and ran back towards the road, with East Church following a few steps behind. Atticus turned his head to face George, who nodded meaningfully. He looked down. A thick tree branch lay on the ground just in front of George's knees, Atticus turned his head again until he could see Deputy Talbot out of the corner of his eye. The deputy was standing about six feet away, with his shotgun in one hand and the flashlight in the other. The gun was pointed roughly in Atticus and George's direction, but the muzzle had dipped towards the ground. Meanwhile, the flashlight beam, like the deputy's attention, was wandering. He shined it at the retreating figures of the sheriff and East Church, then back at Atticus and George, then out into the woods where they'd heard the tree go down. 
Atticus took his hand off George's chest and reached for the branch. He gripped it tightly and readied himself, waiting until the flashlight beam had begun to move away again. Pushing off George, he sprang up, stepped back, and spun around, swinging the branch in a vicious arc, putting everything he had into it. The branch passed through empty air. Atticus stumbled and nearly fell down again. He stood teetering above the flashlight, which now lay on the ground. Holding the branch with both hands, he looked around wildly for the deputy, expecting at any instant to be shot. But the deputy was gone. The hell? Atticus thought. Then he heard it. Out in the wood, straight ahead and much closer than before. The beast. Definitely beast, he told himself. And big. Big enough to knock down trees or yank unwary deputies off their feet, but stealthy now, making just enough noise as it moved through the undergrowth to let Atticus know it was there. It was moving away from him. He bent down and scooped up the flashlight, fumbling it. By the time he had it steady, the beast was already beyond the range of the beam, circling towards the road. Atticus, George said. Help me up. Atticus went to him and slung an arm around his shoulders. As they were getting to their feet, the light from the fire dimmed. Briefly, a big blur of shadow passing between them and it. In the distance, Sheriff Hunt called out, East Church? Where the hell are you? A long pause. Then a shotgun went off. Atticus and George both saw the muzzle flash. It looked like it was out on the road, the gun firing straight up into the air. Then stillness, broken only by the crackle and hiss of the flames. Atticus and George exchanged glances. George sighed and shrugged. Atticus turned off the flashlight and led the way back towards the road, trying to move silently. They were almost there when Atticus's foot kicked something hard. A shotgun, single-barreled. He crouched down and looked around for some other trace of Deputy East Church and wasn't really surprised when he didn't find one. He passed the flashlight to George and picked up the gun and continued to the road. The patrol car was now an anonymous blackened hulk, pushing flames and smoke into the air. The Packard's rear hatch and tailgate were open, and by the flickering firelight, Atticus could see that the blankets on the mattress and back had been shoved to one side. Sheriff Hunt lay belly down on the ground, directly behind the station wagon, bleeding from a gash on the back of his head. Lying beside him, bloodied and dented, was the emergency gas can with which he'd been cold cocked. Letitia? Atticus called softly, and she came out of the shadows on the far side of the road, holding the sheriff's shotgun. What happened to the other two? she said. Grizzly bear ate them, Atticus replied, trying not to dwell on the next question. Why them, and not us? The patrol car coughed out a fresh ball of flame. Hell, George said. The heat was intense, and it was something of a marvel that the Packard hadn't caught fire too. We've got to get out of here. While he ran to the front of the station wagon, Letitia and Atticus faced each other over the prone body of the sheriff. Letitia was smiling, self-satisfied. I told you God sent me along for a reason, she said. Atticus glanced back into the wood, thinking, I don't think it's God that saved us. George had the gate open and was standing by the driver's door. Come on, he called to them. Let's go. Letitia put the share of shotgun into the back of the Packard. Atticus picked up the gas can, still half full, and stowed it in back as well. Then, while Letitia ran around to the passenger side and climbed in the front seat, he stood over the sheriff, holding Deputy East Church's shotgun, and asked himself another question. Atticus, George said. Come on. Hell with it, Atticus said. He slid the shotgun into the Packard beside the other one and climbed in after it. George started the engine. Atticus had pulled the tailgate shut and was about to close the hatch when he saw the other car. It was back at the bend in the road, its engine and headlights off, only visible because of the flames from the burning wreck reflecting off its silver skin. George stepped on the gas. Atticus lost his balance and nearly tumbled out over the tailgate. By the time he caught himself, they'd already started around another curve, and the only thing visible was the fading flicker of the fire. In another moment, that was gone too. Atticus opened his eyes to gray light and morning mist. He sat up stiffly, 
feeling broken bits of glass on the seat beneath him. George was asleep behind the wheel, head tipped back and snoring, and Letitia lay in back wrapped in a blanket. Atticus opened his door and got out. The Packard was parked beneath a circle of trees, screened from the road by a tall stand of bushes. Opposite the direction of the road, he heard the sound of flowing water. He moved towards it carefully, and pushing through another screen of foliage, found himself atop a steep embankment. The stream below was rocky and shallow by the bank, but deepened swiftly to a dark central channel. Across the water, still half shrouded in mist, was the farm village described by the census taker. The shadow brook curved like a moat around Ardham's fields, which were divided into plots by low stone walls. The plot directly across from where Atticus stood lay fallow. A herd of goats was grazing on the wild grasses and shoots that grew there. Off to the right, in the middle distance, Atticus could see a bridge connecting the Shadowbrook's two banks. North beyond the fields, the land rose up to another higher tier of open ground that held white-walled cottages, and to the left, a group of larger buildings, including a steepled church. Higher still, overlooking all else, was the looming, pale shape of the manor. Its outline was hazy and indistinct in the mist, but Atticus could see lights shining in several windows. There were lights in some of the cottages, too, though not as bright. A man came out of one of them and walked down to the fallow field carrying a stool and two metal pails. The goats heard him coming and ran to meet him. Then came a splash off to the left, and Atticus saw a woman dipping a wooden bucket into the stream. The woman was close enough that he could have called to her, but like the goat herd, she was white, so instead he did a quiet fade back behind the bushes. A hand came down on his shoulder. George. Atticus put a finger to his lips and said softly, Looks like we found it. He spread the branches so that George could peer out. Looks like we did, George said, not sounding enthusiastic. He pulled back, frowning, turned towards the car, then finally looked at Atticus again. Can I ask you something? You want to know how we got here? Atticus thought about it. He remembered driving away from the burning patrol car, remembered a seemingly endless and increasingly dreamlike journey through the dark wood, and remembered waking, moments ago, to gray light and mist. I don't know, Atticus said to George's frown. I was going to ask you. They all sat up front, George driving, Letitia in the middle, and Atticus on the passenger side holding the revolver in his lap. The bridge into Ardham was an arch of moss-covered stone. Iron posts topped with hooks had been set along the sides at intervals. Atticus assumed these were for hanging lights of some kind, though he couldn't help contemplating other potential uses, particularly for the posts at the center of the span that offered the longest drop. George, perhaps thinking along similar lines, drove quickly to the far side, then had to slam on the brakes when a white man stepped into the Packard's path. The man who carried a rudimentary fishing pole and a pail full of still-twitching trout, regarded them through the windshield. They waited to see whether he would curse or yell for help or reach for a stone or just swing the pail. In the end, he did none of these things, but instead bowed his head as though an apology and stepped back to give them the right of way. George was so surprised by this that at first he could only stare, but the fisherman waited patiently, eyes downcast, for him to get the car in gear. They drove on. The road forked, one branch leading west among the cottages and the other continuing uphill. They went up. At the top of the incline, the road, now graded with crushed gravel, became a curved drive in front of the manor house. The manor, built of pale gray stone, consisted of a central flat-topped structure three stories high, flanked by two two-story wings under roofs of angled slate. Most of the windows in the wings were dark, but those in the center structure were alight, and Atticus glimpsed a figure on the third floor looking out. George pulled up to the manor's front entrance. To their left, on the grassy ellipse encircled by the drive, bracketed by a pair of iron benches, was an icon from Horace's maps, a sundial atop a pedestal. They spared it a brief glance, but their attention was drawn inevitably to the silver car parked farther along the drive in front of the west wing. Dew beaded its hood in the opaque curve of its windshield. Well, Atticus said, I guess we'd better knock and see what's for breakfast. He put the revolver in the Packard's glove compartment 
and got out. The space above the manor's double doors was decorated, in silver, with a half-sun peeking over a horizon. Smaller half-suns were fixed to the doors themselves, serving as backplates for the door-knockers. Atticus mounted the front steps and reached for the knocker on the right, but before he could grab hold of it, the door swung inward. A ginger-haired man in a butler's uniform appeared on the threshold. He was extraordinarily pale, practically an albino, but his gaze was unflinching, and the smile he gave Atticus was immediate and unforced. Mr. Turner, I presume, the man said. Welcome to the Ardham Lodge, sir. My name is William, the man told them. I was asked to look out for you, Mr. Turner, and see that you and any companions you might have are made comfortable. He turned to George. You'd be Mr. Barry, perhaps. The elder Mr. Turner's half-brother? Yeah, I'm Montrose's brother, George said. William nodded. Mr. Turner thought you might come as well. And you, Miss... Dandridge, Letitia said. She's a friend of the family, Atticus said. A good friend. A welcome guest, then, William assured him. And who is it we're guests of, exactly? Mr. Samuel Braithwaite. William spread his hands in a gesture that encompassed more than just the building in whose doorway he stood. This is Mr. Braithwaite's vacation home. Mr. Braithwaite, Atticus said slowly, as if testing the feel of the name on his tongue. And with that, he pointed at the silver car, happened to belong to Mr. Braithwaite as well. The Daimler? Yes, sir. A custom model, specially commissioned by Mr. Braithwaite. It's a fierce machine, isn't it? Very said Atticus. Then, I appreciate you welcoming us, William, but I'm anxious to see my father. Can you take us to him? I'm sorry, sir, but I'm afraid he's not here. Mr. Turner and Mr. Braithwaite drove to Boston yesterday afternoon to meet with Mr. Braithwaite's lawyer. They drove to Boston? I thought you said that was Mr. Braithwaite's car. Mr. Braithwaite has many cars, sir, William replied. Now, if you'd like to come inside, I can show you to the rooms where you'll be staying. Don't worry about your luggage. I'll have it brought up. But Atticus, thinking of the sheriff behind them in the woods, or maybe back in Biddeford by now, rounding up a lynch mob, made no move to enter. Is something wrong, sir? William asked. Then he noticed the broken windows on the Packard. Oh, my. Did you run into some sort of trouble on the road? George laughed. Yeah, you could say that. Biddeford, William said. It wasn't a question. I'm terribly sorry, Mr. Turner. Were any of you injured? Not yet, Atticus said. Well, you needn't concern yourselves further. You're perfectly safe here. Atticus pictured the patrol car blazing in the night. I wouldn't be too quick to promise that. Oh, no, Mr. Turner, William corrected him. I do promise it. As Mr. Braithwaite's guests, you are under Mr. Braithwaite's protection. As long as you remain in Ardham, you needn't worry about anyone from Biddeford. The same guarantee of protection extends to your father, of course, while he's traveling with Mr. Braithwaite. Now please, come inside. The entrance foyer of the lodge resembled the lobby of a rustic hotel unlikely to ever be listed in the safe Negro travel guide. The dark-paneled walls were hung with dramatic nature scenes in which white people hunted, rode horses, more simply stood around looking awed by the landscape. Corridors led off into the wings, and at the back of the foyer, double doors opened onto a dining hall. To the left of these doors, a cubbyhole in the wall held ranks of keys on hooks. William stood before it, tapping a finger against his chin. While William debated room assignments, Atticus went to look at a painting hanging on the other side of the dining hall entrance. It was a portrait of a white man in robes, standing in an alchemist's laboratory. The man gripped a wooden staff with his right hand, and prominent on his right index finger, was a silver signet ring engraved with a half-sun symbol. The man's left arm, outstretched, gestured towards a window with a view of a crowded harbor. The sky above the water was starry night, but there was a pink glow on the horizon. Titus Braithwaite, Atticus said, reading the brass tag on the frame. Artem's founder, said William. Keys in hand, he joined Atticus in front of the portrait. The Braithwaites made their fortune in shipping, but Titus Braithwaite had a keen interest in natural philosophy. Science. Some of his more esoteric studies made his Boston neighbors uncomfortable, so he established Ardham, 
and built the lodge as a retreat where he and his fellow philosophers could conduct their experiments in private. Seems like a strange choice of location, Attica said, given how the people of Biddeford felt about witches. William chuckled politely. Titus Braithwaite wasn't a witch, Mr. Turner. You don't need to be a witch to hang as one, though, do you? No, that's true, sir. But Titus Braithwaite had an understanding with the community leaders in Biddeford. Through his wealth and his political connections, he did certain favors for them. And in exchange, they helped preserve his privacy, kept away the curious. I suppose you could say he put their prejudices to good use. I wouldn't know about that, Attica said. I've never experienced prejudice as a positive thing. Of course, sir. Perhaps it was wrong of him, William conceded. And perhaps he was punished for it. In 1795, there was a terrible fire here. The lodge was destroyed, and Titus Braithwaite perished along with his associates and most of his family. The current Mr. Braithwaite is descended from a cousin who was living in Plymouth at the time of the tragedy. What does the current Mr. Braithwaite do? Is he still in shipping? His interests are quite diversified. And what's his interest in me and my family, William, if you don't mind my asking? I don't know, sir. And it wouldn't be my place to say in any event. I keep Mr. Braithwaite's house, not his business. You sure? Atticus nodded towards the portrait. You seem to know a lot about the family business. Just the history, Mr. Turner. Think of me as a tour guide. A humble one. May I show you to your rooms now? Stairs to the second floor were located just inside the west wing corridor. A window on the half landing let in light from outdoors, but as in the foyer, there were also electric wall sconces and ceiling lamps. How is it you have power out here? Atticus asked. There's a generator shed out back, behind the car garage, William said. When Mr. Braithwaite had the lodge rebuilt in the 1920s, he added a number of modern improvements. You'll have the full range of creature comforts during your stay, including hot running water. At the top of the stairs, they turned right. The center section of the lodge on this floor contained a gaming lounge, a library, and a smoking room. William gave them a brief tour of the amenities, stressing that they were welcome to use any and all of them, the one exception being that the smoking room was traditionally for men only. So much for no positive prejudice, Letitia muttered. What's on the third floor? Atticus asked. That would be Mr. Braithwaite's private suite, William said. I'm sure he'll be delighted to show it to you once he returns. In the meantime, he continued, leading them onward, I'll be putting you in the east wing. It's quieter than the west wing, and you'll have it all to yourselves, so Mr. Braithwaite's other guests shouldn't disturb you. You have other people staying here? Not yet, sir. But Mr. Braithwaite has called a gathering of the other lodge members. I expect them to begin arriving shortly. You expect them, Atticus said. But you don't actually know what the gathering is about. You catch on quickly, Mr. Turner. William led them down the east wing corridor, stopping at the third door on the right. This will be your room, Mr. Turner, he said, fitting a key in the lock. It forms a double suite with the one next door, where we'll put Mr. Barry. As he came through the door, Atticus' eye first went to the king-size bed, its massive headboard carved with yet another scene of white people doing things outdoors. Against the right-hand wall was a wardrobe, itself large enough to have contained a fold-down bed. The left side of the room was arranged as a sitting area, with wing-back chairs, a fireplace, a mini-bar and a glass cabinet, and a writing desk that faced a wide and many-paned window. Cozy, Attica said. Coming farther into the room and turning around, he discovered the bookcases that lined the walls beside the doorway. William walked around the bed to another door, next to the wardrobe. Your bathroom is in here, Mr. Turner. There's a full selection of toiletries, but should you need anything you don't see, please don't hesitate to ask. Also, I don't know what clothes you've brought, but if you'd like to dress for dinner, you'll find some spare suits in here. He indicated the wardrobe. Dinner is served in the downstairs hall at 8 p.m., he continued, coming back around to the sitting area. Lunch is at one, and breakfast is available from six to nine, but you can also have food brought to your room at any time, day or night. He touched the handset of an antique phone on the writing desk. Just dial zero, and you'll be connected with a member of the staff. What if I want to make an outgoing call? I'm sorry, sir. I'm afraid it's an internal line only. 
Mr. Braithwaite had hoped to have real phone service at the lodge, but it proved impossible for bureaucratic as well as technical reasons. Unfortunately, his relationship with the rest of Devon County isn't nearly as cordial as the original Mr. Braithwaite's. I sympathize, Atticus said. He paused to look out the window. Speaking of community relations, who are those people living down in the cottages? Simple folk, William replied. Simple? You mean like Amish? After a fashion. The Artemite sect is a good deal older than the Mennonites, however. And they live here year-round? Yes, sir. Artem is their refuge from the world. In lieu of rent, they provide services and upkeep for the lodge. Most of the food you'll be eating here comes from the village. So they keep Mr. Braithwaite fed, and in return, he keeps them safe. Exactly, sir. What about electricity and hot running water? Atticus said. They get those, too? As I say, they're simple folk. They aren't interested in such things. William turned to George. Mr. Barry, your room is right through here. Let me show you. After William and George had gone through the connecting door, Letitia said, Come take a look at this. Atticus joined her by one of the bookcases. What is it? Just look. Huh, said Atticus. Mr. Burroughs. The top shelf was filled with Tarzan novels, and the one below it had the complete run of John Carter books, along with Carson Napier of Venus and the Pellucidar series. The other shelves held more authors and titles he knew, some seeming wildly out of place in these surroundings. They got all your favorites, huh? Letitia said. A lot of them, yeah. And a lot of books I always meant to read. Don't get comfortable, Letitia suggested. I'm way ahead of you. Atticus said, crouching down. The lowest shelf was Lovecraft Country. Algernon Blackwood, Robert Block, August Derleth, William Hope Hodgson, Frank Belknap Long, Clark Ashton Smith, and the man himself. Finger walking over the book spines, Atticus stopped at a red leather bound volume that stuck out conspicuously from between the house on the borderlands and beyond the wall of sleep. The cover of the red book was embossed with a half-sun symbol and the words, Bylaws and Precepts of the Adamite Order of the Ancient Dawn. Atticus showed it to Letitia, and then, hearing William and George returning, slipped it back into the shelf and stood up. Miss Dandridge, William said, your room is across the hall. If you'll follow me. They went out. Atticus looked at George. You have your own library, too? He asked. Yeah, George said. I get my meals brought up. I could stay in there for a month and not mind. Atticus nodded. I wonder if that's the idea. Nice of him to give us our own wing, isn't it? Very. You see any other stairs besides the ones we came up? No, not in this hallway. Let's hope they don't have another fire, George said. Across the hall, Letitia let out a shriek. Atticus and George bolted towards the sound. They found Letitia and William in the suite's bathroom. Letitia was standing with her hands clasped in front of her at the edge of what Atticus thought, at first glance, was a hole in the floor. A sunken tub, done all in black marble, large enough that the four of them could have sat in it without touching. Would you look at that, George said over Atticus's shoulder. Tisha's got her own pool. A few moments later, in the hall, I'll have your luggage brought up now, Mr. Turner. I don't know if our mechanic will be able to do anything about the broken windows on your car, but I'll see that it's parked out of the weather. Thank you, Atticus said. William? Yes, sir? When did Mr. Braithwaite say he and my father would be back from Boston? He wasn't sure. Perhaps this evening, though it could be as late as tomorrow. Smiling. But I'm sure we can keep you occupied in the meantime. In addition to the diversions you've already seen, there are music and exercise rooms on the ground floor, and some other entertainments I can show you. Of course, you're welcome to go for a walk around the grounds or down in the village, or if you'd like to go farther afield, into the wood or up into the hills, I can arrange a guide so you don't lose your way. No, that's okay. I don't think we'll wander too far. Very good, sir. Then if there's nothing else at the moment, just one thing, Atticus said. Yes, sir? When my father was here, which of these rooms did you put him in? The briefest hesitation. That one, sir, 
William pointed to a door to the right of Letitia's room. Atticus tried the knob. Locked. Of course, sir. I could get the key from downstairs if you'd like, but there's nothing to see. Your father took all his effects with him to Boston, and the room's been cleaned. A pause. Would you like me to get the key, Mr. Turner? No, that's all right, Atticus said. Turning from the door, he matched William's smile with his own. I trust you. Atticus and George sat out front of the lodge on one of the benches, watching a peacock strut around the base of the sundial. Tired as Braithwaite, George said after a long silence. That name means something to you? You had a look on your face when you were staring at his picture. Did I? said Atticus. He leaned back against the bench. Titus Braithwaite owned my mother's great-great-great-grandmother. I thought Dora didn't know where her people came from. She didn't know much, just that her great ancestor was a woman named Hannah, who belonged to Titus Braithwaite, a slave trader from Boston. Hannah was a maid at Braithwaite's country estate until the night she ran away. Through those woods? Brave woman. Brave, yeah, but also scared out of her mind, Atticus said. There was some kind of calamity in the house, and Hannah barely escaped with her life. The fire? George said. Probably, although it was part of the story Mom told, that Hannah would never tell anyone exactly what happened, only that it was something so terrible she had to run. Anyway, she got away and made a new life for herself as a free woman, but she went the rest of her days in fear that Braithwaite or his family would track her down. George tried to put the next question delicately. When she ran, he said, Was she with child? I asked Mom that one, too. She said I was missing the point of the story, which was, Don't look back, and never trust anyone named Braithwaite. I take it she didn't tell Montrose. No, and she made me promise not to tell him either but I guess he finally found a clue somewhere. Or maybe one found him. Letitia came out of the lodge, fresh from the bath, and dressed in a violet gown that would not have looked out of place at Cinderella's ball. Good Lord, George said. You like it? Laughing with pleasure, Letitia did a twirl for them, sequins flaring in the morning sun that had broken through the mist. It's beautiful, Atticus said. But you didn't pack that in your little suitcase, did you? No, silly. I found it in my room. And a dozen more like it. Didn't you check your wardrobes? You found it, George said. And it fits? Like it was made for me? She did another twirl. Atticus stood up. I think we should take a walk down to the village. Really? said George. I was just thinking we should barricade ourselves in our rooms until Montrose gets back. I wouldn't hold my breath on Pop coming back. I think we need to go look for him. You think he's in the village? I don't think he's in Boston with Mr. Braithwaite. Let's put it that way. If they're keeping him someplace, isn't it more likely he'd be up here? Depends on your assumptions. Atticus glanced up at the lodge's third floor windows, then back down at George, who was staring at him quizzically. Call it a hunch, he said. All right, said George. I'll play that. And if we do find him, we get the hell out of here and don't look back. George nodded. Sounds like a plan. It's a plan, all right, Letitia said. But you don't really think it's going to be that easy, do you? Their car had already been moved, so they followed the drive to the end of the lodge's west wing and around back to the garage, a long, narrow shed with Dutch doored stalls, like a converted horse stable, Going down the line, they found a panel truck, two dark-windowed Rolls-Roy sedans, and a vintage pearl-gray roadster. The Packard was in stall number five. Atticus retrieved the revolver from the glove compartment and checked that it was still loaded. Then he realized he had no good way to carry it. It was too big to slip in a trouser pocket without being conspicuous. I need to go back upstairs and get a jacket, he said. But Letitia held out a hand. Give it here. She made Atticus and George look away while she hid the gun, somehow, in the folds of her gown. When she was done, she did another twirl for them, showing off. We get out of this, Atticus said to her. You're going to have to tell me some of those stories. They returned to the front of the lodge, 
and found a footpath leading down to the Artem Church. Descending, they encountered a group of villagers coming up, a man Atticus recognized as the goat herd, carrying a freshly skinned and dressed carcass over his shoulders, a woman holding a pair of plucked chickens and a basket of eggs, and two more men lugging sacks of root vegetables and other produce. Despite their burdens, they gave Atticus, George, and Letitia the right of way, stepping off the path and bowing their heads as the fishermen had done. Morning, said Atticus in passing, but none of the Ardemites responded or even met his eye. The church and the other village buildings were arranged in a rough square at the end of the cottage road. Across from the church was a workshop, in front of which a man sat using a foot-operated grindstone to sharpen the blade of a scythe. The workman glanced up as Atticus and the others reached the bottom of the path, but quickly refocused his attention on his task. The mastiff chained up beside him was less circumspect. Upon noticing the strangers, it jumped down from the workshop porch and would have kept coming if not for the chain. George eyed the dog warily. So where do you want to look first, he said. Before he finished asking the question, Letitia had the church door open. Guess we start right here, said Atticus. The church's interior was one large room. An entry alcove, with a rope pull hanging down from the steeple above, opened out into a nave, whose rude wooden pews offered seating for about forty people. Tall, narrow windows in the sides of the nave let in light through frosted glass, and an oil lamp with a rose-glass vessel hung above the center aisle, its feeble flicker like the glow of a dying star. At the front of the nave, the room narrowed again, the raised platform at the chancel holding neither altar nor pulpit, but only a wooden lectern on which a big book rested. On the wall above the lectern, a stained glass window that was the church's only real decoration showed a scene from the Garden of Eden. Atticus had started forward to get a better look when Letitia, a few steps ahead of him, let out a gasp and put a hand to her mouth, then laughed through her fingers. In the window, Adam and Eve embraced beneath a pink half-sun, a rising sun of ancient dawn. The scene, though familiar, was missing a few elements. The devil serpent was absent, and though the garden's trees and shrubs were brightly colored by the dawn light, there was no forbidden fruit, Eve's hands being otherwise occupied. And there were no fig leaves. Atticus stared, mouth open, never having encountered stained glass pornography before. Well, said George, they aren't Baptists. No, said Atticus, they're Adamites, whatever that is. He went up to the lectern to see what kind of Bible it held, but his curiosity was frustrated. The big book was sealed with a hasp lock and chained to the lectern for good measure. They went back outside. The workman had gone into the shop and was hammering away at something, but the mastiff was still straining at the end of its chain. They continued to explore, their attention focusing next on a stone and mortar construction to the west of the church. The building was round, about ten feet high, and thirty feet wide at its base, tapering slightly towards the top. High up on one side, they could see the rusted remnants of an iron grill that at one time had covered a window, but the opening had been mortared shut. The iron-banded door was locked, and so solid that when Atticus pounded his fist against it, it barely made a sound. What do you think? he said, looking at George and Letitia. Too obvious? Can I help you folks? The woman had flowing red hair and pale skin, and Atticus first thought was that she must be related to William. The second was that she looked a lot like the stained glass Eve, only with clothes on, a long-sleeved cotton blouse, denim pants and leather boots, a ring of keys in various sizes jangled against her hip as she came towards them. Morning, Atticus greeted her, smiling. My name's Atticus. This is George and Letitia. We're staying up at the manor. Figured as much, the woman said. She smiled, too, but there was a hint of mockery to it. I'm Dell. You the law around here, Dell? She cocked her head at the question. Atticus pointed to her key ring and nodded at the stone building. This is the jail, right? The jail? Dell snorted. Stepping past him, she took the ring from her belt and used the largest of the keys to unlock the door. She hauled it open with both hands, 
then stood gesturing for Atticus to go in. Mind the first step. He had to duck his head to get through the doorway, and there was a drop. The stone floor, a good eight inches below the threshold. The interior was cool and dry, and full of smells, savory and sweet. As his eyes adjusted, a severed limb appeared in front of him. A deer leg, dangling by a chain from a wooden beam. Other chains held other big pieces of meat, dried or smoked, some intact, some with large portions carved off. Moving away from the door, Atticus examined the bends along the walls, his nose often revealing the contents before his eyes did. He heard a pattering behind him. Letitia and George had come inside, too, and Letitia was stabbing her feet, checking for a cellar. But the floor seemed solid, and Atticus saw no trap doors. Animals, Dell said from the doorway. What's that? said Atticus. We get animals coming into the village, looking for food, raccoons, foxes, bears now and then. Bears will come right through a cottage door if they're hungry enough, but they can't get in here. We heard there were grizzlies out in the woods, Atticus said. Grizzlies? Dale snorted again. No, no grizzlies, just black bears, she said, adding lightly. But the blacks are bad enough. They're smart. Not smart, smart. They're beasts, but clever enough to cause mischief. And they're persistent. We use dogs to drive them off, but sometimes they won't quit, even after they've been hurt. Those ones do end up in here, after a fashion. She nodded at one of the haunches of meat. While Atticus and the others contemplated the fate of the bear, Dell stepped back from the threshold and put a hand on the door. For an instant, it seemed that she meant to shut them in, but she was only giving them room to come out. Ready to move along, she said. Dale escorted them to the sloping apple orchard west of the village, where they collected another silent bow from the beekeeper, who tended the hives there. Dale described her own job in Artem as that of village warden, a managerial role that included acting as liaison to the manor. She laughed at Atticus's suggestion that she and William were related. I'm not high and mighty enough to be in his family, she said. Atticus wanted to ask about the church and Dell's role in that, but struck again by her resemblance to the stained-glass Eve, he found himself unable to broach the subject, and she didn't volunteer anything herself. From the orchard, they went down to the river, where they startled the fishermen, then circled back to the village square. Atticus wanted to investigate the cottages as well, but didn't want a chaperone, so he thanked Dell for the tour and made as if to go back up the footpath. Dell headed for the workshop, where the workman was still hammering noisily on something. As soon as she went inside, Atticus changed course, leading George and Letitia towards the cottage road. They didn't get very far. The Mastiff noticed their course correction and set up a furious barking. Atticus walked faster and didn't look back. But then a pack of other dogs appeared ahead of them, running up from behind the nearest of the cottages. There were four of them. Two medium-sized mongrels, a rat terrier, and an extra-large beast that looked like a cross between a wolfhound and a Great Dane. They didn't attack. They moved into the middle of the road and waited there, panting, to see if Atticus and George and Letitia would come closer. The Mastiff stopped barking, and Atticus looked over his shoulder. Dell had come back out on the workshop porch and was standing with her arms crossed, her lips curved in an openly contemptuous smile. Not smart, smart, he heard her say. We use dogs to drive them off. Yeah, Atticus said. Okay. They went back up the hill. The dogs lost interest in them as soon as they turned back to the footpath, but looking down from the crest, they could see the wolfhound Dane Mix and one of the other mongrels wandering along the cottage road like sharks patrolling the shore of an island. So what do you think? said Atticus. The workshop's got a stone foundation, Letitia noted. It's the only building other than that storehouse that did. You think there's a cellar? She nodded. And with that hammering? Someone could be down there yelling and you wouldn't hear it. Atticus looked at George, who shrugged a shoulder. If Montrose doesn't show by tonight, we could sneak back down after dinner, he suggested. Maybe bring some chops for those dogs. Maybe, said Atticus, thinking of the two shotguns still in the Packard, but thinking also of a night patrol through a village outside Pyongyang, a supposedly straightforward search and rescue mission that ended with four Negro soldiers dead. 
Maybe we need to come at this another way. What do you have in mind? Not sure yet. I'm still thinking it through. Well, if we go back inside, George suggested, we can think it through over some room service. Sure, Atticus said. Maybe I'll do some reading, too. Braithwaite's other guests began arriving in mid-afternoon. Atticus, upstairs studying the bylaws of the Adamite Order of the Ancient Dawn, took a census of the lodge membership from his window. Fourteen Caucasian men, ranging in age from fifty to at least seventy. They drove or were driven in expensive cars and limousines. Half of the vehicles had Massachusetts license plates, and the rest were from neighboring states, except for one late-arriving limo from the District of Columbia. All of the lodge members wore fat silver signet rings that marked them as initiates of the order. Initiates. The Red Book referred to them as dawn seekers, sons of Adam and Antonauts, sojourners to the time before, as in before the fall. Though the Antonauts fall, like the Artemites' Eden, was different from the one Atticus had learned about in Sunday school, the book didn't use the word wizards, but it was clear they were that too, or wished to be. Observing each man in turn, Atticus tried to deduce which, if any of them, had real magic powers. But evidently sorcerers, like communists, were hard to identify by sight. At quarter past seven, not long after the last of Adam's sons had been ushered into the lodge, the phone rang. It was William, calling to see whether Atticus and his companions would be having dinner in the hall. We planned to, Atticus told him. Is there a problem? None at all, Mr. Turner, William said. Why don't you make yourselves ready, and I'll be up to collect you at eight o'clock. From his wardrobe, Atticus selected a finely tailored black suit. It fit him perfectly, as did the shoes. George opted for a tux, and Letitia answered the knock on her door, wearing an elegant white evening dress. Earlier, Letitia had announced her intention to smuggle the purple Cinderella gown out to the Packard, along with some other choice items from her wardrobe. If we do end up making a run for it, she'd said, I don't see why some of these nice clothes can't come with us. But from the expression on her face now, Atticus guessed the plan had encountered a snag. What happened? he asked. William catch you sneaking out the back door? No. I got the dresses out to the car just fine, Letitia said. But there's a problem. Before she could elaborate, William appeared at the end of the hallway. Good evening, Mr. Turner, Mr. Barry, he said. Miss Dandridge, you look lovely. I hope you're enjoying your stay so far. It's been an interesting day, Atticus said. But you know, you didn't really have to come get us. We could have found our own way downstairs. I understand, sir. But if I may speak frankly, I'm afraid some of the lodge members can be a bit brusque with strangers. Until you've been formally introduced, I thought it might be best if I escorted you. You don't want them mistaking us for staff, is that it? William smiled his smile. Your table is waiting for you, Mr. Turner. The sons of Adam were all gathered downstairs in the foyer. Servants were circulating with trays of drinks and hors d'oeuvres, but some of the older lodge members were grumbling about the fact that they hadn't already been seated in the dining hall. The Antonaut from D.C., a doddering senior, whom Atticus had nicknamed Preston Brooks for the way he brandished his cane, was proclaiming loudly to the room that he, at least, should not be kept standing around like some houseboy. Then Atticus entered the room, and everyone got quiet. Unlike the villagers, the members of the lodge had no compunction about staring. Most of the stairs were just curious, albeit to a degree that was rude, but Preston managed a triple take. His initial curiosity, giving way at the sight of George and Letitia, to confusion and then outraged bafflement. Three, he bellowed, hoisting his cane into the air. Why are there three? This way, Mr. Turner, William said simultaneously pretending not to see Preston and moving to shield Atticus from him. Letitia gave Preston a little wave as they breezed by him into the dining hall. William led them to a table beneath a red and silver banner bearing the half-sun symbol. The table's position at the center of the hall and the zone of separation around it suggested a place of honor, or perhaps that they were being put on display. Two waiting servants pulled out chairs for George and Letitia while William seated Atticus himself. The servants poured water and wine, and more servants brought a soup course from the kitchen. Meanwhile, the sons of Adam were led inside. 
They were seated in groups of two and three, except for Preston, who got a whole table to himself. A number of the lodge members continued staring at Atticus until Letitia started making faces at them. After that, they focused on the soup. The young man showed up during the salad course. He was white, in his early twenties, with brown hair and a sharp-looking suit almost identical to the one Atticus was wearing. He made his way discreetly to the only remaining empty table, over in the corner near the kitchen entrance. The Antonauts paid scant attention to him, but the servants were a different story. Within moments of sitting down, he had both food and drink in front of him. The main course arrived. If you're hungry, Atticus suggested, you should eat up now. Why? said George. You planning on skipping out before dessert? I was thinking I might make a nuisance of myself, Atticus told him. We'll see what develops from there. Most of the other diners were still finishing their salads. Atticus waited until a group of Antonauts, Preston among them, were about to be served their main courses. Then he stood up. Excuse me, he called out, striking a spoon against his water glass. Excuse me, can I have everyone's attention? Instantly, all eyes were upon him. Most of the Antonauts remained curious, but a few were visibly annoyed by the interruption of the meal service. Preston reached for his cane. Atticus addressed the room. My name is Atticus Turner, he said. Like you, I'm here as a guest of Mr. Braithwaite, but I'm afraid I'm still in the dark as to why. I came to Ardham looking for my father. I haven't found him yet, and I don't know what Mr. Braithwaite wanted with him, and I don't know what Mr. Braithwaite wants with me. He paused and looked around at their upturned faces to see if anyone cared to volunteer the information. But they only went on staring and scowling. I don't know what Mr. Braithwaite wants with me, Atticus continued, but I do have a theory, and I was hoping you gentlemen wouldn't mind helping me test that theory. I understand you all belong to a club called the Order of the Ancient Dawn. I happened across a copy of your bylaws this morning, and I've been looking through it. He drew out the red book from inside his suit jacket and held it up. I hope that's not a breach of security, he added, acknowledging the looks of consternation this caused. I know fraternal societies like to keep secrets. I've got some experience with that. My father and my Uncle George here, they're both members of the Prince Hall Freemasons, and there are certain things they just won't talk about. You gentlemen familiar with the Prince Hall Freemasons? I know you've heard of the Masons, but Prince Hall, this might interest you, Prince Hall was an abolitionist who lived in Boston at the time of the Revolution. He joined the Massachusetts militia to help fight for independence, and he wanted to join the local Freemasons. But because he was a colored man, they wouldn't let him in. So he and a group of other freedmen formed their own Masonic Lodge. I have to say, I was disappointed to read in your rule book that Prince Hall wouldn't have been welcome to join your club either. Not surprised, he added, looking at Preston. But disappointed. But then I kept reading, and I found out there's a loophole, a membership clause that supersedes all the others. Men who are related by blood to Titus Braithwaite are automatically considered members of the order. Not just eligible for membership. They're members. Period. Don't even need to apply. Of course, by blood is a vexed phrase, and there's something like ten paragraphs in the bylaws spelling out who does and doesn't count as a blood relation. But the way I read it, a direct descendant of Titus Braithwaite would certainly qualify, assuming there was such a person. And there's more. Braithwaite members of the order are special members. How does the book put it? Not just sons of Adam, but sons among sons. Atticus glanced up at the banner over his head. Sons among sons. That's a nice play on words. But what it means is, Braithwaites are club officers. They're empowered to call lodge meetings and to give orders to other members. Orders that must be obeyed. Which brings me back to my theory, Atticus said. I think the reason I'm here has something to do with the fact that I'm a direct descendant of Titus Braithwaite, and maybe not just a descendant, but the last one. I'm not a hundred percent sure that's the case. It's a hypothesis, but I think you gentlemen know the truth of it, and I believe that's why you're here. Now, if it is true, I could just order you to tell me, and by your own rules, you'd be bound to. I could do that. But the fact is, 
I've traveled a long way in the past few days, and I'm tired. And at this point, I'd rather be talking direct to Mr. Braithwaite. So what I'm actually going to do is this. As a son among sons, I'm going to have you all stand up, right now, and walk out of this room. Leave your glasses and your plates where they are. Just take yourselves. Go out that door and through the foyer and outside onto the front lawn. You can use the benches if you like. But you stay out there until either I or Mr. Braithwaite tell you it is okay to come back inside. Gentlemen, Atticus concluded, that is an order. Silence as he finished. Preston had his cane in a death grip and looked as if he himself were being strangled. Nor was he the only Antonaut exhibiting signs of abject fury. As the moment stretched out, Atticus had time to wonder whether he'd guessed wrong, and he felt George and Letitia tense, waiting for the mob to erupt. Then a chair scraped, and Atticus turned to see a red-faced son of Adam getting slowly to his feet. The man gave a curt bow and turned and started for the door. The other two lodge members at that table were the next to rise, and then two at a table next to them. And then they were all standing, even Preston, though he didn't bow. As the Antonauts went out to the foyer, the servants began their own exodus through the kitchen. William lingered to close the doors behind the departing lodge members before following the rest of the staff, which left Atticus, George, Letitia, and the young man at the back corner table, who alone among the white people had thoroughly enjoyed Atticus's performance. As Atticus walked over to him, he applauded, holding up his hands to display his silver ring. I know you already know this, the young Antonaut said, but the bylaws actually state that the son among sons is the oldest Braithwaite present, which in this case happens to be me. I've got a year and ten days on you. He grinned. Not that those other idiots know that, and not even that old fart Pendergast will risk breaking the rules. Just as well. He'd probably smash the jaw of any ordinary Negro who talked to him that way. He might try, said Atticus. Braithwaite's grin broadened. It's Caleb, by the way, he said. Would you like to sit down, Atticus? He gave a nod, and a chair on Atticus's side of the table slid out on its own. Atticus blinked, but didn't flinch. He remained standing, placing a hand on the chair back. Caleb, Atticus said, and Samuel Braithwaite? That'd be your father. That's right. But it was you driving the Daimler, right? And you're the one who picked up my father in Chicago. That was me, Caleb agreed. My father's not much for long road trips. Why bring my father into it? Atticus asked. I'm the one you really want, right? The one your father wants for whatever. Why not just come get me? Because there are rules, Caleb Braithwaite said. You had to come of your own free will. And if I'd asked you, you might have said no. Would have said no, is my guess. But we can't refuse our fathers, can we? Where is my father? Safe. And he'll stay that way, as long as you do what you're told. I want to see him. I'm sure you do. Braithwaite paused, mouth open, as George and Letitia came and stood beside Atticus. Now, now, said Braithwaite. George let out a grunt and dropped the steak knife he was holding. As the blade clattered to the floor, Braithwaite shifted his gaze to Letitia, who was poised with her hands open at her sides. I want to see my father, Atticus said. Now. Braithwaite continued to eyeball Letitia. Mine first, he said. There was a service elevator in the kitchen. Family only, Caleb Braithwaite said as he pulled open the gate. It's all right, Atticus told George and Letitia. Wait down here for me. You two should finish dinner, Caleb said. He looked over at William, who was hovering in the background. Take care of them, will you? And send someone down to the village to fetch Delilah. Yes, sir. The elevator rose slowly. Caleb Braithwaite used the time to share another rule. My father isn't a tactful man, he said. He may say things that make you want to hit him, but I'd advise you not to waste the effort. He's immune. To being hit, Atticus said. To a long list of things. Maybe I'll just hit you then. Caleb smiled. 
You might try, he said. On the third floor, the elevator opened into a small private dining room. A table with a single chair at its head held the remains of a meal. There was a painting on the wall opposite the elevator. More abstract than the portrait downstairs, it showed a crowned figure in robes standing beneath a pink sky. This kingly figure had a hand outstretched towards a line of shadow shapes issuing from a stand of trees. Those closest to the trees were little more than dark blobs, but those nearer to the king had begun to sprout limbs and heads and tails, though even the one at the king's feet was not quite recognizable. A dog, maybe. Father, Caleb Braithwaite called, standing by one of the room's two doorways. In the distance, there was a loud slam and a rattle of something falling. Then silence for a bit, and finally, approaching footsteps. Samuel Braithwaite didn't look like a wizard or a king. He looked like a banker after hours, or maybe an inventor in the Edison mold. He had his shirt sleeves rolled up and his collar unbuttoned, and he was wiping his hands with a rag as he came in. He seemed neither surprised nor especially pleased to find Atticus in his dining room, but as though determined to make the best of the intrusion, he spent several moments looking Atticus up and down. He's darker than I expected, Samuel Braithwaite said finally. Are you sure he's the right one? Caleb nodded. It's him. My guests are all out on the lawn. Yes, sir, that William called up and told me what happened. How did he get a copy of the bylaws? I don't know, sir, Caleb said. He's had the run of the house all day. I suppose he just found it. Hmm. Braithwaite regarded his son through narrowed eyes. And when you saw what was happening downstairs, why didn't you put a stop to it? I never mind. I know why. Braithwaite sighed. So, it's Turner, is it? Mr. Turner to you, said Atticus. Do you have any idea the bother you've just caused me? The sons of Adam are insufferable enough under the best of circumstances. Now I've got to meet with them when they haven't had their supper. Sorry to inconvenience you. You don't know the meaning of sorry. Yet, Braithwaite gave his hands a final wipe and tossed the rag on the table. So, Mr. Turner, you want to know what you're doing here? Atticus nodded. I guess it's not to share the family fortune. No, Samuel Braithwaite said. You are the family fortune. Come again? Rather than repeat himself, Braithwaite gestured at the painting on the wall. What do you think of this artwork, Mr. Turner? Atticus shrugged. Not really my thing, he said. The artist's name was Joseph Tannhauser. He was a contemporary of Titus Braithwaite's. Not a large member, but he had similar interests. He died in a Boston asylum in 1801. This painting, one of his last, is called Genesis 219. Are you familiar with the verse? Atticus shook his head. Braithwaite quoted, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air, and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. In Tannhauser's conception, this act of naming is much more than a simple matter of picking labels. Adam is sharing in the creation, assigning each creature its final form and its station in the hierarchy of nature. Putting everything in its place, Atticus said. Exactly. At the dawn of time, just for a moment, Everything is where and as it should be, from God to man to woman down to the lowliest wriggling creature. He looked at Atticus. And then entropy sets to work as it will. Paradise is lost. Babel and the flood bring confusion and disorder. What was an elegant hierarchy becomes a mess of tribes and nations. Of course, Braithwaite added, it didn't really happen that way. Biblical literalism is for the simple, but it's a useful parable. About entropy, Atticus said. Entropy in history and social evolution or devolution. The Red Book had had a lot to say on those subjects. And that's where you come in, right? 
You and your order, you're going to turn things around. Find a way back to the garden. With magic. Braithwaite pursed his lips. That's a vulgar word, he said, looking pointedly at Atticus. A simple man's word. We're not magicians. We're scientists. Philosophers of nature. Nature, he repeated, rapping his knuckles on the dining table. Nature is solid. Nature has rules. People who go on about magic believe that anything is possible. It isn't. You don't just wave a wand and turn lead into gold. It doesn't work that way. How does it work then? For the majority, it doesn't work at all. Nature holds itself impervious to the wishings of would-be sorcerers, but he reached for the table again and ran his hand slowly over the wood grain. There are cracks. Not exceptions to the rules, you understand. There's no such thing. But special cases, natural anomalies that can be discovered and exploited by men of sufficient vision. Even then, there are strict limits on what's possible. A token wonder here and there is all most seekers can hope for. Only the most extraordinary of natural philosophers can move beyond that to truly great works. Men such as yourself. Braithwaite, sensing he was being mocked, grew testy. My full potential has yet to be demonstrated, he said. But I'm already more powerful than any other living initiate. You do well to keep that in mind. What about Titus Braithwaite? He was one of a kind. A genius of the art. Yeah, said Atticus. And how'd that work out for him, in the end? Badly, Braithwaite acknowledged. It's perilous work to challenge entropy, and genius is no guarantee against accidents. Titus Braithwaite understood the risks. He chose to push on, regardless, and burn the house down. Fire was part of it, Samuel Braithwaite said. We still don't know precisely what happened that night. An Artemite villager named Tobias Foot, who was long believed to be the only survivor of the catastrophe, said that before it imploded, the large blaze with every color in nature, and some outside it, the sight drove Foot mad. He ended up in the same asylum as Josef Tannhauser and died within a year. I have the diary kept before he passed. It's gibberish for the most part, but among the ravings are hints of the existence of a second survivor, a dark woman who fled into the wood just as the house began to glow. But that discovery came much later. At the time, it was an unmitigated disaster. All the best minds in the order perished. The handful of lodge members who weren't present for the ritual were all second-rate hangers-on, and in the wake of the catastrophe, they scattered. A huge body of esoteric knowledge was lost, and the work the order had been undertaking came to a dead stop. It wasn't until the beginning of this century that my father rediscovered some of that lost knowledge and began putting the pieces of the order back together again. We've made great strides since then, had some extraordinary successes, and we're ready now, we think, to take up the great work that was interrupted in 1795. But the world hasn't stood still either. When the Order of the Ancient Dawn was first founded, the Age of Kings was only just giving way to the Age of the Common Man, and Titus Braithwaite's horror at that prospect was part of what drove him to take the chances he did. I can only imagine his horror today, after a hundred and eighty years of the Common Man, and all of that is nothing compared to what's coming in the next few decades. So you see, we need to act quickly. We're running out of time. Well, that's all very important sounding, Atticus said, but I don't see what it has to do with me. Adam's sons, Mr. Turner, Samuel Braithwaite said. Adam's sons. The power of the true philosopher is carried in the blood. And Titus Braithwaite, a son among sons, was a very powerful man. You are a reservoir of that power, diluted, no doubt, and also tainted somewhat, but still useful for the work we have to do. 
The Order of the Ancient Dawn requires you. Atticus looked from Braithwaite to his son, searching their faces for some sign that this was all a big put-on, a rich man's elaborate joke. The truly funny thing was, he wasn't the least surprised. While reading the Red Book, he'd imagined something very much like this. It was just that it sounded so much more ridiculous spoken aloud. You require me, Atticus said, to be your magic negro. But Braithwaite didn't see the humor of it. I don't think you've grasped your situation, he said. I can understand why you might be confused. The problem is you're two very different things at once. On the one hand, you're the avatar of Titus Braithwaite, the closest thing to him still walking on this earth. It's out of respect for that that I've treated you the way I have, inviting you to my house instead of having you dragged here, keeping you not just safe, but comfortable, welcoming you, feeding you, clothing you. All that for Titus Braithwaite. But at the same time, yes, your Turner, the Negro, and that I have no particular respect for. I'll tolerate it, in my house, even in my presence, for the sake of the other. But my tolerance isn't infinite. And you're already testing the limits. Immune, Atticus thought, hands itching to turn into fists. Be interesting to test the limits of that. But he hadn't forgotten why he was here, and didn't step to. I want to see my father. If I let you see him. Will you stop bothering my other guests? Will you behave? I'll leave your guests alone, Atticus said, as long as they do the same for me. Braithwaite pursed his lips again. But if the old man's exasperation was plain, so was his desire to end this conversation. Take care of it, he told his son, and see that he doesn't cause any more trouble. Yes, sir, Caleb Braithwaite said. Tell William I'm ready for the meeting. Have him fetch the others from the lawn and send them up here. Yes, sir. As for him, Braithwaite Sr. said, nodding at Atticus, we'll need him for the ritual tomorrow. Until then, I don't want to see him again or get any more calls from William about his antics. Is that absolutely understood? Yes, sir, Caleb said for a third time. Then he bowed like a villager his face fixed in an expression of solemn respect. It wasn't until he and Atticus were back on the elevator, headed down, that he allowed his amusement to show. Dell will take you to see your father, Caleb Braithwaite said to Atticus. They were in the foyer with George, Letitia, Dell, William, and a couple of other house servants, large men, whose presence seemed intended to ensure that no one acted up. The Antonauts? had already gone upstairs. Through the open dining hall doors, Atticus could see other servants clearing the tables. You'll stay here, Caleb told George and Letitia. William's going to take you back up to your rooms. Smiling at Letitia, unless you'd like to have dessert with me. Thanks, I'll pass, Letitia replied. To Atticus, she said, we'll be waiting for you. Atticus nodded, and Caleb Braithwaite said, you do understand. If there's any more trouble, there'll be consequences. Yeah, I got the message, Atticus said. He turned to Dell. Let's go. They descended the hill in the summer twilight. The villagers had already retired for the evening. Atticus could see lamps and candles burning in the cottages, and more lamps strung along the bridge to the east. The village square was deserted and dark, except for the workshop. It's me. Dell called as she stepped onto the workshop porch. The mastiff, unchained, met her at the door. She grabbed it roughly by the scruff and shoved it aside, and it backed up into the corner by the door and settled on its haunches. But it remained alert, tracking Atticus's every move and growling low in its throat. The workman sat in the center of the shop on a stool tilted back against a post. On the work table beside him was the newly sharpened scythe, a tall mug, filled with something frothy, and a collection of small stones, like checkers, arranged on a grid, incised into the table's surface. Any problems? Dell asked him, and he shook his head, 
allowing himself a long look at Atticus. The trap door was concealed beneath a trunk in a back corner of the shop. Dell got it open, revealing a steep set of wooden stairs descending into darkness. Atticus stood looking into the dark hole. You put my father down there, he said, turning his head to include the workman in the question. Dell responded without shame or embarrassment. I did what I was told. She took a lantern from a hook on the wall, lit it, and offered it to Atticus. You'll need this. You aren't coming down? He doesn't like me, she said. And he throws things. Good for him, said Atticus. He went down. The cellar, like the storehouse, was cool and dry, though there was a musty smell here. The lamplight reflected off long rows of jars and wooden shelves, preserves of some kind, and illuminated jumbles of workshop detritus, a broken-spoked wagon wheel, a wooden mallet with a splintered handle. Pop, Atticus called, and heard a sound from the far end of the cellar. Moving towards it, he began to encounter a different kind of detritus, streaks of dried gruel or porridge, a smashed apple core, bits of broken glass. Atticus thought, he throws things. A few more steps, and the lamplight fell on a rough wooden cot. A figure sat hunched on the edge of the mattress with a blanket wrapped around its shoulders. On the floor, a gleam of metal. A chain was padlocked around the figure's left ankle and secured to a ring in the wall. Pop? His father looked up red-eyed and raised a hand against the light, exposing a palm covered in old scars. Atticus drew the lamp back and held it up to illuminate his own face. It's me, Pop. He saw the recognition come into his father's eyes, followed almost immediately by another all-too-familiar expression. Disappointment, laced with disgust. Despite everything, Atticus felt a disgust of his own rising in response, like bile at the back of his throat. Really? said Atticus. Really, Pop? Twenty-two years. Montrose Turner said. Twenty-two years, you fight me on everything. And now the one time I don't want you to mind me, what happens? You want to talk about years, Pop? How many years was Mom telling you to let it go? Why couldn't you mind her? Montrose sprang to his feet, shrugging off the blanket. You want to have a discussion about your mother? He said. Step a little closer. But Atticus shook his head. I'm not here to fight with you, Pop. He looked down at the chain, then back up at his father's face. You all right? Of course I'm all right, Montrose said, still bristling. Why'd you have to come here? Because you asked me to, Atticus said. Why didn't you wait for me? After you sent me that letter. Oh. Montrose put up his hand again to fend off the question and looked away. After a moment he said, it was that boy, Caleb. He got in my head somehow. What, he hypnotized you? No, it wasn't like that. It was like, I don't know what it was like. I knew he wasn't on the level, all right? I'm not stupid, but what I kept telling myself, as long as I know he's not on the level, it's like I'm putting one over on him. I'll just play along until I get at the truth. And I needed to get at the truth. Not for me. For Dora. For you. So when he offered to let me ride back with him, I said, sure, why not? He frowned at the chain. Why not? So he brought you back with him and put you down here? No, that was the father, Montrose said. They had me up at the big house at first, for a few hours. But the charade was starting to wear thin, and the old man's not nearly as good a liar as the boy. Or maybe he just didn't care to have me under his roof. As soon as I met him, it's like the spell or whatever it was was broken. I got unruly. He smiled, thinly, but the smile didn't last. So they turned me over to the serfs, he concluded. What day is it? Atticus had to think. Monday? Night. You left home eight days ago. Eight days? That's all? I came as soon as I got your letter. Montrose shook his head. I didn't expect to see you for a month, if that. 
been praying I wouldn't see you at all. The disgust crept back into his voice. Twenty-two years. Yeah, twenty-two years, Pop. You hold that thought. Setting the lantern on the ground, Atticus turned and stalked back to the stairs. Dell was waiting above the trap door. She opened her mouth to say something, and Atticus hit her in the forehead with a mallet. Her eyes rolled up, and she dropped like a stone. Even as she fell, Atticus stepped past her to meet the onrushing mastiff, dealing it a solid blow to the skull as it leapt. The workman scrambled up next, spilling his drink as he grabbed for the scythe. Atticus dropped the mallet and got a shovel from the wall. He deflected the scythe blade with the shovel blade and caught the workman in the throat with the side of the shovel's handle. He seized the choking workman by the forelock, banged his head against the table, and half dragged, half wrestled him back to the trap door and pitched him down the stairs. The mastiff was struggling to stand, but couldn't get its legs to work together. Atticus hit it with the shovel until it stopped moving. Then he paused, listening to his own breathing and the sound of the village around him. Another dog was barking somewhere, over by the cottages, but the barking didn't come closer, and soon quieted. Atticus got Dell's key ring. He found a bolt cutter, too. The workman was lying motionless at the bottom of the stairs. Atticus stepped over him and went back to his father and gave him the keys and the bolt cutter. Then he dragged the workman away from the stairs and propped him against a shelf of preserves. He went up and got Dell in a fireman's carry and brought her down and put her next to the workman. By then, Montrose was free. He came over and held up the lantern and looked at his jailers. I get the next two, he said. You can get the next fifty, said Atticus, and you might need to if we don't get out of here soon. You have a car? Montrose asked. Atticus nodded. Woody. Woody, said Montrose. George is here too? Your family cares about you, Pop. Live with it. They went up and dumped the mastiff down the hole and closed the trap door and slid the trunk back on top of it. They blew out all the lanterns and went to the front door and stood listening again in the dark. Where's George? Montrose whispered. Bring in the car, I hope. You hope? Just wait. Atticus held up a hand. You hear that? A vehicle was approaching along the cottage road. Atticus leaned out onto the porch to see if it was the Packard coming, only to get caught in a sudden splash of high beams. It wasn't the Packard. It was the Daimler. By the time Atticus fully registered that fact, the silver car had already come to a stop in front of the workshop. Letitia poked her head out of the driver's window and called Atticus's name. You brought a girl with you? Montrose said. Let's talk about it on the road, Atticus suggested. They got into the back of the car, Atticus sitting behind Letitia, Montrose behind his brother. Montrose, George said, turning to look at him. You all right? You brought a girl with you? Montrose said. Hi, Mr. Turner, Letitia said good-naturedly, smiling into the rear view as she got the car turned around. They tried not bringing me, but the Lord Jesus and I had other ideas. Atticus looked at George. You got away all right? I think so. George held up the revolver. We put William in Tisha's bathroom, tipped the wardrobe in front of the door, yanked the phone, and locked the hall door too. One of those big guys is in there with him, so it probably won't take them long to bust out, but we got clear of the matter without anyone raising the alarm. And Woody? Had to leave it, George said sadly. It's blocked in by all those limos. Tisha noticed when she was outside earlier, but this was still parked out front. Had the keys right in it, Letitia added, her tone suggesting a gift of providence. And whether you believe that or not, Atticus supposed there were advantages to escaping in the Daimler. No villagers came out to challenge them as they drove past the cottages. The dogs didn't even bark. Yeah, said George, but I'll miss that car. Maybe when we get home, I can trade this in on a new one. How you going to do that, Montrose said. You got underworld contacts I don't know about? I might be able to help, said Letitia. She swung the car to the right to go onto the bridge. The engine died in the middle of the turn. It didn't sputter or stall. It just shut off. As the car slewed to a stop facing the bridge, Letitia reached for the ignition key, twisted it back and then forward again. Nothing happened. 
What the hell is that? said Montrose. Looking down the length of the bridge, they could see the lanterns hanging in pairs from the iron hooks. Five pairs. Now four. The furthermost pair having just winked out. A moment later, the next pair were extinguished as well, creating the impression of a wave of darkness advancing out of the wood. By the time it swallowed up the third pair of lanterns, it was clear that it was more than just an optical illusion. The dangler's high beam still functioned, and they could see the glow of the headlights extending to the center of the bridge span, and then vanishing abruptly into a void. Letitia's hand dropped away from the ignition. The darkness had stopped advancing, but seemed to gain substance as it settled onto the middle of the bridge, a blob of living shadow barring their escape. Genesis 2.19, Atticus thought numbly. Adam forgot one. Oh, hell, exclaimed Montrose. He reached forward over the seat back, grabbed the revolver from George, and shoved his door open. Pop, wait, said Atticus, thinking he meant to attack the thing on the bridge. But on exiting the car, his father went the other way. Atticus turned around in his seat and looked out the back window. Caleb Braithwaite was coming down the road from the manor. He walked slowly, not hurrying, and despite being some distance away, Atticus could see his face clearly, as if a light were shining on it. He was smiling. Atticus cursed. He got his door open and scrambled out, but as he stood, his feet became rooted to the ground, as though he'd stepped onto quick-drying cement. His father hadn't gotten much farther. Montrose was standing about five paces beyond the dangler's back end. He was leaning forward, as into a stiff wind, and his right arm was fully extended before him. He had the revolver pointed, the hammer cocked, and his finger curled around the trigger. But he didn't, or couldn't, shoot. Caleb Braithwaite just kept coming straight on, making no attempt to move out of the line of fire. Atticus reached down with both hands and tried to lift one of his paralyzed legs. He couldn't budge it. Behind him, he heard Letitia and George pounding at the inside of the Daimler's front doors. Caleb came to a stop before Montrose, stood smiling down the barrel of the revolver. Atticus prayed he would pull the gun towards him, and so snag the trigger. But when he did finally take it, he was careful, slipping his thumb between the hammer to keep it from falling and twisting the gun sideways. Then the gun was in his hand. He swung out the cylinder, checked that it was loaded, snapped it closed, recocked it. No, Atticus said. No! Caleb spared him a glance. I told you, he said. Consequences. He pointed the gun at Montrose's chest and pulled the trigger. Morning again. Atticus, sitting vigil at his father's bedside, was awakened from a doze by the crowing of a rooster down in the village. He leaned forward over the bed, confirmed that Montrose was still breathing, and then, drawing down the covers, stared at his father's chest as it rose and fell in the gray dawn light. There was no wound. Even now he had trouble accepting it. He'd seen and heard the gun go off, had seen his father crumple. Servants had come running from the lodge. Atticus, half out of his mind with rage, had fought them as best he could with his legs frozen, but was quickly overpowered. He and the others had been carried back up to the east wing and locked in the double suite. Able to move again, he'd shouted at George and Letitia to get water and towels. But when he'd torn open his father's shirt, what he had found was not the anatomical ruin he was expecting, but unbroken skin and bone, beneath which his father's heart still beat strongly. He hadn't believed it at first. He'd seen the gun go off at point-blank range, and in desperation, he rolled his father's body first one way and then the other, looking for the gunshot wound that wasn't there. No wound. No bullet hole or powder burns on the shirt either. And the only blood came from Atticus's own raw knuckles. In the midst of being manhandled, Montrose had opened his eyes and told Atticus to leave him be. He was fine, though he sounded as dismayed as his son that this should be so. He tried to sit up, and a sudden spike of pain knocked him right back down. He steeled himself and tried again, this time getting all the way to his feet before the agony of the phantom bullet in his chest caused him to pass out. Atticus caught him as he fell, got him back into bed, and started coming to terms with the double-edged miracle. His father was alive and couldn't be moved. 
Now as Atticus put the blanket back in place, his father stirred and blinked himself awake. Hey, Pop, Atticus said, speaking gently, but prepared to pin him down if he tried to rise. But Montrose had learned his lesson. He shifted position on the mattress, but remained horizontal. I was dreaming about your mother, he said. Yeah? Good dream? She didn't say I told you so, at least. Montrose turned his head carefully, looking around the room. Where's George and Letitia? In George's room, Atticus said, pointing at the connecting door. They okay? Tisha got a black eye, fighting the guy who was carrying her, and George is a little banged up too. Otherwise, they're fine. Montrose turned his head again. You try breaking that window yet? We're not leaving without you, Pop. You could at least get the girl out of here. If you think you can talk Letitia into running, I'll go wake her up right now. No, said Montrose. I guess that's not my strong point, talking people into things. He frowned at his son. You know what Braithwaite's planning to do with you? Not the particulars, said Atticus, but I can guess. Montrose nodded. He's going to summon up one of the elder clansmen, a host of Shigoths, too, probably. And you're the sacrifice. I'm glad you're feeling good enough to joke about it, Pop. Well, I'm not saying I'm happy, but I read enough of those stories of yours to know how it ends. The Grand Wizard and his minions get eaten, too, or driven mad. Usually, Atticus said, but Braithwaite didn't seem too concerned when I talked to him. Maybe he knows what he's doing. The father is a fool, Montrose said. It's the boy who's the dangerous one. You get a chance to push him into the pit, you don't hesitate. Half an hour later, not long after Montrose had slipped once more into sleep, Atticus heard a key in the hallway door. It was Caleb Braithwaite. He was alone. You here to take me upstairs? Atticus asked him, keeping his voice low. No. Braithwaite stood just inside the doorway, at ease, but seemingly reluctant to intrude. The ritual won't be for another few hours yet. My father and the other members are still debating exactly when to hold it. The timing matters? My father doesn't think so, but Pendergast and some of the others have conflicting astronomical theories that they feel very strongly about, so they're hashing it out over breakfast. Assuming they don't kill each other, I'd expect them to come for you around noon. Them, Atticus said. You aren't going to be there? No. I've been ordered off the premises until the ritual is complete. Is that to preserve the family bloodline, if things go wrong? Or do the grown-ups just not want you underfoot? A little of both, Caleb Braithwaite said. I came to say goodbye. And to apologize. He nodded at Montrose's sleeping figure. I really am sorry about this. Yeah. I saw how unhappy you looked pulling the trigger last night. I did what I had to do. I told you, save your breath on that, Atticus said. You want to do something right? Take Letitia with you. George, too, if you can. I can't. You know there's no need to keep them here. I'm not going to make more trouble. Not with Pop like this. You're probably not going to make more trouble, Braith went aloud. But I'm certain that Letitia would, if I tried to take her out of here without you. And my father's orders are explicit. I leave. No one else. Then we've got nothing more to say to each other. All right. Nodding. I'll go then. But he hesitated, hand on the doorknob. I'll have breakfast sent up. Don't bother. No, trust me. You want to eat something, Caleb Braithwaite said. You want to keep your strength up for the ritual. And you never know when a meal will be your last. None of us do. Atticus was ready when they came for him. He shined his shoes, put on fresh trousers and a clean white shirt, and rolled up his sleeves as if preparing for hard labor. William, who unlocked the door, smiled as if he'd come to escort Atticus to lunch. The servants in the hall behind him, a couple of them sported bruises from the night before, were less congenial. Atticus took a last look at his father and at George and Letitia standing beside the bed. 
You all take care of each other, he said. Pray for me. The room where the ritual was to take place was a large rectangular space at the center of the third floor. Though windowless, it had a skylight, as well as half a dozen wall sconces fitted with bright bulbs. From scuff marks on the floor and various other signs, Atticus surmised the room was a workshop that would ordinarily have been crammed with heavy furniture and equipment, but today it had been emptied of everything not crucial to the business at hand. A freestanding door had been erected at the east end of the room. The timbers that made up the frame had been carved with letters from a strange alphabet, spelling out what Atticus assumed were words of power. The door itself was a glossy black, with silver hinges and a silver knob. White chalk flecked with silver had been used to draw a circle on the floor around the door. Parallel lines extended from a gap in the circle's west arc, forming a foot-wide path that connected to another circle at the far end of the room. The second circle contained a curious device, a silver cylinder, waist-high, capped with a hunk of clear crystal. Midway along the path between the door and the cylinder, directly beneath the skylight, was a third circle. More of the strange letters were inscribed around its circumference, and at its center was a large symbol resembling a broken, five-pointed star, formed from curved lines, as though, Atticus thought, an ordinary pentagram had been distorted by a magnetic field. The thought of magnetism wasn't random. The series of circles reminded him of a circuit diagram, and he could guess how the ritual was supposed to work. The door would open to admit some force or energy from elsewhere. The cylinder, which must be a capacitor of some kind, would capture it. To complete the circuit, a conductor was needed. To coax the energy forth. To direct it where it was meant to go. And to blow, like a fuse, if it proved too powerful to contain. You want me to stand there? Atticus said. Yes, said Samuel Braithwaite. Dressed in ceremonial robes, he still looked more mundane than wizardly, like a Harvard professor who'd misplaced his mortarboard. The other sons of Adam, similarly garbed, were gathered back behind the circle containing the cylinder, which also happened to be the part of the room closest to the exit. William and the servants had been dismissed and told to wait downstairs. Atticus wondered if any of them had the sense to run for the hills. We also need you to recite an invocation, Braithwaite said. He signaled to one of the more nervous-looking Antonauts. The man came forward holding a rolled-up parchment, which he unfurled and showed to Atticus. I can't read that, Atticus said. I don't even know what language that is. It's the language of Adam, said Braithwaite. Everyone can read it. You just need to remember how. If you say so. What comes through that door? Light. The first light of creation. The first light of creation, Atticus repeated. And what's that do to me? Preston banged his cane on the floor. Time, he called. You'll find out soon enough, Braithwaite said to Atticus. Now get in. Galled by Braithwaite's tone, Atticus once more contemplated hauling off and decking the man. But his fists, he knew now, would not obey him if he tried that. And there was his father to consider. And George and Letitia, too. Their only chance was for him to go through with this. So he stepped into the circle. Face the door, Braithwaite commanded, and hold out your hands. Atticus cupped his hands in front of him. Braithwaite produced a knife from within his robes and cut across both palms, the blade so sharp that blood was welling up before Atticus felt any pain. Time, Preston called again, and one of the other Antonauts blew into a horn, a long, buzzing note that rattled the base of Atticus's spine. Blood dripped from his hands onto the floor, the droplets skittering like blobs of mercury to the curved lines of the pentagram, which absorbed them. The noon sun's light shone down, and the pentagram seemed to absorb that too. It began to glow. Braithwaite, now holding a piece of silvered chalk, squatted beside the circle. He made a single stroke across one of the letters, changing it to another, and Atticus felt the paralysis grip his legs again. Braithwaite nodded to his assistant, who offered Atticus the parchment. Atticus took it, but found he still could not make sense of the invocation. Then Braithwaite stood up and walked quickly around behind the door and back to the other side of the circle that held Atticus, 
As the horn sounded a second time, he stooped and changed another letter. Understanding came over Atticus in a flood. Now he could read the words on the parchment and hear them in his head. But when he tried to utter them aloud, his tongue was stopped. A weight like an invisible finger pressed against his lips. Time, Preston called. Time. The horn sounded again, and Braithwaite made a third stroke with the chalk. Atticus opened his mouth. When he began speaking, he was aware of Braithwaite and his assistant scurrying back to join the other Antonauts. But as Atticus went on reciting the words of power, the room around him seemed to fade until all that remained was the door in front of him and the shining pattern on the floor. Light appeared around the edges of the doorway. Light in a hue Atticus could not recall having seen before, and which he could not have described, but which at the same time seemed intimately familiar. As the light grew brighter, Atticus found his own comprehension growing with it. Oh, he thought, as the doorknob began to jiggle and twitch. Oh, I see now. Not long after he deployed to Korea, Atticus had attended a Sunday service in camp. The unit's regular chaplain was in the stockade, having been accused, along with several other Negroes, of instigating a brawl with some white soldiers who refused to share their mess tent. The substitute chaplain took it upon himself to lecture the black enlisted men of the 24th Infantry about the importance of racial tolerance. They should strive to live on earth as they would in heaven, he told them. In the Lord's house, they would surrender their mortal bodies. There would be no more races, no men and women either, only pure souls, united in God. The obvious complaint about this sermon was that it was being preached to the wrong congregation. It wasn't the Negro soldiers who had defied President Truman's integration order, and they hadn't started the fight over the mess tent either, whatever the MPs claimed. But some of Atticus's comrades took issue with the chaplain's theology as well. No men and women in heaven, he heard a soldier behind him grumble. If I ain't a man anymore, how's that different from just being dead? Atticus knew the answer now, and the answer to his question to Samuel Braithwaite. An experienced natural philosopher might hope to survive exposure to the unfiltered light of creation, but Atticus would be annihilated by it. Stripped of identity, of everything that made him Atticus, not just unmanned, but unnamed. It would be like dying, but a positive oblivion rather than a negative one, a return to the infinite possibility of the primordial state. Positive oblivion. The prospect frightened him less than he would have expected, and he could see how, to a certain type of person, it wouldn't have been frightening at all, but rather a fate worth seeking. To a certain type of person. Not Atticus, though. He liked who and what he was. He always had. It was God's other creatures he occasionally had problems with. And so, because he did not seek oblivion, and because he wasn't ready to die either, he reached into the rolled-up cuff of his left sleeve and pulled out the slip of paper that was hidden there. The unsigned note that had been delivered along with his breakfast. For Atticus, it said. A twist in the tail. When you can read this, do so. And then... Three words in the language of Adam. Time, Atticus thought. He spoke the words aloud, and the glowing pattern on the floor transformed. The circle around the door was broken, and the connecting path melted away. The circle around Atticus closed up, and not a moment too soon. The door was opening. A veil of protective darkness dropped over Atticus's eyes, shielding him from the light that otherwise would have burned him where he stood. His mind, seeing that the darkness was good, decided to drift off into it. As he fell unconscious, he heard the sons of Adam screaming. When the darkness lifted, he was curled up on the floor. The wounds on his hands had closed, leaving only faint scars, and he was otherwise unharmed. The same could not be said for the rest of the room. The floorboards outside the protective circle were blackened and scorched, as were the walls and the ceiling, the magic doorway and the capacitor were burnt and melted wrecks, and the skylight had become an open hole in the roof. As for the sons of Adam, they were more sons of Pompeii now, ashen figures, caught in poses of terror. Then Atticus stood up, 
and the vibration of his footfalls triggered a final dissolution, surrendering to entropy. The Antonauts crumbled into piles of white dust. Atticus tried not to get any on his shoes as he walked out. He found George and Letitia and his father all waiting down in the foyer. With their bags beside them, they looked like unhappy tourists at checkout, clearly regretting their choice of accommodations, but otherwise none the worse for wear. Pop! exclaimed Atticus. You okay? To which Montrose responded with a sullen shrug. William called the room a few minutes ago and told us we were free to leave, George explained. By the time the servants came to unlock the door, Montrose was up and about. What about Mr. Braithwaite and the order? Letitia asked. Are they? Gone, said Atticus. All of them. He looked at his father. Braithwaite Jr. staged a coup. Told you, Montrose said, nodding. So where does that leave us? George wondered. They heard a car out front and went to look. It was William, bringing George's Packard from the garage. The broken windows had been replaced, and the entire vehicle had been buffed and polished until it looked practically brand new. Mr. Turner, William said brightly as he got out of the car. I'm so glad you survived your ordeal intact. Yeah, me too, Atticus said. Nice job on the repairs. Mr. Braithwaite's doing, William said. He saw to it personally this morning before he left. He asked me to tell you that he's sorry he can't be here to see you off in person, and he apologizes again for all that you've been put through. He hopes you'll accept a few tokens of his sincere regret. Some boxes of books for you and your uncle, and for you, Mr. Turner. He looked at Montrose. A copy of all the genealogical data Mr. Braithwaite managed to collect about your late wife's family. Miss Dandridge, I've taken the liberty of repacking your dresses. Also, Mr. Barry, in addition to repairing your car, Mr. Braithwaite made a small modification to it that he believes you'll find agreeable. What sort of modification? George said. A dash of immunity. From now on, you should find you're much less likely to run into trouble on the road. Law enforcement officials in particular will tend to treat you as though you're invisible to them. So George can speed and get away with it? Montrose said. That's an option. Yes, sir. I confess I'm ignorant of the mechanism, but Mr. Braithwaite has it on all his own cars as well. It's quite useful when he's in a hurry, or when he can't find legal parking. What about Sheriff Hunt? Atticus asked. Are we invisible to him too? In a manner of speaking, William said. My understanding is that the sheriff is preoccupied with hiring new deputies. He's entirely forgotten his encounter with you the other night, and he'll go on forgetting it so long as you're careful not to cross his path again. To that end, as you leave here, you'll want to take the left-hand way whenever the road branches. After the third such branching, you'll find yourself exiting the wood and Devon County without having passed through Biddeford. And that's it, Atticus said. We just go home? Unless you'd prefer some other destination, Mr. Turner. Looking past him, William raised a hand and snapped his fingers, Servants came out of the lodge, carrying the bags. What about Mr. Braithwaite? George said, after the luggage had been put in the car. Mr. Braithwaite, sir? What about him? I think my Uncle George is asking what Mr. Braithwaite's plans are, Atticus said, now that he's lord of the manor. I'm sure I don't know, Mr. Turner, William said. As I told you when we first met, I keep Mr. Braithwaite's house, not his business. And as I told you, I think you know a lot about his business. My ordeal, for example. I wouldn't have survived it if you hadn't passed me that note. That was entirely Mr. Braithwaite's doing, Mr. Turner. I was simply following his instructions. William paused to consider. I suppose I could be credited with the wisdom of knowing which Mr. Braithwaite to follow. But the choice wasn't difficult. He smiled. Well? He concluded, I have a bit of cleaning up to do, so you'll have to excuse me. Do drive carefully. And with that, and a final nod, he went quickly into the lodge, shutting the doors behind him. The four of them stood in the afternoon sunlight, thinking, dismissed. It never fails, Montrose said. No matter what they do to you, afterwards, it's like nothing happened. 
You're supposed to just be grateful you're still breathing. Well, I am grateful for that, George admitted. He stepped up to the car and ran a hand along the wood trim. Immunity? Huh. We'll have to give that a try on the way back to Marvin's, Letitia said. I'll be happy to drive if you want. George laughed. Not a chance, he said. I got first dibs. Letitia and Montrose rode up front with him. Atticus squeezed himself in between the luggage and Braithwaite's going away presents so he could look out the back as they drove. He watched the lodge for as long as he could see it. When they crossed the bridge and entered the wood, he watched the road, alert for any flash of silver on the twists and turns behind them. He saw no sign of Braithwaite's Daimler, but as they reached the third fork in the road, he glimpsed a big shadow moving back among the trees. Come to say goodbye? Atticus wondered. Or just farewell for now. Another mile on, they passed a sign that said leaving Devon County. Praise Jesus, said Letitia. George added his own hallelujah, and Montrose muttered, good riddance. Atticus said nothing, only faced forward, and tried to believe that the country into which they now traveled was different from the one they left behind. Dreams of the Witch House No part of said premises shall in any manner be used or occupied directly or indirectly by any Negro or Negroes, provided that this restriction shall not prevent the occupation, during the period of their employment, of janitors or chauffeurs' quarters in the basement or in a barn or garage in the rear, or of servants' quarters. No part of said premises shall be sold, given, conveyed, or leased to any Negro or Negroes, and no permission or license to use or occupy any part thereof shall be given to any Negro except house servants or janitors or chauffeurs employed thereon, as aforesaid. Standard Form Restrictive Covenant Drafted for the Chicago Real Estate Board by Nathan William McChesney of the Chicago Plan Commission, 1927 Summer was waning when Letitia got the blessing she'd been waiting for. By then, her ordeal in Artem had come to feel like a distant memory, and there were times, as June became July and July became August, when she wondered if she'd been wrong about God having something special in store for her. Maybe the virtue of helping Atticus find his father was supposed to be its own reward. That, and getting to go home alive afterwards, if that had been the case, she'd have accepted it and been grateful. Though her brother Marvin might claim otherwise, Letitia knew better than to believe God owed her anything. But she also knew that the Lord moves at his own speed and that patience is often part of the price he exacts for giving us what he wants us to have. The blessing, when it finally did come, was everything she'd hoped for, and more. Letitia had been wrong about one thing, though. Her ordeal wasn't over. She came by the Safe Negro Travel Company the same day she deposited the check. George was alone in the office, looking over the proofs for the autumn edition of the guide. Letitia got straight to the point. Real estate, George said. You win a sweepstakes? Kind of, Letitia said. I got a registered letter last week. Actually, the envelope had been addressed to Miss Dandridge, and since Letitia was staying at Ruby's, it would have been fair to assume the letter was meant for her. But Letitia was home by herself that morning, and curiosity got the better of her. The letter was from a lawyer. He said he had some money from one of Daddy's business partners to pay off an old debt. Business partner in Warren Dandridge's case, meaning gambler. Letitia's father had made his living at cards, poker and gin rummy primarily, though he'd play any game he could win. I know what you're thinking, Letitia said. I'm not thinking anything, honey. I always respected your dad. I know you did, but you'd be a fool not to think it. Daddy wasn't a con man. But he ran with con men. Ruby wanted to burn the letter. But not you, huh? I had to go see. Thinking even if it was a con, she might be able to turn it to her advantage somehow. The lawyer's office was in this fancy building on the South Street. The security guards didn't even want to let me in the lobby. They made her use the service elevator, which she'd found reassuring. Playing hard to get was an old con man's trick, but a white lawyer in a white building was a lot of trouble to go to to fool someone, and she didn't think her father's friends respected women's intelligence that much. Did the lawyer tell you who this business partner was? 
George asked. No. That was the whole point of the lawyer. He wanted to be anonymous. Hmm. I know, she said. As soon as he told me that, I was sure he was going to ask me for money up front, some kind of fee. But he didn't want anything. Not even a signature. All I had to do was show him my driver's license, and he gave me a check. How much was the check for? This stays between us? Of course, she told him the amount. Well, now, George said, with that, you really could buy an apartment. A small one, anyway, if... If the money's real, yeah. I'll know soon enough. But meantime, the reason I'm here, I want something more than just an apartment. A house? She hesitated, unsure what name to give her desire. A place, she said finally, with space for me and Ruby so we're not always on top of each other, and a room for Marvin to stay in when he visits and some extra rooms to let out. George smiled. You want to be a landlady? I know it's not glamorous, she said, but yeah, I think I'd like that. Letitia cast an appraising glance around the office. Maybe space to run my own business, too. Well, I admire your ambition, George said. But even if you can't afford the down payment on the kind of place you're talking about, you know no bank is going to give you a mortgage. Letitia nodded. Because banks didn't like to invest in colored neighborhoods, or neighborhoods likely to become colored, mortgage loans were almost impossible for Negroes to obtain. For home financing, most were forced to rely on installment contracts. The payment structure was similar to a mortgage, but you didn't own the property until the contract was paid off. And if you defaulted, even on the very last payment, you lost everything you'd put into it. The upside was, anyone could get one. Sellers were often eager to offer contracts to buyers they thought would default because it allowed them to collect multiple down payments on the same property. The other problem, George added, is finding a place. I don't have to tell you what the housing situation's like. Well, about that, Letitia said. I was thinking I might try pioneering. You want to buy property in a white neighborhood? I know you know people who've done it. Like Mr. and Mrs. Powell? Didn't you help them get into East Woodlawn? Back when there were practically no Negroes living there. Yeah, George acknowledged reluctantly. But what happened with Albert and Thea is as much a cautionary tale as a success story. So tell it to me, Letitia said. How did it work? Well, George said, this was six years ago, right after the Supreme Court ruled that racist housing covenants were unconstitutional. Albert and Thea had plenty of money saved up, and they'd been wanting to buy a house for the longest time, so they took the ruling as a go signal. That's when Albert came to me and asked if I knew a real estate broker he could trust. See, what the justices actually said is that race-restrictive covenants aren't enforceable in court. Property owners can still abide by them voluntarily, though, and most white folks, unless they're desperate, aren't going to sell to colored people if it costs them all their friends. So Albert needed a broker who'd play along with a shell game, and he also needed to find a white person who'd act as a front man. To buy the house for him, you mean? He had to pay someone for that? That's usually how it works, George said. Albert had a bit of luck there. His sister is married to a white man. Jewish, he clarified, but German enough to pass for Lutheran. So Albert got his brother-in-law to buy the house, using Albert and Thea's money, and with the understanding that they'd get title once the deal closed. The next step was taking possession. Even with the Supreme Court on their side, Albert and Thea were worried their new neighbors might try to stop them moving in. So they did it on the sneak went to a Saturday night mass, asked St. Jude to look out for them, and made the move the next morning, while the neighbors were all at their own churches. Once they got the van unloaded, Albert put in a call to the local police and let them know they had a new Negro couple living in their precinct who were probably going to need protection. Of course, the cops turned right around and told the neighbors, and so by Monday morning, when Albert and Thea left to go to work, Every other house on the block had a sign up saying, We are a white community. Undesirables must go. That was Monday. Tuesday night, someone threw a brick through Albert and Thea's front window. Albert called the police again. And when they didn't do anything, he called the NAACP and the City Commission on Human Relations. 
I made some calls, too. Eventually, the cops stationed a patrol car in front of the house. For what good it did, that first year, there were 39 instances of vandalism, including two arson attempts. Albert's dog was poisoned. And of course, he and Thea couldn't even walk down the block without people hurling abuse at them. Letitia nodded, understanding the point George was trying to make here, but eager to make her own. In the end, though, they kept the house, right? Oh, yeah, George said. Albert went prematurely gray from not sleeping for a year, and Thea had a heart attack, but they kept the house. He shook his head. You're serious about this, huh? Well, George, Letitia said, I can't imagine the Lord giving me this opportunity if he didn't intend me to use it. And Marvin and Ruby? They're on board, too? One thing the lawyer had been clear about, the check was intended to go to Warren Dandridge's daughters, so Marvin and his skepticism weren't a part of it. As for Ruby, yeah, she said, they're on board. The words on the frosted glass pane read Harold Bailey, Realtist. Realtist, a Negro real estate broker, not to be confused with a white realtor whose national association Negroes could not join. A pair of decals indicated Mr. Bailey was also a member of the Prince Hall Freemasons and the Improved Order of Elks. The lights in Mr. Bailey's office were out, and the door was locked. Letitia, standing in the third-floor hallway with Ruby, tried to control her impatience. A bystander might not have guessed they were sisters. Letitia, slender and light-skinned, favored her father. Ruby, curvy and dark, suggested a youthful mama, but a mama who could be pushed around. Her pliability wasn't limitless, though, and there was a core of genuine mama within her that could emerge, given time, like a mountain rising from the sea. The trick was getting what you wanted from her before you ran aground. So far, Ruby seemed willing to play along with Letitia's scheme, but if this morning's meeting had to be rescheduled, she might start having other ideas. He said nine o'clock. Well, I promised Mrs. Parker that I'd be over to watch Clarice by 11.30, Ruby said. And I was hoping to stop into Mandel Brothers' basement to look for shoes for that new catering job I told you about. I don't see what you want to start another job for, Letitia said. Now that we got this, of course you don't see. You need to know how to hold down one steady job before you can talk about another. I am going to have a steady job now, Ruby. That's what this is all about. Security. Yeah, big landlady on Easy Street, Ruby sighed. We could still give the money to the church. Ruby! Letitia was horrified. You didn't tell anyone from church, did you? No, don't worry, Uncle Pennybags. I didn't give away your secret. You better not have. Daddy wanted us to have this money. Ruby snorted. Like you care what Daddy wanted. I do care. And I care about you which brought another snort. You want to spend the rest of your life living in one tiny room? Of course I don't, but, and hard as you work? When's the last time you came into a fortune like this? Never, Ruby said. That's how I know not to trust it. A door opened at the far end of the hall. The sisters turned to look at the white man who'd come out to look at them. Miss Dandridge, the man said. I'm Miss Dandridge, said Letitia. Feeling Ruby bristle beside her. We both are. I'm John Archibald. I'm a friend of Mr. Bailey's. He asked me to tell you that he won't be able to meet with you today. Oh. He also told me what it is you're here for. I'd be happy to help you myself if you'd like. He stepped farther into the hall as he said this, and Letitia, looking past him at the open door, saw the word realtor painted in reverse on the glass. Of course, he added, noting her hesitation, if you'd rather wait for Mr. Bailey. Ruby's hand was on Letitia's arm, tugging. Let's go. But it might be another week before Ruby had free time again. Too long. You and Mr. Bailey, Letitia said. Are you just friends or... Partners, Mr. Archibald said. Silent partners. These are all white neighborhoods? Yes, said Mr. Archibald. That's what Hal told me you were interested in. Nobody told me anything about white neighborhoods. Ruby looked pointedly at Letitia, who went right on turning pages in the three-ring binder Mr. Archibald had offered them. There's something I don't understand about these prices, 
Letitia said. Like these two buildings here. They look almost the same in terms of square footage and lot size. But the first one's so much cheaper. She showed him the listings. It's a matter of location, Mr. Archibald explained. But they're on the same street. Different blocks, though. With that first property, the block is still entirely white-owned. As I'm sure I don't have to tell you, it can be difficult to be the first Negro to break into a block. We don't want difficult, said Ruby. Definitely not. So in this case, the seller, an investor Hal and I both know, has agreed to offer what we call a first-end discount. Once that first sale goes through, subsequent sales become much easier. Eventually, as in the case of that second property, things reach a tipping point where ownership of the whole block can turn over in only a year or two. Lots of commissions for you, Letitia said. Lots of commissions for me and Mr. Bailey, he corrected her. And lots of new homes for deserving Negro families. Letitia nodded. Fair enough. It wasn't. But she couldn't be too outraged by a practice she hoped to benefit from. The real problem was, even with the first end discount, she wasn't sure she could afford what she wanted. And however much of a straight shooter he had made himself out to be, she didn't doubt Mr. Archibald would gladly take her money for a property she'd end up defaulting on. She turned another page in the binder. This can't be right, she said, reading over the listing. This price can't be right, can it? Mr. Archibald leaned forward to see what property she was looking at. Oh, he said. The Wenthrop House. The which house? Letitia said. It's ugly, said Ruby. It'll be prettier once it's ours, Letitia replied. Like a baby. Noon of the following Sunday, and the sisters in their church clothes stood before a boxy edifice whose brick exterior exhibited all the charm of a public school building. But it was the inside Letitia cared about. Looking up, she could see the glass tent of the skylight that, according to the property listing, capped a two-story atrium surrounded by fourteen other rooms. Fourteen rooms. The apartment Letitia and her siblings had grown up in had had just two, plus a shared bathroom on a different floor. The Winthrop House shared its narrow block with a defunct tavern and an overgrown lot that had at one time been a park. The block was on the west side of a two-lane street. The east side was lined with small single-family homes, all white-owned. A woman sitting on the porch of the cottage directly opposite the Winthrop house had watched with trepidation as Letitia and Ruby approached and was now glaring openly at them. It's a lot longer trip to work from here, too, Ruby said. Yeah, but when you come home, you'll be able to stretch out and be comfortable. I'm comfortable where I am. This'll be more comfortable, Letitia insisted. She looked up again at a rust-eaten chair perched incongruously at the roof's northeast corner. Must be a nice view. I wonder if you can see the lake from here. She turned around, smiling, and was met by the white woman's hostile stare. Yeah, nice view, said Ruby, casting her own glance across the street. I'm sure we'll be real comfortable. Mr. Archibald arrived a few minutes later. He tipped his hat to the glowering white woman, and hustled Letitia and Ruby inside. Dust motes floated in the sunlight, streaming down onto the atrium's chessboard floor. Archways to the left and right of the front door gave access to what Mr. Archibald identified as a dining room and a parlor, though given the absence of furniture, they had to take his word for it. Stairs ran up the atrium's right wall to a gallery in back, with more doorways visible above and below. Letitia approached the atrium's centerpiece, a sheet-draped figure, standing inside a raised marble ring. The property listing had mentioned a fountain, but it hadn't occurred to her that it might be indoors. May I? she asked. Please, said Mr. Archibald. Letitia grabbed a fold of the sheet and pulled, unveiling a naked divinity cast in bronze. Lord, said Ruby. The bronze idol, her hair pinned up with a crescent moon tiara, gripped two massive torches, one in each hand, their flames rising past the level of her shoulders. A skeleton key dangled between her bare breasts. At her feet was a basket of hissing snakes, copper tubing in their coils, feeding down into the guts of the fountain. Hecate, Mr. Archibald said helpfully. 
goddess of the moon. I see the moon all right, said Letitia, circling around to the fountain's rear. Two additional faces sprouted from the back of Hecate's head, like something out of a carnival freak show. A chorus of toads, spigot-mouthed like the snakes, formed an unsightly mound behind her heels. This is going to have to go. I can certainly speak to the seller about it, Mr. Archibald said, but, as I explained yesterday, under the terms of the purchase contract, yeah, I was paying attention. Because she wouldn't own the house until it was paid off, any significant alterations to the property had to be approved by the seller. You sure I can't talk to them directly? No, I'm afraid not. The property listing said the Winthrop House was owned by Penumbra Real Estate, which Letitia assumed was run by Mr. Archibald's investor friend, or perhaps by Mr. Archibald himself. All communication with Penumbra was to go through him. I'll convey your concern. Be sure you do, Letitia sniffed. The kind of tenants we're hoping to rent to, families, church-going folk, they're not going to like this. At all reflecting as she said it that Southside Negroes would put up with a lot worse than pagan statuary to get a roof over their heads. But they shouldn't have to put up with it, she thought. And for sure, she didn't want to look at Hecate's moon every day. She shifted her attention to a pair of dark doorways, one up on the gallery, one directly beneath it, both screened by iron accordion gates. That's the elevator? Yes, Mr. Archibald said. The builder of the house, Hiram Winthrop had it installed for his wife. She'd had polio, he explained. You hear that, Ruby? Letitia said. Polio? Like Marvin? Marvin climbs stairs just fine, Ruby replied. Well, not everyone does. That could be a selling point for tenants. Old people, she thought. Quiet, easy to get along with, paid their rent on time. The elevator does need to be repaired. Mr. Archibald noted, the delicacy with which he said this, making it plain whose responsibility that would be. Ruby snorted. Of course it does. What else is wrong with the house? The wiring needs to be looked at. The power is off right now, but the last occupant reported that fuses were blown constantly. Also, no, Ruby said. What's wrong with it? She fixed him with a narrow-eyed stare. Mama, peering up from the depths. A house this size, with a price this low, and you're willing to let us have it? That's about more than a fuse box. What aren't you telling us? Mr. Archibald hesitated. It was plain from his expression that he'd been waiting for this question, and was even relieved that the subject had been broached. Yet still, he wasn't sure how to answer. Letitia saved him the trouble. It's haunted. What? said Ruby. It's a haunted house. What else could it be? She looked at Mr. Archibald, who confirmed her guess by not saying no. So, who's the ghost? Mrs. Winthrop? She ride her wheelchair up and down the halls at night? I honestly don't know, Mr. Archibald said. I... Wait a minute, said Ruby. This is true? All I've heard are stories, Mr. Archibald raised a hand. Scout's honor. I haven't experienced any phenomena myself, nor do I expect to, but it's true that some prior occupants have reported incidents, bumps in the night, and the last several attempts to sell the house have all ended with the buyers backing out. And when were you planning on mentioning this exactly? Miss Dandridge, please. I wasn't trying to withhold information from you, but I consider myself a rational man. I don't believe in... It's okay, Letitia said. We're not afraid of dead people. Letitia! One thing, though. Now that the cat's out of the bag, you think the seller might come down on the price even more? Letitia! Ruby! Matching her tone for tone. It's got an elevator! The first to arrive for the moving in day party was George's wife, Hippolyta. She drove up in her Buick Roadmaster, with Horace beside her and a second hand bedstead tied to the car's roof. The elevator wasn't working yet, so they wrestled the bedstead up the stairs, Letitia and Horace holding one end, six-foot Hippolyta the other, and into the room Letitia had chosen for herself, where a box spring, mattress, and sheets were already waiting. After making up the bed, Letitia stepped back and took a deep breath. 
half expecting to wake and find herself under the covers at Ruby's old place. But the dream house stayed solid around her, so she took another breath and laughed and turned to Hippolyta. Come on, she said. I'll give you the tour. They came out on the gallery and caught Horace downstairs, peeking under Hecate's sheet. Careful, Letitia warned, making Horace jump. You'll go blind. She laughed again. Come on back up. There's something you and your mom will both like. She led them to a room in the southwest corner of the second floor. With its built-in bookcase, it had probably been intended as a study, and Letitia had plans to turn it into a rentable bedroom. But, at the moment, it housed an oversized rich man's toy. Mr. Archibald had called the device an orrery, a model solar system, though the system it modeled wasn't souls, but rather that of a double star. The twin suns were gold and silver spheres mounted on a central pivot. Ranged around them, on brass arms of varying length, were eleven planets, some with satellites of their own, and a comet carved from a hunk of milky quartz. All of this was supported by a squat metal table whose windowed top offered glimpses of complex gear work. Whoa, said Horace. Hippolyta stayed silent, but her eyes were as wide as her son's as she leaned in to examine one of the larger planets. A glass ball filled with fluid that formed bands and swirls like the atmosphere of Jupiter. Told you you'd like it. And it moves, too. Horace, dug down and flip that little lever on the base there. Eagerly, he did as she asked. The orrery came to life, suns dancing around on their pivot, brass arms turning. The exposed gearwork emitted a noisy tick-tick-clack, but the motion of the planets was smooth, and if you squinted the right way, you could make the arms disappear so that they seemed to float free. Letitia looked sideways at Hippolyta, who in that moment resembled the world's tallest child on Christmas morning. It's yours, if you want it. Mom, Horace said. Yes. Oh, no. Hippolyta's face sang, if only. I can't sell it to an antique store, Letitia explained, because it's not mine to sell. But my contract doesn't say anything about loans. And I know you'd appreciate it. Mom, where will we put it, though? My room, cried Horace. Uh-huh. And after we moved out your bed to make room for it, where would you sleep? On the floor? He demonstrated, lying face up on the hard wood while the planets wheeled above him. You're welcome to the pictures, too, Letitia said. The wall opposite the bookcase was decorated with heavy glass photographic plates showing clusters of stars. Hippolyta went to take a closer look. It's funny. I don't recognize any of these constellations, she said after a moment. She peered curiously at an image of a spiral galaxy that had been labeled the Drowning Octopus. Do you know where these were taken? Letitia shook her head. Horace, on his feet again, opened a narrow door beside the bookcase. What's in here? Stairs to the roof, Letitia told him. Don't go up. To Hippolyta, she said, I'm serious about giving this thing to you. You could put it on your own roof, maybe. That'd be a feat, getting it up to our roof, Hippolyta said laughing. You'd have to take it apart just to get it out of this room. I could take it apart. Horace volunteered. I could put it back together for you, too. We can... The hall door banged shut. Horace jumped, and his mother started as well. Only Letitia kept calm. Outwardly, at least. Not even batting an eye. Drafty old house, she said. More guests arrived. Some brought furniture, others food and drink for the party. Tree Hawkins, the bouncer from Denmark Vesey's, brought himself and three friends as large as he was. They came in a rust-bucket Cadillac with a broken muffler. Their arrival, noted by everyone with an earshot, the plan being they'd sneak out the back at the end of the night and leave the car behind as a caution to the neighbors. Make trouble and find yourself tangling with giants. By nightfall, there were upwards of fifty people in the house, more warm bodies than the Winthrop house had known in years, maybe ever. Letitia, Checking on the buffet that had been set up in the dining room, stopped to chat with Atticus's father, whose housewarming gift had been a shotgun and a box of shells. Three, Montrose said, nodding at the family portrait above the dining room fireplace. Hiram Winthrop, his wife, 
and a boy about Horace's age. All this space for three people. Two, actually, Letitia said. I did some homework. Turns out Mrs. Winthrop died, right before they were supposed to move in. So it was just him and the boy. And the servants, of course. The servants' quarters were in the basement, underneath the kitchen and the laundry room. You know how I made his money? The family fortune came from a string of textile mills back east, but I gather old Hiram here was more about spending it than making it. Textile mills, Montrose grunted. Cotton money. Yeah, it's funny how things come back around, isn't it? In the atrium, Tree and the other bouncers had brought out instruments, and some of the guests were dancing, or trying to. The band kept going off-tempo, eliciting mostly good-natured groans from the crowd. Letitia went up to Charlie Boyd, who was sitting on the edge of the fountain. Hecate's sheet was now swaddled around her like a toga, and someone had stuck a Howard University bison pennant on one of her torches. What's wrong with Tree? Letitia asked. They're usually better than this. Charlie shrugged. You ask me, this isn't their first party of the day, but Tree claims it's bad vibrations. Vibrations? Through the floor. Charlie mimed banging a broomstick on the ceiling. You don't have somebody living downstairs already, do you? Not yet. But there's some nice bunk beds down there, if you're interested. Thanks. I already live in a basement. You want to rent me one of those upstairs bedrooms, though? We'll talk, Letitia promised. You seen Atticus around? He said something about going up to the roof. The wall switch in the orrery room clicked uselessly, but by the light from the hall, Letitia could see the roof door standing open. She stepped carefully around the orrery, glimpsing as she did so something small and many-legged swimming in the fluid of the model gas giant, a trick of the shadows that vanished when she looked straight at it. On the roof, the chimneys were arranged like standing stones around the tent of the skylight. Atticus was over on the far side, sitting at the chair with his back to her. Letitia was about to call his name when she was seized by a sudden doubt another trick of perception, making it seem as though the figure in the chair had a head of straight, fine hair, combed back above a pale neck. Then Atticus turned around smiling. Hey, he said. I tell you, you look nice tonight. She did a perfunctory twirl beside the skylight, the act reminding her when she'd gotten this particular dress, reminding him too. His smile faltered. She came and stood next to him. Across the street, the neighbors were having their own party. Worse music, worse drinking, Letitia thought, recalling an observation her father had once made about how white people celebrated. They've been pretty well behaved, Atticus volunteered. Some boys were out on the lawn before, trying to blow up Tree's Cadillac with their eyeballs, but they lost heart and went back inside. I don't think you'll have any trouble tonight. Tomorrow? He shrugged. I'm not worried, Letitia said automatically. Ruby is. Can't say I blame her either. Ruby said something to you? When, just now? I ran into her on the street a few days ago. Look, Letitia, I know it's not my business. You got that right, she said. And if you're so concerned about us, how come Ruby has to run into you? What's it been? Three months now since we got back? In all that time, how often have you called to come by to see how I am? I know, he said nodding. I know, and I'm sorry. But after what happened, I thought it might be safer for you if I kept my distance. In case it's not over. Yeah, I figured. But you could have done me the courtesy of asking if I wanted to be kept safe that way. Haven't I earned that much? Atticus didn't have an answer for that. He looked off into the night, pretending to be interested in the navigation lights of a passing airplane. After a moment, Letitia said, I heard you're working for George now. That's a matter of opinion, said Atticus. I've been doing odd jobs for him. Research for the guide, mostly. He sends me out on scouting trips. Like Hippolyta? And Hippolyta chooses her own destinations. I get a list, and George covers my gas and expenses. Sounds like work to me. Pop calls it make work. He's been on me to stop fooling around and use my GI benefit to go to college. He's not wrong, Atticus said, but I don't know. Something's not settled yet. Well, if you're looking for more make work, 
Letitia said. I could use a hand around here. You know anything about fixing elevators? That sounds like a job for Pop. You should ask him. I'm asking you. I can't pay you a salary, but I can give you free room and board when you're not out on the road for George. Let you get a little distance from your father, if you want it. Atticus thought about it. So I'd be your handyman on call? And someone to help keep the neighbors at bay, maybe. Couldn't hurt, Letitia acknowledged. Maybe you could wear your uniform now and then. Let them know I've got a soldier living here. All right, he nodded. Only thing, I'm headed to Colorado tomorrow to check out this new motel chain and talk to some gas station owners about carrying the guide. I should be back by Friday, though. You and Ruby be okay alone till then? Of course we will. And we won't be alone, Letitia smiled. We got the Holy Spirit looking out for us. Mama was coming to see the house. The visit had slipped Letitia's mind somehow until she woke with a start late Monday morning, realizing she had only moments to get ready. She dashed out to the gallery and discovered to her dismay that she'd also forgotten to clean up after Saturday night's party. The atrium's black and white tile was buried beneath mounds of colored confetti, and there were paper streamers everywhere. And when she looked into the dining room, having descended to the ground floor without taking a step, she saw more mess, plates and cups spilling off the table and stains on the walls that would have to be scrubbed. And Hecate! The goddess was naked again, but grown even more obscene, her breasts bigger, her behind bigger too, the corner of her mouth turned up in a cruel smirk as if anticipating Mama's reaction. Letitia pressed a hand to her own mouth, horrified. I'm going to get the belt for sure. She turned, meaning to run back to the kitchen, find a push broom, sweep everything up, confetti, tableware, Hecate, all of it. But the goddess clapped a heavy bronze hand on her shoulder and held her fast. Outside, a taxi door slammed, and Letitia heard Mama telling the driver to be careful with her suitcase. Light flared beneath the gallery. The elevator was rising out of the basement, its gleaming white interior bright as a beacon. Hiram Winthrop rode inside, glaring at Letitia out of the glass helmet of the spacesuit he was wearing. Then Letitia blinked, and Winthrop's head was replaced by a swirling darkness in which many-legged creatures swam. As the elevator continued to ascend, Hecate tightened her grip. Crushing Letitia's shoulder, Mama pounded at the front door. Letitia? she called. I know you're in there. Le Tisha. She sat up in her bed, in the dark, her sister's hand on her shoulder. What? she said. What? There's someone in the house, Ruby whispered. Letitia listened, hearing nothing at first, then detecting a faint rhythmic sound in the distance. What is that? Without waiting for an answer, she shrugged off Ruby's hand and swung her legs out of the bed, the shock of the cold floor against her bare feet bringing her fully awake. She retrieved the shotgun from under the bed, broke it open, ran her thumb over the brass casings of the shells already loaded in the barrels, snapped it shut again, and went out onto the gallery. The moon was shining through the skylight, illuminating the atrium floor, the spotlessly clean floor, Letitia noted, and Hecate, the goddess in her element. Turning right, Letitia saw that, as in her dream, the elevator was now on the second floor, the gate standing open. That's what woke me up, Ruby told her. I heard it moving. Letitia stuck her head into the empty elevator car, smelling musty wood and leather. She paused, listening again. The rhythmic sound was louder now. Tick-tick-clack, tick-tick-clack. The door to the orrery room stood ajar, letting a wedge of warm electric light into the hall. Letitia counted to three, invoked the Savior's name, and stepped into the doorway. Tick-tick-clack, tick-tick-clack. The stars and planets pivoted and whirled, and Letitia did too, sweeping the gun from side to side, corner to corner. But the room was, visibly at least, unoccupied. What is it, Letitia? Ruby said from ten paces back in the hallway. Nothing, said Letitia. She stepped back, lowering the gun, and the door slammed in her face, making Ruby shriek. The elevator was next, the gate crashing shut, and then 
One after the other, what sounded like every other door in the house. Crash, 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 crash. Oh my God, oh my God, Ruby said, her panic pushing Letitia the other way from fear towards anger. Damn it, Ruby, she said. Stop wailing. It's just noise. And then the greatest crash of all, a tremendous jolt as though the whole house had been lifted off its foundation and dropped. Letitia fought to keep her balance while Ruby collapsed against the wall. Letitia, she cried, only terror of falling, keeping her from headlong flight. I want to go home. You are home, Letitia said. When the Winthrop house bucked a second time, she was ready for it. Feet braced like a captain on the deck of a rolling ship. Her ship. We're not leaving, she said. This is our house now. Leaning into the storm, we're at a tipping point. But Ruby wouldn't stay. Not long after daybreak, in what felt like an inversion of her dream, Letitia watched Ruby lift a hastily packed suitcase into the back of the cab. Where are you going to go? Letitia said, and her sister replied, Away from here? As the taxi drove off, Letitia felt eyes on her and looked across the street to find the white woman on her porch, the smugness of her expression making Letitia wonder whether she knew about the ghost. Then she noticed Tree's Cadillac, still parked at the curb, but sitting now on four flats, with nigger scratched crudely across the front hood. So that's it, Letitia thought. You think that's what Ruby's running from? She stared contemptuously across the street until her neighbor's grin deflated like a punctured tire, and she remembered something urgent she had to tend to indoors. I'm not leaving, Letitia announced to the empty street. Back inside the Winthrop house, all was quiet, for now. The bucking and banging had continued for a quarter of an hour before abruptly ceasing, leaving a dissipated feeling in its wake, as though the house were a spent battery. How long to recharge? Letitia wondered, gazing quizzically at Hecate. Is this going to be an everyday affair? Twice weekly? I'll take whatever you throw at me, but I need tenants too, and even Southsiders might draw the line at nightly earthquakes. Then again, people rent apartments next to the L-tracks all the time. She decided to worry about it after breakfast and made her way to the kitchen, where she noted that the dishes, pots, and pans, most of which had come with the house, had been left undisturbed by the shaking. Come to think of it, none of the photographic plates in the orrery room had been knocked down either. So the ghost didn't like to damage its own property. Interesting. Letitia got out a bowl and a box of pancake mix. She was getting a measuring cup when she heard a soft creak of hinges behind her. She went into the corridor that connected the kitchen to the laundry room and found the basement door open. She stared at the steps leading down into darkness. Leaning forward carefully, she flipped the light switch. Nothing happened. She thought about the fuse box at the base of the stairs and thought, maybe later. She closed the basement door and went back to the kitchen. Letitia picked up the pancake mix again, registering the strange scrabbling inside the box a half second too late. She tipped the box over the mixing bowl, releasing a cascade of roaches, maggots, spiders, and other squirming and crawling things. A fat millipede scuttled out of the measuring cup across the back of her hand, and she jumped back screaming and waving her arm. The box hit the floor shuddering, its sides beginning to swell. Letitia glimpsed a mass of red worms erupting from a split in the cardboard, and then her backpedaling feet carried her through a swinging door into the atrium. She stood beneath the gallery, watching the crack under the swinging door. As the hammering in her chest subsided, she heard the sound of running water. She looked over at Hecate, but the fountain was dry. She came out from under the gallery and looked up. Warily, she climbed the stairs. Steam was wafting from the master bath beside her bedroom. Inside, the tub was near to overflowing, and floating in the water was what Letitia took at first glance to be a body, bloated and purple. Then she caught a glitter of sequins. She dropped it to her knees beside the tub, turned off the faucet, and reached into the scalding water to clutch the sodden gown. Purple seeped between her fingers, mingling with a dye from a half dozen other dresses, all ruined. She knelt there, close to tears, until something made her turn her head and look at the mirror above the sink. Traced into the condensation on the glass 
was the same word that had been scratched on Tree's Cadillac. Beneath it was a second, shorter obscenity. Letitia blinked as though she'd been slapped. For a moment, all feeling left her body. Then rage filled her, and she was up on her feet and moving. She grabbed the shotgun and headed for the orrery room. The door slammed shut as she approached, but she walked straight up and fired one barrel at close range, blasting away the doorknob and a six-inch circle of wood around it. She shoved through the doorway and took aim at the orrery. As she squeezed the trigger, an invisible force shoved the gun muzzle upwards. The shot punched a hole in the ceiling. Letitia swiped plaster dust from her eyes and gripped the shotgun like a baseball bat. But the ghost tore the weapon from her grasp, and then she felt hands on her shoulders, pushing her backwards into the hall. The door, what was left of it, slammed shut again. You can't keep me out forever, Letitia yelled. She kicked at the door, then ducked her head and stared balefully through the hole. And when I do get inside, I'm going to take your little toy apart piece by piece. You just try and stop me. With a rattle and a crash, the elevator gate slammed open. Letitia straightened and turned towards the sound, feeling a sudden dash of fear. The phantom hands fell on her shoulders again. She tried to fight, but there was nothing solid to land a blow against, and she was dragged, kicking and flailing out onto the gallery. The elevator car was no longer on the second floor, or the first floor either. The ghost shoved Letitia to the brink of the open shaft. She caught the edge of the gate with one outflung hand and clung to it fiercely as she was tipped forward over the abyss. What you going to do? she cried. You break my neck and then what? You think I won't come back and haunt you? Go ahead. Make me a ghost. See what that gets you. The force pushing against her slackened. The air around her seethed with malice, but she sensed uncertainty too. I know you were here first. Letitia said. I know you think it's your place, but you don't get to keep it all to yourself, not anymore. I'm staying. Dead or alive, at war or in peace, that's up to you. A sudden jolt broke her hold on the gate. Letitia gasped and shut her eyes and committed her soul to the Lord. But the ghost flung her away from the shaft, not into it, and as she collapsed against the gallery banister, she heard the gate rattle shut. Wednesday evening. There had been a fire in an apartment house on State Street. The building's tenants were gathered on the sidewalk, waiting for the firemen to depart so they could go back inside, either to salvage their possessions or, lacking other options, to reclaim their flooded and burned-out apartments. Letitia observed the crowd from a nearby bus stop, her mind mostly elsewhere. It had taken a little more than twenty-four hours to track Ruby back to her old one-room flat, the least to which, it turned out, she had never surrendered. Letitia had intended to sweet-talk her sister, get her to give the Winthrop house another chance, but the discovery that Ruby had had an escape route planned all along struck Letitia as a betrayal, as though Ruby had made a promise with her fingers crossed. Ruby would have none of it. You're mad at me? she said. You drag me to live in a haunted house, and it's my fault when it doesn't work out? Well, how's it supposed to work out when you don't even commit to it? You commit to it, Ruby told her. You keep the house and the money, too. I don't care. It's all yours now. That's what you wanted anyway. That is not what I wanted. The house is for us, Ruby. For us. Yeah, you go on and commit to that, too. Whatever helps you sleep at night. That wasn't fair. Letitia thought petulantly. Of course she wanted the house for herself. Of course she did. But it was never just about her. Why couldn't Ruby see that? She noticed a tall and light-skinned Negro man standing among the tenants displaced by the fire. He was holding his cap in his hands, wringing it like a dish rag as he stared at a row of soot-stained windows on the apartment house's upper floor. Seeing the bewilderment on the man's face, Letitia felt a redeeming impulse to Good Samaritanism, but before she could act on it, a little girl at the man's side rounded on her in suspicion. What are you looking at? the girl demanded. See ya, the man said sharply. He threw Letitia a quick look of apology. Then the bus came and Letitia, feeling rebuked, boarded without saying a word. It was after dark by the time she reached her stop. From there, she had another mile to walk, 
and though the blocks she passed were mostly colored, she stayed alert and kept a hand on the straight razor in the pocket of her skirt. She was almost home when a mint green Oldsmobile sedan cruised up alongside her. Letitia recognized it as belonging to one of her neighbors from across the street. The driver, a blonde boy in his late teens, began calling to her, Hey! 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 Mama hadn't given birth to any haze. Letitia ignored him and kept walking. Up ahead on her left was the defunct tavern. An alleyway ran behind it to the back of the Winthrop house. Letitia had sworn never to use the servant's entrance, but the blonde boy didn't know that. As she approached the mouth of the alley, the Oldsmobile sped up and swerved onto the sidewalk in front of her, cutting her off. Hey, said the blonde boy. He leaned smiling out of the driver's window. How you doing tonight? You need a ride somewhere? Letitia looked him in the eye. I need you to get out of my damn way, she said. The blonde boy reared back in exaggerated surprise. Wow, listen to you. The doors opened on the far side of the sedan, and two other boys got out. The blonde boy got out too. They surrounded her. They were all taller than she was, but Letitia stood straight and clutched the razor in her pocket, thinking, first one to touch me gets a scar. You should learn to be more polite, the blonde boy was saying. I mean, we're just trying to be friendly. And here you are, walking around alone, at night, in someone else's neighborhood. It's my neighborhood, too. No, it isn't. He raised a hand as though to strike her, and then held it inches from her face. You don't belong here. You... A low growl interrupted him. He stepped back and half-turned, hands still raised as a dog emerged from the shadows of the alleyway. It was a German shepherd, a big one, with its fangs bared and its ears flat back against its skull. This is Charlie Boyd Jr., Letitia said. He's staying with me, helping me keep an eye on my house. Charlie, this boy says we don't belong here. What do you think of that? The shepherd lunged forward, barking and snapping, and the blonde boy danced back, saying, Hey, hey, hey! This time in a higher register, Letitia waited until the dog had the blonde boy pinned against the side of the Oldsmobile, and then did a slow count to ten. At the end of the count, she snapped her fingers, and the dog quieted and came to heel instantly. Keeping his eyes on the shepherd, the blonde boy fumbled for his door handle. Letitia looked around at the other two boys, who beat a hasty retreat to the far side of the Oldsmobile. All three got back into the car. From the driver's seat, the blonde boy looked at Letitia and started to say, This isn't over, but Charlie Boy Jr. put his front paws up on the driver's door and leaned in the window, barking furiously, and the blonde boy threw the car into reverse and stepped on the gas. The sedan backed all the way across the street and into the light pole on the far sidewalk, smashing a tail light and putting a good-sized dent in the fender. The blonde boy gritted his teeth and shifted into drive and peeled out, leaving fat streaks of rubber on the asphalt. This isn't over, he shouted, and as the Oldsmobile roared off into the night, the other boys screamed threats of their own. Letitia just smiled. The taillight in the fender didn't make up for Tree's Cadillac, but they were a start. She looked at Charlie Boyd Jr., who looked back at her expectantly. Yeah, okay, she said. Your daddy goes to the top of the tenants list. Barking happily now, Charlie Boyd Jr. escorted her the rest of the way to her front door but he wouldn't come inside with her. As she fitted her key in the lock, the shepherd's ears pricked up, and by the time she got the door open, he'd turned tail and was trotting around the side of the house to his makeshift kennel in the garage, leaving Letitia to face Hecate alone. Thursday. Mr. Wilkins, an old friend of Mama's who managed a Salvation Army store, was coming by to see what furniture Letitia still needed. He'd offered to deliver whatever she required in exchange for Letitia giving his mother a room with the first six months rent free. Letitia was confident she could bargain that down to three months. But even so, she had to be careful. She was running out of rooms to trade for favors. While she waited for Mr. Wilkins, she sat in the dining room, dealing out practice poker hands, a peculiar form of devotion her father had taught her. Warren Dandridge had insisted that poker was a Christian game, Players who practice virtue, learning and respecting the odds, 
keeping their emotions in check, managing their bankrolls intelligently, tended to prosper, while those who succumbed to vice, chasing long shots, letting passion rule reason, went the way of all unrepentant sinners. The Baptists he'd grown up with hadn't much care for this way of thinking, especially after he took five hundred dollars off a minister's son who tried to bluff a busted straight draw. By the time he met Mama, he'd learned never to play against anyone he might share a pew with. Instead, like an itinerant preacher, he made his living on the road, traveling a circuit of back rooms and illegal gambling clubs. He played virtuously and strove against the unholy trinity of cheats, thieves, and police. He came home bloody and bruised sometimes, but he came home with cash in pocket. He provided for his family. One day in 1944, he was playing in a basement casino in Detroit when the place was raided. The casino had a back exit that the cops had somehow missed, and in the confusion, he and a friend managed to slip out and escape. They were a block away, still running, when they passed an off-duty patrolman coming out of a bar. The patrolman knew nothing about the raid, but he went for his gun anyway and shot Warren Dandridge in the back, killing him. Letitia still missed her father terribly, but she knew he was looking down on her, and with a deck of cards, she could call him back to earth any time she wanted. As she dealt the cards onto the table, she heard his voice in her ear, laying out the parameters of each hand, the game, the stakes, the size of the pot, her position relative to the other players, and then asking the question, what would a good Christian do here? And Letitia would answer, smiling, sensing him beside her, nodding his approval. She gathered up the cards and was reshuffling them when she felt another presence behind her. She didn't turn around. Hello, Mr. Winthrop, she said. You play poker? No answer. But the goosebumps on her neck told her he was standing very close. She'd feel his breath if he still drew it. Letitia gave the deck one more shuffle and dealt a hand. Three of diamonds, three of clubs, six of clubs, six of hearts, seven of spades. Straight draw, two-four limit with one and two-dollar blinds, she said. Pots opened in front of you, and there's four other players behind. You stay in or fold. A tingle of electricity in the air. The seven of spades twitched on the table, separating itself from the two pairs. Uh-uh, Letitia said. You're only going to make the full house one time out of twelve, and when you don't, the seven of spades twitched again. Okay, if you want to go broke. She dealt another card. The six of diamonds. Hmm. Letitia picked the card up, checked the back for marks. There were none, but maybe you didn't need any. Interesting. I was going to invite you to sit down, but maybe we need to find a game where peeking won't help. How about checkers? You ever play that with your boy? My daddy. An invisible fist pounded the tabletop. The deck was wrenched violently from her hands, cards flying into the air. What? Letitia cried. What'd I say? Thud. It sounded like a bird flying into the front window. Letitia turned to see a clump of what looked like mud splattered across the panes and dripping down onto the sill, a second, larger clod burst against the upper sash, making the glass shudder. As Letitia pushed her chair back and stood up, she heard Claude striking other windows as well, splatting against the brickwork. By the time she got out into the atrium, the noise had become continuous, a storm of brown hail bombarding the front of the Winthrop house. She opened the front door and was assaulted by the reek of manure. Two farm trucks idled in the street, Hooded figures stood in the open back of each, reaching into big buckets of fresh cow shit. One of them pointed at Letitia, and they concentrated their fire. Letitia, ducking back only just in time, cow patties exploding against the shutting door. Charlie Boyd Jr. came tearing around the side of the house and was met by a barrage of shit clods. A lucky throw caught him between the eyes, turning his barks to yelps of anguish. The bombardment continued. Letitia ran up the stairs. She had her hand on the shotgun when she heard glass breaking in one of the front bedrooms. She prayed it wasn't the one with the bed already in it. Then she heard the truck's motor revving up. No, she shouted, dashing back down to the atrium. She yanked the front door open and went out, feet skidding in the manure now mounted on the doorstep. 
come back here, she called. You come back here. She ran into the street after the trucks and raised the gun to her shoulder. Most of the vandals saw her coming and ducked down, but one of them was facing the wrong way, and for a moment, she had a clear shot, the gun's twin barrels aligning perfectly with the space between the hooded figure's shoulder blades. Then time seemed to stop, and Letitia heard her father's voice again, reminding her of the rules of this particular game. Who could be shot in the back with impunity, and who couldn't? And what lay at stake if you confused the two? The moment passed. Letitia lowered the gun without firing, and the figure whose life she just spared laughed at her and waved as the trucks rolled away down the street. Inside the Winthrop house, the telephone began to ring. It rang a dozen times before Letitia heard it over the pounding of blood in her ears, and a dozen times more before she walked stiff-legged to pick it up. Heavy breathing on the line. Who is this? Letitia said. A male voice answered. This is the only warning you're going to get. Next time, we're coming inside. He hung up. Letitia put the phone down and walked in blind circles of rage, her legs finally carrying her back to the dining room. On the dining room table, the scattered playing cards had been gathered and stacked neatly to one side. A chessboard Letitia had never seen before had been set up with the black pieces on her side of the table. The white king's pawn was already advanced two squares from its starting position. Letitia stared unblinking at the board for a long time. Then she leaned the shotgun carefully against the wall and sat down and put her elbows on the table and propped her chin in her hands. All right, she said, nodding. All right. And then she said, What do you want to play for? Friday, dusk. They came in through the kitchen. The silence that had lain on the house since just before sunset was broken by the smash and tinkle of glass as a crowbar knocked out the window pane above the sink. A boy wearing a grain sack for a hood and work gloves that still stank faintly of manure pulled himself up into the window. Crouching unsteadily with one foot on the sill and the other on the back edge of the sink, he pulled a snub-nosed revolver from beneath his belt. The thirty-eight, which had seemed so potent when he'd taken it from his father's dresser, now felt small and ineffectual, and his hand shook as he extended it in front of him, expecting the German shepherd to come leaping from the shadows. The shepherd did not come leaping. Worried that the grain sack was interfering with his hearing, the boy pulled it off, exposing a head of blonde hair. Behind him in the alley, a voice whispered hoarsely, Jesus, Dougie! Shut up, he said. He listened to the house. Nothing. With his finger on the trigger of the revolver, he climbed down clumsily from the sink, in the process nearly shooting himself in the thigh. The back door was locked and bolted. The bolt was stuck, and he had to hammer it open, making a god-awful racket and chipping the revolver's grip. He opened the door, and two other boys came in, one carrying a gasoline can, and the other the crowbar. Where's that fucking dog? The boy with the gas can said. I don't know, said the blonde boy. I thought it'd be out back. Maybe she took it with her. She didn't take it with her, said the boy with the crowbar. I told you, she drove off with some other nigger an hour ago. The dog wasn't in the car. Well, it's not in here. Relaxing, eyes adjusted to the dimness, the blonde boy surveyed the kitchen, so much larger than the one in his own house. You believe this place? Trailing his hand along a countertop, he went over to the dining room door. Tucky, where are you going? said the boy with a gas can. Let's get this over with. I want to look around first. Dougie? But the blonde boy went into the dining room, and after a moment, the boy with the gas can followed him. The boy with the crowbar started to follow as well, but as he crossed the kitchen, he felt a sudden draft. The blonde boy continued through the dining room into the atrium. At his first glimpse of Hecate, he started and swung the revolver up. But then he laughed. What is that? said the boy with the gas can. He pulled off his hood and squinted at the goddess. Is that some kind of voodoo thing? Together they walked forward until they were standing directly in front of Hecate, the blonde boy grinning, the other boy frowning. Come on, Dougie, 
Let's torch the place and get out of here. Relax, said the blonde boy. Where's Darren? I don't know. He was right behind me. Go get him. The other boy sighed with exasperation, but then he set the gas can on the floor and turned and walked back to the kitchen. The blonde boy stepped into the dry fountain pool. He looked up smiling into Hecate's face and reached out a hand to cut one of her breasts. Hey, babe, he said. He heard a sharp hiss, and something nipped him in the shin. He yelped, more in surprise than pain, and stumbled back, tripping over the marble ring. He fell hard and sprang up again, scrambling for the gun, which he had dropped, thinking the dog. But there was no dog, only Hecate, motionless on her pedestal. Ronnie, he called. Darren, where the hell are you guys? Beneath the gallery, the elevator gate rattled open. The boy ducked sideways to get a clear view of it, but the elevator was a well of darkness among shadows. Who's there? He said. Darren? Don't screw around. I'll blow your damn head off. Something was there. Not Darren. Not Ronnie. Not the dog. Suddenly, he wanted very badly to run, but he looked down and saw to his horror that his feet were sliding forward, gliding over the tile as though the floor were greased. No, he said. No way. And he raised his arm to fire, but the thirty-eight flew from his grasp, and then hands were on him, a grip of iron, dragging him screaming into the darkness. They came home late and laughing. Atticus's Colorado trip had gone well enough for George to slip him a little extra cash, and he decided to spend the bonus taking Letitia out on the town. They'd had dinner and gone dancing. Letitia was flying high as they rounded the corner, but the sight of the fire truck in front of the Winthrop house sobered her instantly. Atticus barely had a chance to slow down before she was out of the car and running for the front door. Inside the house, all the lights were on, and men in uniform were nosing around. A policeman turned from ogling the fountain to challenge her. Who the hell are you? I live here, Letitia said. What's going on? You work here? You the maid? I live here. Both the first and second floor elevator gates were open, and a pair of firemen were up on the gallery, looking down into the shaft. The elevator itself was between the two floors, with the bottom of the car suspended just below the top of the ground floor doorway. A blonde head stuck out through the narrow gap on the verge of being guillotined. Letitia, who'd seen a similar gruesome accident in a housing project once, thought the blonde boy might already be dead, his throat crushed. But then one of the firemen jumped down, none too delicately, onto the roof of the elevator car, and the jostling brought the boy to life, screaming hysterically. Atticus entered as the screams were trailing off into whimpers. What happened? Kid broke in to vandalize the place, the policeman said, indicating the gas can on the floor. Not sure how he got himself stuck but one of the neighbors heard him howling and called us. I want him arrested, Letitia said, and charged. Don't worry, we'll charge him. The policeman looked at Atticus. Is this really your house? Her house, said Atticus. And you just moved in, right? The policeman eyed the gas can and nodded to himself. You mind my asking how you managed to afford a place like this? Yeah, said Letitia. I mind. Another policeman emerged from the dining room. We found two more in the basement, he announced. In the basement, said the first policeman. Are they? No, they're alive, more or less. The second policeman grinned. White as sheets and covered in bug bites, but still breathing. He paused to flick something from his sleeve, then jerked a thumb at Letitia and Atticus. Who's this? The help? Rents due the first of the month. Letitia said. You have use of the kitchen, laundry room, and up and downstairs bathrooms. The basement's off limits, and so's the corner room upstairs marked private. The new tenant, Mr. Fox, stood nodding in the dining room doorway. From behind him came a stamp of hard-soled shoes hopscotching on the atrium tile. Celia, he said. It's all right, said Letitia. Your room is next to Mrs. Wilkins. She's hard of hearing, so noise doesn't bother her, and she loves children. If you need someone to watch your daughter while you're at work, I'm sure she'd be glad to. Mr. Fox nodded again. He gestured at the chess set on the table. 
That's your game? Yeah. Black has checkmate in three. I know, Letitia said. I'm just waiting for my opponent to figure that out. You play? No, a man, Mr. Fox said. A little gin rummy, too. Letitia smiled. You've come to the right house, then. Why don't you and your daughter go take a look at your room? Just turn right off the top of the stairs and follow the hall. It's the room with the green curtains. I'll be up in a minute. Mr. Fox nodded once more and turned away, calling his daughter's name. Letitia stood up and went to the window. A moving van was parked in front of the cottage across the street, and two of the other houses had for sale signs on their lawns. Bye-bye, Letitia said waving, and behind her, on the chessboard, the White King tottered and fell. Mr. Archibald, the realtor, leaving his office for the night, found Atticus standing out in the hall. Yes? Atticus Turner, Atticus said. I'm a friend of Letitia Dandridge's. She bought the Winthrop house? Mr. Archibald locked his office door and slipped the key in his pocket. I'm afraid I don't have any other properties like that one, he said. But if you'd like to come back during business hours, I'm not in the market. No? Then I'm not sure how I can help you. It's about the Winthrop House. I have a question. I'm sorry, said Mr. Archibald. If Miss Dandridge has a concern, she knows how to contact me. But I don't know you. Now, if you'll excuse me. Rather than step aside, Atticus widened his stance. There's a picture of the Winthrops on the dining room wall, he said. Something about it's been nagging at me, but I couldn't put my finger on what. Then yesterday, I found this box of other photographs down in the basement, and I figured out what the problem is. In the dining room photo, you can't see Mr. Winthrop's right hand. As he said this, he looked at Mr. Archibald's hands, which were small and pale and unadorned by even a wedding band. In some of the other pictures, though, you can. You see the big silver ring he wore? And then there's this. He brought out a picture showing two men in front of a shiny black roadster. Assuming that's a new model Ford, I'd say this was taken about twenty years ago. And the man with Mr. Winthrop looks an awful lot like Samuel Braithwaite. You familiar with that name? The realtor didn't even glance at the photo. Get out of my way, Mr. Turner. Penumbra Real Estate, Atticus said. Is that a Braithwaite family company? Or is it owned by the order? And which do you work for? I'll ask you to move one more time. Then I'm going into my office and calling the police. Atticus sidestepped just enough for Mr. Archibald to squeeze past him. The realtor moved swiftly down the hall, and it reached the elevator when Atticus said, I spoke to Mr. Bailey, too. The realtor paused, his finger on the call button. He does know you, Atticus continued, and he admitted to doing the occasional deal with you, but he was real surprised to hear you described him as a partner. That day Letitia and Ruby were supposed to meet with him? He says he never called you. Turns out the cops grabbed him on his way over here and kept him handcuffed in the back of a patrol car for two hours, asking him about some liquor store robbery. Meantime, you stepped in and stole his customers. He's still pretty upset about that. Not too upset to take his share of the commission, Mr. Archibald said. Yeah, he said you cut him in to keep him quiet. But he's still thinking about reporting you to the Realtors Association. Trouble is, he'd think they'd be less concerned about you cheating Negroes than doing business with them in the first place. The way of the world, said Mr. Archibald, pressing the elevator button. Still, what does it matter? Hal and I both have our money, and your friend has a very nice house. Everyone's happy. For now, said Atticus. But you need to tell Caleb Braithwaite that whatever he's up to, his business is with me. Letitia's not a part of it. I don't know what you're talking about, Mr. Turner. Yeah, you do. And there's something else you should know. I looked up your home address in the phone book. Can't say I've been to the neighborhood before, but if anything were to happen to Letitia, I'm sure I could find my way. The elevator arrived. Mr. Archibald remained in the hallway a moment more, mouth open, groping vainly for a retort. Then, like a ghost, he was gone. Abdullah's Book As to my freedom, 
which you say I can have. There's nothing to be gained on that score, as I got my free papers in 1864 from the Provost Marshal General of the Department of Nashville. Mandy says she would be afraid to go back without some proof that you were sincerely disposed to treat us justly and kindly, and we have concluded to test your sincerity by asking you to send us our wages for the time we served you. At $25 a month for me and $2 a week for Mandy, our earnings would amount to $11,680. Add to this the interest for the time our wages has been kept back and deduct what you have paid for our clothing and three doctor visits to me, and pulling a tooth for Mandy, and the balance will show what we are in justice entitled to. Please send the money by Adams Express in care of V. Winters, Esquire, Dayton, Ohio. Letter from Jordan Anderson to his former owner, August 7, 1865. The Monday before Thanksgiving, George and Montrose went to the bank to retrieve the Book of Days. The book was a ledger that contained a full accounting of their great-grandmother Ada's servitude, the labor she'd performed, the indignities she'd suffered, and the wages and penalties she was owed. Ada had died in 1902, but the family continued to keep the book, meeting annually to calculate and record the interest on the still unpaid debt. Every year, after adding a new line to the ledger, they tell the story of how the book had come to be, how Ada had been born into slavery on a Georgia plantation in 1840, how at the age of seven she'd been set to work in the fields, how she had toiled there until November 22, 1864, when Union soldiers with torches had arrived at the plantation gate, how she had then become one of the thousands of ex-slaves following in the wake of Sherman's army, how in February of 1865, sick with typhoid, she'd been consigned to a hospital camp set up in an old sanitarium outside Savannah, how, through the haze of her fever, she'd gradually come to realize that the sanitarium was not a place of healing, but a death trap meant to reduce the population of freed Negroes, how, still ill, she and another former slave named Noah Pridewell had contrived to escape, how they'd made their way west, coming after many more trials to Oklahoma, where they settled and married, and how finally, in 1878, on the 14th anniversary of her emancipation, she began working on the book. Ada's daughter Ruth did most of the actual writing. Though Ada had learned to read, she had no penmanship. What she did have was perfect recall. By concentrating on a given date, she could summon a memory of everything she had done and everything done to her from the moment she woke up until the moment she fell asleep. Ruth recorded each day's labors on a separate line in the ledger. Where appropriate, Ada added, in her own hand, symbols representing insults she'd suffered, whippings, beatings, other. In the matter of wages, Ada deferred to the wisdom of her old master, Gilchrist Burns. Burns was in the habit of renting out his slaves when they weren't needed on the plantation, and he made no secret of what he charged, so the slaves all knew exactly how much he valued their labor. As a child, Ada earned twenty cents for a full day's work, by age 16, she was up to a dollar a day, the same as a male field hand, Master Burns being remarkably egalitarian when it came to money destined for his own pocket. For the penalties, Ada consulted her Bible. She charged $27.26 for each whipping, chapter 27, verse 26, being the verse in Matthew's Gospel where the Savior was flogged. Her price for the most common of the other insults, $22 and a quarter, was based in Deuteronomy. Ruth entered the figures in neat columns, subtotaled and summed them. The final tally, after the subtraction of living expenses, but before interest, came to $8,817.29. A small fortune at the time. But for Ada, it was the count of days that carried the greater significance. Holding the completed book in her hand, she realized that she performed a kind of exorcism. Though her memories of slavery remained as sharp as ever, their weight had been transferred to the ledger's pages. Now doubly and truly freed, she set about living the remainder of her life with a peace she hadn't known before. The book itself went to Ruth, who spent the next quarter century trying unsuccessfully to collect the money. The surviving members of the White Burns clan felt that their responsibility had ended with the destruction of the plantation, and they ignored Ruth's letters, as did eleven governors of Georgia and six U.S. presidents. Eventually, Ruth passed the book on to her eldest daughter, Lucy, who passed it, in turn, to George. 
Horace would be the book's next steward, unless Montrose, who had appointed himself deputy bookkeeper at the age of five, pried it from George's dead hands first. As for George and Montrose's sister Ophelia, the middle child, she'd long ago removed herself from the line of succession. She'd be there for Thanksgiving, with a pen. Out of the three of them, she'd always had the cleanest hand, but the safekeeping of the book she left to her brothers. She knew they would never let anything happen to it. George and Montrose met outside the bank at noon, having come by separate routes. This had been standard procedure since 1946, when, driving together to pick up the book the day before Thanksgiving, they'd been stopped by police, and one thing leading to another had been hauled to the precinct house, where only a hefty bribe had sufficed to get them out before the bank closed for the holiday. Today, both their journeys had been uneventful, but as they entered the bank, they could tell that something was amiss. The lobby was packed. Unusually so, even for a lunch hour, with lines snaking from the teller's windows all the way to the door, and where ordinarily the bank's manager, Ben Rosenfeld, would have been out on the floor to greet them, today they were met by a security guard, Whitey Dunlap. What's going on, Whitey? George asked. Looking across the lobby, he could see the blinds were drawn on both the manager's and assistant manager's offices. Cops were in earlier, Whitey explained keeping his voice low. Detectives from the organized crime squad. What did they want? said Montrose. Whitey shrugged. They had me posted out on the sidewalk, so I don't really know, but we were an hour late opening, and a rumor got started. There was a run on the bank. Mr. Rosenfeld's been on the phone with depositors all morning, trying to calm things down. He said to say he's sorry he can't serve you personally, but I can take care of you. The safe deposit vault was in the basement. Whitey unlocked the vault door and ushered them inside, then stooped to pick a cigar butt off the floor. Frowning, he checked the corners of the vault, as if the litter bug might still be present. George got his deposit box key out. You mind, Whitey? Sure. Holding the cigar butt pinched between two fingers, Whitey fished out his own key. As George withdrew the box from its slot in the wall, Montrose stood close, ready to leap in if George suffered a sudden stroke or got raptured away. He saw George's expression change as George realized the box was light. What? said Montrose. George lifted the box lid. Inside was the leather folder that contained the Berry family's 1833 emancipation papers, along with other, more recent documents, like Horace's birth certificate. But the Book of Days, which should have been lying on top of it, was missing, and in its place was a terse handwritten note. The Witch's Hammer 750 West Berwick Street, at your earliest convenience. Son of a bitch, said Montrose. The note was signed with the half-sun symbol of the Order of the Ancient Dawn. They went together, in George's packet. Tell me you brought the gun, Montrose said as George was getting the car started. Under my seat, George replied. But when Montrose tried to reach for it, George checked him. I'll handle it. You're going to shoot him? I'm going to get Ada's book back. He resisted the urge to point out that Montrose had already had his chance to shoot Caleb Braithwaite, and it hadn't gone so well. You want to help? Get my city map from the glove box and find that address. Grumbling, Montrose complied. George tried to be patient with his brother. And that was how he thought of Montrose, how he always introduced him to people, as his brother, not his half-brother. Kinship being, to George's way of thinking, an in or out proposition. Still, the fact of their different fathers was inescapable at times, and never so much as in the matter of Ada's book. The Berries had been blessed, their last owner, Lucius Berry, being one of the rare true Christians salted among the ranks of the so-called faithful. Lucius's parents and siblings had died in the 1832 cholera epidemic, leaving him sole ownership of the family tobacco farm and the seven human beings who worked it, interpreting the epidemic as divine confirmation of what his conscience already knew, Lucius set out to atone for his family's sin. He sold off the rest of his inheritance, put his slaves into wagons, and escorted them safely out west, where he gave them not just their freedom, but money and land to make a new start, proving that such an act was indeed possible. Blessed didn't, of course, mean free of all suffering, 
the emancipated berries still had their share of tribulations. One of the original seven was murdered by white settlers who objected to sharing a property line with a colored man, and out of the first generation of freeborn berries, three sons and a daughter were lost to the Civil War. And then there was George's father, Jacob Berry, a successful businessman, dead at age 24, his prosperity no shield against the asthma that plagued him all his short life. George had been only three, and Ophelia still a baby, when a cloud of dust, stirred up by a passing horse cart, sent Jacob Barry's lungs into their final fatal spasm. After her first husband's death, Lucy Barry married Ulysses Turner, a man with a very different family history. The Turners, George's stepfather never tired of saying, had been given nothing. Not freedom, not even their name. Ulysses' grandfather had been born Simon Swinsgood on the Swinsgood Plantation in North Carolina. In 1857, he'd escaped into the Great Dismal Swamp, where he lived as a maroon for six years before emerging to join the Union Army. It was while in the swamp that he'd taken the name Nat Turner, a popular sobriquet among the maroons, and one that had to be earned through feats of prowess, like killing slave catchers and raiding white settlements, or so the story, as told by Ulysses, went. In hindsight, George recognized these tales of great-grandpa Turner's exploits as his first exposure to pulp fiction, which was not to say they were fantasy, only that they were more inspired by actual events than gospel truth. But Montrose believed every word, and it was no surprise that he grew up thinking a Turner, not a Barry, ought to be the guardian of Ada's book. George knew his stepfather shared Montrose's opinion. The man made no secret of his disdain for how easy the Barrys had had it, or of his belief that George had been born soft. But as a Turner, he was bound to respect certain traditions, and so it transpired that on the last night of May 1921, the night White Tulsa declared war on Black Tulsa, Ulysses allowed George, against his mother's wishes, to go and rescue Ada's book from the safe in Ulysses' shop on Archer Street, even as the first wave of white arsonists were crossing the railroad tracks. Because of the other events of that awful night, George never bragged about what he'd done, never tried to hold it over Montrose's head, but he knew he'd proved himself, and he knew Montrose knew it too. Berwick Street, Montrose said now, showing him on the map. It's up in Lakeview. All right, George said. Hang on. He sped north, driving in a way no colored man should drive when headed into white Chicago. But the enchantment laid on the Packard in Artem still held, causing traffic cops and patrolmen to either avert their eyes from the car or stare straight through it, which would have been gratifying, George reflected, if not for the knowledge that he was using Caleb Braithwaite's magic to do Caleb Braithwaite's bidding. The sign outside the witch's hammer showed a tall, hatted Puritan burning a woman at the stake. The building would have been easy to overlook otherwise. Blank brick face with a high-set row of glass blocks in lieu of a front window. Steel door painted to match the brick, the kind of place that would have, and maybe had, made a good location for a prohibition speakeasy. George got out of the car holding the pistol at his side. Montrose opened the back of the Packard and armed himself with a tire iron. A handwritten note, taped above the door handle, said the witch's hammer was closed for private function, but the door wasn't locked. With Montrose at his heel, George went inside, into a long, low-ceilinged bar room. Caleb Braithwaite was seated at a table in the middle of the room with another white man, who was in the process of lighting a cigar, the cigar man was a big, thick-set bruiser, with graying brown hair styled in a flat top. His nose looked like it had been broken more than once in the past, and the burst capillaries in his cheeks spoke of decades of heavy drinking. But the blue eyes that regarded George and Montrose through a haze of smoke were alert and intelligent. Two more white men stood leaning against the bar. They removed their jackets, exposing matching shoulder holsters and police stars pinned to their vests, Sandwiched between them was a Negro man with his head bowed, hands cuffed in front of him. George almost didn't recognize his nephew, who was supposed to be in Iowa today on a research trip for the guide. Atticus looked up, embarrassed. Hi, Uncle George, he said. George Barry and Montrose Turner, Caleb Braithwaite said, these are Detectives Burke and Noble. He nodded at the men, bracketing Atticus, 
and Captain Lancaster of the Mayor's Commission on Organized Crime. Captain Lancaster also hits the local chapter of the order. We've been negotiating a merger of the Artem and Chicago Lodges, and as part of that, we've decided to pool our resources on a research project, one that I'd like you to help us with. George barely heard the words. Atticus's presence had caught him off guard, as it was no doubt intended to. In his confusion, he let his thumb stray to the hammer of the pistol he was holding. It was the tiniest of gestures, but the detectives reacted by reaching for their own guns, and Captain Lancaster slipped a beefy hand into his jacket. Gentlemen, Braithwaite said softly, making everyone pause. Let's not be hasty. Captain Lancaster, I think I saw a bottle of forty-year-old Dalmore in the back room. Why don't you and your men go help yourselves, while I explain matters to Mr. Barry and Mr. Turner? You sure? The captain said. We'll be fine, smiling. We're all friends here. Captain Lancaster stood up and pointed a warning finger at George. Then he nodded to the detectives, and the three of them left the room. So, Caleb Braithwaite said, Let's get the ground rules out of the way. Violence won't work. I have immunity. He looked George in the eye. You can't shoot me. Or hit me. He shifted his gaze to Montrose, who was straining fruitlessly to raise the tire iron above the level of his waist. And even if you could, it wouldn't get Ada's book back. Now, if all that's clear, let's see if we can deal with one another like civilized people. Turning finally to Atticus, Braithwaite unlocked the cuffs with a wave of his hand. What is it you want? George said. A trade, said Caleb Braithwaite. A book for a book. What I was saying just now, about merging the two lodges, this isn't the first time that's been attempted. In the 1930s, my father tried to reach a similar arrangement with a former lodge master of Chicago. Hiram Winthrop, Atticus guessed. Braithwaite nodded. It didn't work out, and it ended the way things usually do when powerful men can't come to terms. What's that got to do with the book, said George. Winthrop was an explorer. He traveled to some very interesting places and brought things back with him. One of the most valuable was a book, written in the language of Adam. A magic book. A treatise on natural philosophy. A rough English translation of the title would be the Book of Naming, or the Book of Names. Atticus raised an eyebrow. The Necronomicon. Braithwaite smiled. That would be a book of dead names. The Book of Names is just the opposite. Its subject is life. Transformation. Genesis. So what happened to it? George asked. After Hiram Winthrop's death, my father managed to acquire a number of his former possessions, but the book wasn't among them. My father assumed Winthrop had hidden it somewhere. Unfortunately, Chicago had become unsafe for him by that point, so he wasn't able to conduct a thorough search. But your new friends, they know where it is. According to Captain Lancaster, the book is in the Museum of Natural History. Hiram Winthrop was on the board, and he apparently had a secret room installed. So why not just go get it then? Braithwaite glanced over his shoulder at the door to the back room. Then he said in a low voice, The captain's being cagey about it, but I know he hasn't been lodge master for very long, and nobody wants to talk about what happened to the previous lodge master. Anyway, the deal is, he shows me the entrance to the secret room, and I go in and get the book. Or find someone to get it for you, George concluded. And if we say no, then you've got till Thursday, Braithwaite said, shrugging to decide how to break the bad news to the rest of the family. That night was the scheduled monthly meeting of the Prince Hall Freemasons. With the holiday coming up, attendance was expected to be light, but the large secretary, Abdullah Muhammad, was required to be there, and Abdullah, his given name was Percy Jones, had a cousin who worked as a night watchman at the Natural History Museum. George and Montrose showed up early, hoping to talk to Abdullah before the meeting, but Abdullah arrived only just on time, having stopped to pick up the lodge master, Joe Bartholomew, who everyone called Pirate Joe for the eye patch he wore. 
one member who did show up early was Mortimer Dupree. Mortimer was a dentist who had, in the words of Montrose, got hypnotized by the pyramid on the back of the dollar bill. Of course, there were a lot of people with romantic misconceptions about Freemasonry. Those who joined learned to embrace it as the social club, charity, and mutual aid organization that it actually was, or quit in disillusionment when they found out they weren't going to become secret masters of the universe. Mortimer had chosen the former course, but still clung to the hope that there was a Masonic inner circle that ordinary Masons weren't told about, and that one day he'd get a tap on the shoulder. Meanwhile, he did what he could to demonstrate himself worthy. Lodge meetings typically included a lecture for the edification of the membership. In the past, George had spoken about the practicalities of growing and expanding a business, and Montrose had given a talk on genealogical research. Mortimer's lectures tended to more occult subject matter, like the mysterious moving coffins of Barbados or the Nazca lines of Peru. Tonight, when George and Montrose arrived, he was setting up a scale model of King Tut's tomb, complete with figurines of Howard Carter and Lord Carnarvon. Ordinarily, George would have been happy to hear a story about the mummy's curse, but tonight he had other priorities. So as soon as the meeting got underway, he moved to suspend regular business so he could make a special appeal for aid. The motion was granted, but soon enough, George realized his error, for though he spoke of Caleb Braithwaite in as mundane a way as possible, he could see Mortimer getting more and more excited. And when he got to the Book of Names, Mortimer immediately drew the same connection Atticus had and blurted it out, to the confusion of those present who were unfamiliar with the works of H.P. Lovecraft. The Necronomicon, said Pirate Joe. What's that? A book of black magic, Mortimer said enthusiastically, written by the mad Arab Abdul al-Hazrid, the stuttering Arab, more like, said Abdullah. Abdal, not Abdul. Abd means servant, and al is the, so Abd al al Hazrid would be servant of the the Hazrid. Piper Joe blinked his eye. What's a Hazrid? A white guy from Rhode Island trying to be funny, said Montrose. Forget the Necronomicon, George said impatiently. This is about a real book. A real magic book, said Abdullah. Well, supposedly. Meaning what? You don't believe his magic? It doesn't matter. It does to me. Abdullah pressed a hand to his chest. Abd Allah, servant of God. There's a lot I'll do for a lot, Brother George. But one thing I won't be party to is making an evil man more powerful. It sounds like this Caleb Braithwaite is bad enough already. He is, George said which is why we're not actually going to give him the book, the way it's supposed to go. Montrose, my nephew and I, meet Braithwaite and his friends on Wednesday, after the museum closes. They take us inside, show us where the secret room is, and we go in and get this book of names. But what I want to do is go in early, tomorrow night, and find the room and the book of names ahead of time. And then, and then, said Mortimer, You swap in a decoy, a fake book of names, which you find on Wednesday and give to Braithwaite in exchange for your great-grandma Ada's book. George looked at him crossly. Yeah, he acknowledged. But where do you get a fake book of names from? Pirate Joe wanted to know. I'm still working on that, George said. The thing is, we know that Winthrop, the guy who hid the book, was serious about keeping Braithwaite's father from getting his hands on it. So who's to say this whole secret room isn't a decoy? The way I figure it, it's okay if Braithwaite realizes the book we give him is fake, as long as he believes the fake came from Winthrop. You hope, said Abdullah. What if he sees through you? Or what if he buys it, but decides to hang on to your great-grandma's book until you find the real secret room? That's like six bridges ahead, George said. I'll cross it when I come to it. Better to resist temptation by avoiding it altogether, Abdullah suggested. Let's play it this way. I'll get my cousin to let you into the museum tomorrow, but I'm coming with you. If we find the book of names, you give it to me. What are you going to do with it? That building on Calumet where we just opened a new prayer room? It's got an incinerator in the basement. Worst comes to worst, 
You can tell Braithwaite that Abdul Ahazret went back to memorizing the Quran. George didn't like it, but he could see Abdullah was prepared to stand firm on this, and maybe he was right to. Okay, George said. The book's yours, if we find it, but... Mortimer interrupted again. This is great, he said, rubbing his hands together. What time do we meet up at the museum? You couldn't just tell him no, Atticus said. He's a brother of the lodge, George replied. Not the steadiest brick in the pile, maybe, added Montrose. Quarter to midnight, and the three of them huddled by the staff entrance on the museum's east side, watching Mortimer Dupree make his way towards them. Rather than follow the sidewalk, Mortimer opted to use the landscaping as cover, darting from tree to tree in a manner that would surely have raised the suspicions of any passers-by. Fortunately, between the late hour and the near-freezing temperatures, the area was deserted. Nice outfit, Montrose said when Mortimer finally reached them. The dentist had on black shoes and trousers, a black pullover sweater and black wool cap, and black suede gloves. Slung over his shoulder on a strap was a bulging black bag, which rattled. Those your burglar tools? Be prepared, Mortimer said. He pointed at the more modest bag George was holding. Did you get the decoy? Yeah, George said. It's a Hebrew encyclopedia of Kabbalah, in a nice old binding. He pulled the book out so Mortimer could see. We got it at Thurber Lang's shop, closest thing to a real magic book he had. It doesn't matter how nice the binding is, Montrose noted, not for the first time. Braithwaite's going to know it's not right. Of course he is, said George, but that's okay, as long as he doesn't figure out we made the switch. Yeah, so you keep saying. We just have to sell it right when we give it to him. You should have let me booby trap it, Montrose said. Have it blow up in his face when he opens it. See if he's immune to that. Abdullah and Pirate Joe arrived just before midnight. Abdullah led the group down a flight of steps to a basement door marked employees only. At 12.01, the door opened, and Abdullah's cousin looked out frowning. What the hell, Percy? He said. You brought the whole club with you? Hey, Bradley, said Abdullah, remember that time you got evicted and the sheriff gave you an hour to move all your stuff out? I don't recall you complaining when I came by with a big crew then. Well, that was that, and this is this, Bradley said. But he stepped back from the doorway and waved them inside. Quiet as the grave until we get upstairs, he said. He ushered them through a locker room and down a hallway, past a half-open door marked security. A radio was playing inside the security office. They heard a rustle of newspaper pages, and then a white man's voice said, Fucking Irish cunts! Bradley put a finger to his lips. They continued on, on tiptoe, to the end of the hall and up a flight of stairs, emerging in the museum gift shop. My supervisor, Mr. Miller, Bradley said, judging they were safely out of earshot. Most nights he doesn't leave the office except to use the toilet but every now and then he likes to check I'm not goofing off on my rounds. He thinks it's real funny to jump out and go boo, too, so I don't always hear him coming. Don't worry, we won't let him sneak up on us, Abdullah said. Uh-huh, said Bradley. Tell me about this secret room you're looking for. You even know what part of the museum it's supposed to be in? Abdullah turned to George. Montrose and I went through the museum's annual reports at the library this morning, George said. There were a few different renovation projects during the years Hiram Winthrop was on the board, but we think the one we're interested in was in 1925. Winthrop sponsored and led an expedition to the Sudan that year, and when he got back, he oversaw the installation of a new exhibition hall. Assuming that's when he put in the secret room, we want to look in the northwest corner of the building, on the second floor. Second floor, northwest corner, Bradley nodded. That's good. Mr. Miller doesn't like to walk that far. They crossed the museum's central concourse and went up to the second-floor gallery. The hall that had once housed Winthrop's Sudan exhibition was now home to a collection of zoological specimens from the Amazon. Bradley left them at the entrance, beside a display case filled with hand-sized tarantulas. I'm going back downstairs to do my rounds, he said. I'll check on you in half an hour. Try not to make too much noise. Eyeing Mortimer in his burglar's outfit, and don't mess with any of the exhibits? 
Don't worry about it, Mortimer said. They spread out, searching for secret panels and trap doors. They found nothing in the exhibition hall itself, but at the hall's west end was an L-shaped passage that connected to another room. A tile mosaic on the passage wall depicted a pink stone archway in the middle of a desert. Blue sky and sand surrounded the arch, while the door-sized space within it was a dull and featureless black. That's got to be it, Atticus said. The sides of the arch were decorated with hieroglyphs, but the symbols on the keystone were individual letters, and he recognized the alphabet. That's the language of Adam. Must have to press one of the tiles to open it, said Mortimer. He stepped forward and went up on tiptoe to reach the keystone, but the tile was firmly fixed and wouldn't push in. Pirate Joe pointed at another tile on the right side of the arch, whose hieroglyph showed a man holding an ankh like a key. Try that one. The ankh tile didn't work either. Abdullah and George offered additional suggestions until Montrose grew frustrated. Stop poking at it, he said. We got to be systematic about this. What if it's more than one tile? Pirate Joe said. What if you got to press two at once? Or three, even? Then we're going to be here all night, George said. But if that's what it takes. The snick of a knife blade got everyone's attention. The Freemasons turned to find Atticus slitting his thumb. What are you doing? said Abdullah. Drawing a little natural philosophy, Atticus said. It's a long story. He moved to the front of the group and drew a line in blood across the keystone, taking care to touch every one of the letters. The tile soaked up the blood almost instantly, and as the stain faded, the hue of the keystone brightened. The brightness spread to the other tiles in the arch, while the dark tiles began to blur and flow together. The darkness grew vivid, acquired depth until, in a moment of seamless transition, what had been just a suggestion of an opening became an actual hole in the wall. When the process was complete, Abdullah was the first to speak. Northwest corner of the building, he said. And this should be an outer wall, right? Or close to it, George said, nodding. The dim light did not penetrate far past the opening, but peering into the darkness, they all sensed that the passage within extended for some distance, beyond the perimeter of the building, into what should have been open air. Mortimer got excited again. It's an alternate dimension, he said. Another universe, maybe. Yeah, said Pirate Joe. So who wants to go first? George went first, then Montrose, then the others. Past the narrow entrance was a straight, level passageway about ten feet wide, with dark stone walls rising to a vaulted ceiling. The air was chilly and dry and unpleasantly stale. George and Montrose had each brought a flashlight. Mortimer had brought three. The passageway continued beyond the range of the beams. Shall we leave somebody here to mind the exit and let Bradley know where we've gone? Pirate Joe said. Atticus looked sideways at Mortimer, who clutched his bag defensively. No way, Mortimer said. I want to come. Let's just do this, said Montrose, impatient. So they all set off together, with George, Montrose, and Abdullah in front, and Mortimer, despite his professed eagerness, keeping carefully to the rear. The passage ran on straight and unbranching, and quickly grew monotonous. Anybody counting steps? Abdullah said. If we weren't in Dimension X, we'd be crossing the railroad tracks by now, Montrose guessed. There's an all-night coffee joint right outside the station on the other side. Pirate Joe noted. Maxie's Depot. They got good donuts. I could go for a donut, said Atticus. Mortimer, you bring a jackhammer? What? Mortimer sounded startled. No, I... I see something ahead, George said. Everyone got quiet and looked. A glimmer in the darkness. They continued forward slowly, the object emerging in the focused beams of the flashlights. A chest a silver chest resting on a dark waist-high pedestal. A change in the feel of the air and the echoes of their footballs hinted at a large open space. Looks like we found the treasure room, Montrose said. Get your burglar tools ready, Mortimer. Wait, said George. He put out an arm to stop his brother and lowered the beam of his flashlight. Less than five feet in front of them, the dark stone floor dropped away. 
George raised the light to the chest again and studied it more carefully. There was no pedestal. The chest was just hanging there in the darkness. He sensed another object hovering nearby. He swung his light up and to the right. Oh, Jesus, he said. The dead man had been white, in life. In death, his desiccated flesh had taken on a grayish cast. His suit hung loosely on his withered frame, and the hands jutting from his sleeves were hooked to display blackened fingertips and broken nails. His eyes were mercifully shut, but his lips stretching back from his teeth had opened his mouth up wide, and visible within was the pale tip of his shriveled tongue. George's hand holding the flash trembled slightly, and in the wavering light, the tongue tip seemed to wag, as though the former lodge master of Chicago were trying to speak or scream. It's a sphere, said Abdullah, shining his light over the smooth stone walls, curving away from around the end of the passageway. I'd say about fifty yards across. The chest was at the sphere's center, and the passageway opening halfway up the side. The dead lodge master floated in the upper atmosphere, somewhere around the horse latitudes, turning slowly like a piece of ocean debris caught in a sluggish current. What's keeping him up there? Montrose wondered. And that? He nodded at the chest, which, unlike the corpse, hung motionless, a fixed point in space. George stepped to the brink and stuck on an arm experimentally. Grab my belt. What? said Montrose. You and Atticus, grab the back of my belt. Montrose and Atticus stood behind George, each grabbing a section of his belt with one hand and hooking the fingers of the other under the waistband of his trousers. All right, George said. Hold tight. And he leaned forward. He hadn't leaned far, just enough to get the majority of his body mass inside the spherical room when gravity abruptly loosed its grip on him. His feet left the floor, and carried by momentum, he tilted forward, going fully horizontal, arms flailing, while Montrose and Atticus fought to steady him. Holy God, Mortimer said. Uncle George, said Atticus. I'm all right, George told them, laughing nervously. Feels like I might lose my dinner, but it's kind of fun, too. Just don't let go, okay? The blast of air came without warning, striking George broadside. Like a parade balloon caught in a crosswind, he yawed and lurched violently to the right, dragging his handlers with him. Montrose, on the windward side, was shoved to the brink by George's pivoting body. He leaned too far over the edge, and suddenly he was floating too, leaving Atticus the sole anchor point. Pirate Joe darted forward and grabbed one of Montrose's ankles. Abdullah caught the other. Another blast of wind struck, but Pirate Joe and Abdullah and Atticus hung on and dragged Montrose and George to safety. As soon as they were back inside the passageway, gravity reasserted itself and all five men ended up in a heap on the floor, with Mortimer standing behind them saying, Holy God! over and over again. George rolled clear of Atticus, on whom he had landed, and gave his heart rate a moment to settle. Then he pushed himself up and helped the others to their feet. He picked up his flashlight and shone it on the dead lodge master, who was still turning lazily in the upper latitudes. So that's what happened to him, George said. Stuck his neck out too far with no one to hold on to and got blown into orbit. And then what? said Atticus, brushing dust from his sleeves. You think he died of thirst? That or hypothermia, George guessed. Or maybe he just cracked his head against the wall while he was tumbling. He's not tumbling now, Montrose observed. You suppose that wind only blows right here at the entrance? Could be. George saw where his brother was going. Mortimer he said. You got any rope in that bag? Yeah, sure. Plenty. We need enough to tie me a harness, with a good hundred feet left over. No, said Montrose. Not you. Yes, me, George said. But Montrose shook his head. You're too big. So am I, for that matter. We want somebody small, somebody who won't drag the rest of us into the void if we're wrong about that wind. He looked around, eyes settling on five foot four Mortimer Dupree. Somebody we can toss. On three, George said. 
He and Montrose stood a few steps back from the end of the passageway, holding Mortimer suspended between them like a human battering ram. Behind them, Pirate Joe and Abdullah each had charge of one of two ropes. The first, bound in a makeshift harness around Mortimer's chest. The second, tied to his right ankle as a backup line. Atticus stood to his father's right, holding their most powerful flashlight. Okay, Mortimer said, reaching up to switch on the headlamp strapped to his forehead. I'm ready. I'm ready. He shut his eyes. Jesus. Don't worry, Dupree, said Montrose. After this, the Illuminati will pledge you for sure. Okay, George said. One, two, three. As he was lobbed headlong into space, Mortimer opened his eyes again. The transition to weightlessness was instantaneous, but his brain clung stubbornly to the notion that a man hurled from a precipice must fall down and hard. Oh, shit! A blast of air drowned out his exclamation, but he cleared the edge of the sphere, and the wind didn't touch him. Pitching up slightly, he coasted towards the chest with his arms spread like improbably effective wings. Abdullah and Pirate Joe played out the ropes, trying to keep them from tangling. Okay, George said. Start putting the brakes on. By now, Mortimer had recovered enough to call out his own directions. Almost there. Slow. Slow. Applying light friction to the ropes, Abdullah and Pirate Joe eased him to a stop within a few feet of the chest. From their perspective, he appeared to float just above and to the left of it. You okay, Mortimer? George called. I could use a new pair of undershorts, Mortimer replied. But at least now I know how Superman feels. Try using your X-ray vision on the box, Montrose suggested. What do you see? Lots of decoration on the outside, Mortimer said. Stars and planets and like that. I can see more of those funny letters, too. A pause. I don't have to bleed on it, do I? Not yet, George said. Can you tell how it opens? There's no lock or latch that I can see. There's a seam running around the top that might be the edge of a lid. If I drift a little closer, I could try. Whoa! Mortimer twisted suddenly in midair. I see a chain, a big one, stretching out the back towards the far wall. It looks like cast iron, and it's pulled taut, almost like the chest is hanging from it, except, you know, sideways. George turned to Mondros. Could there be some kind of magnetic field, he said, pushing the chest this way? I suppose, Montro said. But if there is, it ought to affect everything in the room. Hey, Mortimer, he called. You feel anything tugging on your belt buckle or your fillings? No, Mortimer said. Then concerned, why? Tell us more about the chain, George said. You think we could cut it? Not without a big blowtorch. Why'd you ask about my feelings? Don't worry about it. Can you see how the chain is attached to the chest? Could we unhook it, maybe? Hold on. Twisting again and using the ropes for leverage, Mortimer inverted himself. He reached for the chest and managed to snag a bit of decorative filigree with the tip of one finger, the most tenuous of grips, but enough to impart a little momentum. A few more seconds and he was able to grab the chest firmly and pull himself to it. The chest bobbed at the end of its tether as Mortimer collided with it. From the far side of the sphere came the sharp metal bang of a door or gate slamming open, followed by a noise like something sliding down a chute. Mortimer, who was now straddling the chest, turned his head towards the sound. Huh? he said. The sliding had stopped. Now they could hear a soft whir of rotor blades. Huh? said Mortimer Dupree. Mortimer? George said. What are you hawing at? I don't know exactly, Mortimer said. It's like a little submarine. Atticus aimed the flashlight at the black torpedo that came cruising out of the shadows of the far hemisphere. The thing was a couple of feet long, with an oversized propeller and stubby wings that let it steer itself through the air. Its nose was ringed with faceted crystal knobs like dragonfly eyes that glittered in the light. It circled the room in a counterclockwise direction. As it neared the mouth of the passageway, 
they could hear the click of internal gear work. I think we better get Mortimer out of there, Atticus said, when the thing had gone by. Yeah, George concurred. Mortimer, he called. We're going to pull you back. Why? Mortimer said. You think that thing's dangerous? Just let go of the damn chest, Dupree, Montrose said. But instead of letting go, Mortimer tightened his hold and hunkered down, swiveling his head to track the torpedo. As it swung around the far side of the chest, the sound of the propeller changed pitch. When Atticus picked it up in his flashlight beam a moment later, it was moving faster. And then, as it came nearer, its nose opened up and deployed a nasty-looking cluster of chopping blades. The blades spun up into a blur, with a high-pitched whine like a dentist's drill. Hey! Mortimer scolded the torpedo as he would an unruly stray. Hey! No! The torpedo went for the harness rope. The spinning blades chopped through it effortlessly. The frayed, severed ends floated apart while the torpedo flew on, circling back around the chest for another pass. George grabbed the ankle rope, which was now the sole remaining lifeline, and gave it a sharp tug. Mortimer, he said. You need to let us pull you back. But Mortimer continued to hug the chest and stare wide-eyed at the torpedo. George let go of the rope and reached into his jacket for his pistol. Atticus, I'm going to need that light steady. Got it, Atticus said. The torpedo flew back into view from behind the chest. George took careful aim and pulled the trigger. The noise of the gunshot was deafening, but the bullet missed. He could see it strike the wall. Quickly, he took aim again and fired. And missed. God damn it, Montrose said. Let me. He started to reach for the gun, but before he could wrestle it from George's grasp, Abdullah stepped up between the two brothers, gripping the ankle rope in both hands. As the torpedo honed in, he gave the rope some slack and then flicked it sharply, sending a tall wave down its length. The torpedo tried to adjust course, but instead of severing the rope completely, it only nicked it. Shoot it! Mortimer shouted. Shoot it! George fired another shot at the retreating torpedo and missed. God damn it! Montrose said. Then Pirate Joe spoke up in a commanding voice. Brother Dupree, he said. I give you my oath as a fellow mason. We are not going to let you die, but you need to get your ass off that chest right now. Trembling, Mortimer raised himself up into a crouch on the lid of the chest and froze. Do it or you're out of the club, Mortimer, Pirate Joe said. With a cry, Mortimer launched himself into space. Montrose and Abdullah commenced hauling on the rope, which, as it went taut, began to pop and fray along the portion that the torpedo had nicked. Gently, George cautioned. Meanwhile, Mortimer, flying up at an angle, found himself careening towards the dead lodgemaster. Get away, Mortimer shouted at the corpse. But the dead man didn't move, and they collided and spun around in a tangle of arms and legs. Another strand of the rope parted. The torpedo, now on its return trajectory, angled up towards the entwined bodies and put on a final burst of speed. Mortimer heard the whine of the approaching blades. He twisted, using the Lodge Master's corpse as a shield. The torpedo plunged into the dead man's back. The blades chewed through his spine and what remained of his heart and lungs before getting stuck partway through his breastbone. The overheated drill motor, screaming in protest. Get away, cried Mortimer, placing his hands on the dead man's shoulders and shoving. Abdullah and Montrose cleared the frayed section of the rope. Tugging firmly once more, they dragged screaming Mortimer down to the passageway and grabbed him. The torpedo executed a sluggish turn and headed towards the passageway itself, pushing the dead lodgemaster before it. The grinning corpse spread its arms as if for an embrace. George raised his pistol again, aimed for the bloody bulge on the dead man's chest and squeezed off three more shots one of which finally struck home. There was a small explosion, a jangle of breaking gear work, and the propeller stopped dead. Carried by momentum, the corpse continued to drift forward. Then the wind came again and sent the lodgemaster tumbling away into the shadows, the dead torpedo 
sticking out of his back like a grotesque wind-up key. Maybe we're thinking about this the wrong way, Montrose said a few minutes later. Well, if you know the right way, said George, I'm all ears. Instead of asking how we're going to get that chest, Montrose said, we should be asking how Winthrop would get it. This is his secret treasure room, right? So he's not going to come down here with a bunch of other guys. He's going to come alone. But then what does he do? George shrugged. Man's a sorcerer. Maybe he flies out to the chest. That dead guy was a sorcerer too, Montrose pointed out. He couldn't fly. If they could fly, the booby tries wouldn't make sense. Okay, George nodded. So what's the answer then? The room's a machine, Montrose said. There's a reason it's set up so you can't see the chain from here. If you don't know about the chain, you assume the chest is just floating free, and you got no choice but to go in and try to snag it. And then you've got problems. Mortimer, he turned to the dentist, who was sitting far back in the passageway with his chin in his hands. Did you see where the other end of that chain went? Where? Mortimer raised his head. I told you, it goes to the far wall. Just to it? Like it's bolted to the wall? Or into it? Mortimer considered. I'm not sure, he said. I couldn't really see how it was attached. I know there was a hole in the wall that that flying thing came out of. Could be the chain went into another hole. Montrose turned back to George. That chain's on a reel. I guarantee it. So, the chest comes to us, George said. But how do we get it to do that? That's the tricky part. If it's a magic word, we're stuck. What else could it be? George scanned the walls and ceiling near the end of the passageway, looking for a switch they'd somehow failed to notice. It won't be in here, Montrose said. If it were me, I'd put it just outside, so you can't see it without sticking your head out, but you can reach it without looking. George knelt by the end of the passageway, and being careful not to lean too far forward, slipped his fingers over the edge and began feeling along the lip. Montrose joined him, the two of them working in opposite directions. George was a third of the way up the left side wall when he found a shallow depression with a button inside it. Think I got it, he said. He pressed the button, and the chest, driven by whatever invisible force held sway over it, began gliding towards them, the chain unwinding from the hidden reel in the wall with a steady ratcheting sound. The chest reached the mouth of the passageway and stopped, still floating, just shy of halfway inside it. The top swung up and back on motorized hinges. In contrast to its ornate shiny exterior, the inside of the chest was gray and industrial. A fluorescent bulb set inside the lid flickered on, casting a harsh light over the contents. The book of names rested on a thick leather pad and was held in place by a pair of buckled straps. The book's size suggested an encyclopedia volume or an unholy scripture. It was bound in the hide of some large poured animal, and the atomite letters on its cover had the look of scars as though the creature in question had been cut and allowed to heal before it was skinned. What do you think? said George, looking at the straps in the pad. Any more booby traps? Don't know, Montrose said. Maybe. But then he shrugged. Hell with it. They reached into the chest together and undid the straps. George grabbed one end of the book and Montrose grabbed the other, and they lifted it out. There were no booby traps, but the book of names was heavy, and the sudden tug of gravity as they got it clear of the chest and fully into the passageway caused them both to tighten their grips. It's okay, Montrose said. I got it. No, George replied. I got it. Excuse me, brothers, said Abdullah.
was after one o'clock when they returned to the museum. George was last out of the passageway, and when he looked over his shoulder, he saw that the opening had closed up silently behind him. Bradley! Abdullah called softly. Walking out into the exhibition hall, he was holding the book of names away from his body as though it were unclean, and his arms had begun to tremble from the effort. Bradley! You hear? No answer. They started across the exhibition hall, but had only gone a few steps when a match flared in the shadows up ahead. In the same instant, they heard guns cocking off to their right, and detectives Burke and Noble stepped out from behind a display case with their pistols leveled. You see, Caleb Braithwaite said, I told you they'd pull it off. Yeah, Captain Lancaster replied, and I told you they'd try to fuck us. Cigar light, he shook out the match and tossed it away. All right, let's get this over with. You're trespassing, he said to George and his companions. I could book you all for B&E right now, or I could just have my men shoot you and save the paperwork. And you, he pointed a finger at Abdullah, Percival Avery Jones of 5713 South Wabash, Apartment C. You want to think about your wife, Rashida, and your son, Omar, and what happens to them if you don't come home? And your cousin, Bradley? As of right now, he doesn't work here anymore. But if you make me pry that fucking book out of your hands, I can see to it he gets a new job, folding laundry down in Joliet. Abdullah was hugging the book of names to his chest now, but his arms were still trembling. Rashida, Lancaster said. Oma. Abdullah bowed his head. I'm sorry, George, he said his voice thick with shame. He took a step forward, but George put out a hand to stop him. We had a deal, George said to Braithwaite. We did, Braithwaite agreed good-naturedly, and I'm ready to honor it. He nudged a bag on the floor by his feet. Assuming that's the real book of names, of course, he smiled. I'm not interested in Kabbalah. Six bridges ahead, George thought. He tried to think of some alternative, but the only play here was the obvious one. Survive the night and hope for some future opportunity to make things right. He withdrew his hand and waved Abdullah forward. Braithwaite took the book from him and leafed through it. Well, said Captain Lancaster. Braithwaite nodded. It's right, he said. And we're done, said the captain. He glanced wordlessly at the detectives, who relaxed and put their guns away. Museum's closed, Lancaster announced. Find a fire exit and get the fuck out. He put the cigar into his mouth, turned on his heel and walked off, the detectives following behind him. All yours, Caleb Braithwaite told George, giving the bag another nudge with his toe. There's a little something extra for your troubles. Until next time. He left, too. Next time, Montrose grumbled. George went over and looked inside the bag. Ada's book was on top, wrapped in a clean white cloth. George made sure the ledger was unharmed, then checked to see what the something extra was. His jaw dropped open. Montrose, standing over him, saw it too. Son of a bitch, he said. What is it? said Atticus. Money, George told him gazing in disbelief at the banded stacks of hundred-dollar bills. It's the Burns' debt, I think. He's paying it off. The debt to great-grandma Ada? You're talking about the principal, right? The original 8800? No, George said. I'm talking about all of it. The original 8800 plus 90 years' interest. As he groped inside the bag, counting up the stacks, he felt the ledger in his other hand grow lighter, and then his whole body with it, as if gravity were once more letting go. Three hundred thousand, he said. Three hundred thousand dollars. Son of a bitch, said Montrose. 